Sergeants, you can begin your recordings. Mr. Sergeant uh, Hope, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Once again, good morning and welcome to the New York City Council Remote Hearing on Education. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimonies, please do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your kind cooperation. Chair Traeger, you may begin. Thank you, and uh, my apologies to, to all for, for, the, uh, for the delays this morning. Um, and I'm officially gaveling in uh, this emergency hearing to hear uh, my resolution on uh, delaying school reopening and to address the serious safety concerns that we're hearing from students, from educators, uh, parents and uh, school school stakeholders. Um, good morning. I am Councilmember Mark Traeger, Chair of the Education Committee, uh, and I want to welcome everyone uh, to to today's remote uh, hearing on a resolution which I sponsor, Resolution 1410, calling on the New York City Department of Education to delay the reopening of public schools until each school meets the safety standards children and school staff require. In the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a devastating global impact with more than 25 million people infected by the virus worldwide and over 850,000 deaths. The US has been especially uh, hit hard with over 6 million confirmed cases and rapidly approaching 200,000 deaths. In addition to the pain and suffering of those who have lost loved ones, the virus has also had a devastating economic impact with record unemployment rates leaving many households and many state and local governments under bankruptcy. The pandemic also led to lockdowns and closures nationwide, including school closures to help block the spread of the virus. As cases of coronavirus cropped up in various communities across the US, including New York City, in February and early March of this year, many parents, advocates, and elected officials called for Mayor de Blasio to close city schools. New York City public buildings, public school buildings were initially closed to students on March 16th and to teachers on March 23rd, shifting the city's 1.1 million students to remote learning for the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year. On March 20th, 2020, New York City was declared the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in the United States. The delayed shutdown of city schools exposed school staff and students to unacceptable risk. As of June 22nd, 2020, 79 DOE employees have died from COVID-19 related illnesses, including 31 teachers, 28 paraprofessionals, five food service staffers, four central office employees, three school counselors, two administrators, two school aides, two facility staffers, one parent coordinator, and one school computer technology specialist. This number does not include other members of the school community who are not DOE employees, including bus drivers, school safety agents, crossing guards, and others who lost their lives to coronavirus-related illness. And of course, these numbers do not reflect the untold number of students who have lost family members and other loved ones. It is because of these tragic losses that we must do all we can to prevent any further loss of life. School reopening decisions and protocols must be driven by public health and safety considerations. Schools cannot reopen for in-person instruction without having proper safeguards in place to protect our students and their families as well as school staff. School districts in other states, including Georgia and Indiana, that opened their school buildings in August 2020 had to quickly change course and close their buildings due to widespread transmission of COVID-19 
Similarly, a growing number of colleges and universities have had to revert to remote learning after the spread of COVID-19 during the first weeks of classes. Many colleges and universities have chosen to continue with all remote instruction, while some others uh, that have in-person learning plans, including Cornell and Syracuse University, require that all undergraduate and graduate students provide proof of a negative COVID-19 test result before returning to campus. New York City is the only large school district in the country that is planning to reopen in school, its school buildings for in-person instruction this fall. While we're pleased that the city has now agreed to delay the reopening of school buildings until September 21st of a modest delay, 10 days of delay may not be enough time for families, teachers, and other school staff to prepare for this unprecedented school year. I have some very serious outstanding concerns. I am concerned about students who are engaging in remote learning. There are still students without laptops and internet how is the administration going to, going to address this before September 16th when remote uh, instruction orientation begins? I've, I'm concerned about the staffing level for remote learning. I've heard reports that students will be mixed from across schools inside of classrooms of up to 64 students, 64 students. If that's true, how are teachers supposed to build relationships and provide individualized instruction to support 64 students remotely? Beyond remote instruction, the city has not yet demonstrated that every school building has been evaluated and deemed safe and equipped with enough supplies and staff to curb the spread of the virus. Of course, another huge outstanding issue is access to childcare for students on hybrid schedules when they're not in school. The mayor originally announced that by the start of the school, they would have 50,000 childcare seats to serve 100,000 students, and we don't know if they've reached that goal yet. Further, those numbers are far too low to meet the need. So how will they determine which students will have access to the limited number of childcare seats when so many parents must leave their children to go to work? Six weeks ago, I proposed a phased in approach to a return to in-person learning starting later in the fall to allow schools to fully plan and program a safe reopening. I propose that access to in-person instruction should, initial, should initially be prioritized for those students whose academic and developmental progress is most dependent on the social environment and consistency of in-person education, including early childhood and elementary school students, as well as all students with IEPs, students in temporary housing, students in foster care, multilingual learners, and students in unsafe home environments. Three weeks ago, on August 12th, the city's school administrators represented by the Council of School Supervisors and Administrators, CSA, delivered a letter to the de Blasio administration questioning the lack of adequate planning for school buildings to reopen and requesting a delay to the start of in-person learning. One week later, at a press conference on August 19th, the United Federation of Teachers, UFT President Michael Mulgrew, representing uh, the teachers of our city uh, indicated that while teachers prefer and want in-person learning, individual school buildings should not reopen on September 10th unless they meet stringent health and safety standards proposed by the union, including COVID testing for all staff and students. Just this past Tuesday, September 1st, the de Blasio administration finally announced an amended plan in collaboration with the UFT, CSA, and DC 37 to address concerns raised by the unions. Under the new plan, teachers will report to buildings on September 8th as originally scheduled and will have dedicated time for training and collaboration around blended learning. On September 16th, orientation for students will begin remotely and schools will reopen for in-person learning on September 21st. Although I introduced resolution 1410, which calls on DOE to delay the reopening of public schools until each school meets the safety standards of children and school staff require, before this agreement was reached to delay school reopening, I felt it was important to go ahead with this hearing because so many unanswered questions remain. Um, though not required to testify in resolutions, it's outrageous that the administration has refused to send anyone to today's hearing 
to answer questions about their plan and address legitimate concerns of teachers and parents. This is not some frivolous exercise. There are lives at stake here, lives of children and school staff and their families. We have an obligation to proceed with caution until all necessary safeguards are in place and all remaining questions around health and safety program operations and pedagogy are answered. I also want to be very clear, uh, my committee in partnership with the chair of the health committee, Mark Levine, were already planning an oversight hearing uh, in September, but I felt it was absolutely critical to, to have an emergency hearing before school reopening and to provide a platform for educators, students and families to speak. And yes, the city council does not have the legal authority to override the mayor on the decision of school reopening. I still felt it was important to provide a platform for folks to speak. Um, and I will press ahead to continue to do that. And the administration is trying to throw their protocol playbook that they don't like to testify in resolutions. This is not a normal year. We're, we're not in normal times. If they strongly stand by their plan, come down to testify, speak up about it, defend it, because we will continue to do our, our, our oversight work. But I think it was important to give a platform for stakeholders to speak before school reopening. And I am proud that the council forged ahead to continue to provide a platform for folks to speak up. Um, I wanna thank everyone who is testifying today. And I wanna thank the council staff for the work that they put into today's hearing. Malcolm Buterhorn, the committee council, Jan Atwell, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, policy analyst. I also wanna thank my chief of staff, Anna Scaife, my policy director, Vanessa Ogle, my communications director, Maria Henderson, and Danielle Blake, a brilliant public school educator who has been a tremendous help to me over the summer as an intern. Um, I would like to also recognize the members of the education committee who, who are here and I, give me a moment, I will recognize them. Um, council member uh, Ulrich, council member Borelli, council member Barron, council member Rivera, Council Member Rose, Council Member Yeager, Council Member Rodriguez, Council Member Lewis, Council Member Drum, Council Member uh, Cohen, Council Member Gradenchik, Council Member uh, Wander, uh, Council Member Ampre Samuel, uh, Council Member uh, Webin. Um, and now uh, I will turn to Public Advocate Jamani Williams for an opening statement as well. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And just uh, once again, thank you so much for all of your leadership on this uh, from day one uh, of the pandemic, even when the administration themselves weren't uh, showing leadership. So thank you. Uh, my name is, uh, as was mentioned, Jamani Williams, public advocate for the city of New York. Uh, and I wanna thank not only the chair, but all the members of the committee uh, for holding this very timely and very important hearing. Uh, this week, the mayor announced the delay of starting the school year from September 10th to September 16th, with an in-person instruction beginning on September 21st. Well, I'm glad the mayor has heeded mine and others' call to delay reopening. An 11-day 11 11-day 11 delay in person learning is not enough to guarantee that our students, teachers, school administrators will not be at risk of contracting the coronavirus. Chair Traeger's resolution. Reso 1410 calls on our city's Department of Education to delay the reopening of school public uh, public schools until each school meets the safety standards children and school staff require. I wholeheartedly support this resolution because I believe our approach to reopening should be grounded in science and executed in equity to safeguard the health of our school staff, students, and their families, not to mention the entire city. In July, my office released a white paper on the reopening of New York City schools. Uh, it tracks uh, the phasing plan of uh, Chair Traeger as well, in which I recommended the city to invest in remote learning and delay in-person schooling by at least six weeks, a timeline already implemented by several of the nation's other large school districts, including Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Houston. My report laid out a series of stages for a successful healthy reopening of schools in our city. The first state included the expansion of regional enrichment centers or RECs, 
to accommodate childcare needs with a five-day solution for working parents and guardians and incorporate a plan for students with individual individualized education plans or IEPs, special needs, students in temporary housing and multilingual learners. Most important, stage one is for use of to use the funding to ensure medically advised and community informed health and safety measures can be not only initially met, but sustained. Second, if the number of new COVID-19 transmissions continue to decrease, the administration could consider allowing families the ability to opt to return elementary school students to in-person learning beginning in October. Older students will remain at home, allowing elementary students whose families opted for in-person learning to use the space at empty middle schools and high schools. The third stage of reopening comes around the middle of the school year when we evaluate our progress and any potential hotspots to determine if it is safe to return to in-person learning for students of all grades. The city will come up with a plan for the second half of the 2021 school year, and we will only transition to a full reopening for students of all ages and grade levels with the approval of health experts. Our city's handling of remote learning has had its flaws, but it still remains our safest option at the moment. The Department of Education needs to improve the way it operates remote learning by ensuring that all students have access to the technology they need. We've had three months to make certain that all students, especially those in temporary housing or shelters, have iPads, tablets, and any other remote learning devices needed to engage in virtual classrooms and sessions and the internet access that's needed to get that done. This time has also allowed our city to determine how additional funds will be invested more strategically to students who need in-person learning such as those with IEPs and students with disabilities. The city must change its thinking away from focusing on a date and instead focus on accommodating the most vulnerable students and families first and building the needed health infrastructure in our school communities to ensure a safe return. By utilizing in-person learning again, we are not only putting our students and school safety staffers at risk, as I mentioned, New York City as a whole and possibly the nation because uh, at the beginning, I do believe the way New York City handled its uh, corona prob uh, issue with the lack of leadership probably exposed other people going to other states. Those returning in-person instruction will be taking mass transit and subsequently be in the proximity of communities, commuters. We cannot afford to gamble with the health of our students by permitting in-person learning before our schools are ready. I urge the administration to consider delaying the start of in-person learning until October and further prioritize remote learning for all of our schools. No one is denying that in-person learning is best. We only have not so good options. We have to choose the best of those. Sadly, the administration has chosen the worst of those. And uh, lastly, I just want to say, and I'm, 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 I just want to say thank you uh, to the chancellor and even to the mayor. I've had many discussions and they've been open to it, uh, but I am appalled that they refuse to come and have a discussion uh, with the council so we can have public discourse on this. This is what people need right now. They can't get the information from a soundbite. And to use the excuse that you don't comment on resolutions is to try to devalue the city council. Because of this setup, many people in the public don't know the mayor has most of the power. Most of the things that are put forth on education through the education committee will be by resolution. Uh, I don't think it's, unac I think it's unacceptable that they won't come uh, when there's no pandemic. It's certainly unacceptable that they won't come during a pandemic so we can have this discussion out in the open and people who are confused, worried, and scared uh, can see what's happening and why. And so I, the administration uh, should be ashamed that they're not here today uh, to discuss this most important topic. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, public advocate. And, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, we're not in normal times. And they sound so confident when they speak at their press conferences about their plans and proposals. And they should have no problem coming down to the virtual council, the virtual people's house to speak about their plans and proposals to provide the clarity and transparency that the public deserves. And I also wanted to say something that I feel is important to share and those who are uh, involved in school communities know exactly what I'm talking about. And those of my colleagues who, who are teachers who work in schools know what I'm talking about. Um, as a former teacher, I wanna to point to a moment in a school year, at the start of each school year or at the start of a, of a new semester if you're work, working in a high school. 
when you meet your first class, when you meet your, your, open, your class, before you ask students to open a notebook, you have to first establish trust. You cannot overlook that moment. You have to first establish a safe and supportive learning environment for every child in that class. And kids are really smart. They're brilliant. They sense when something's up. And I think it's important for the, for the public to be aware that that trust has been broken. When the mayor had the audacity to lecture educators about being professional, he is in no position to lecture anyone about being professional. When he asked educators and students and staff to walk into buildings in March, knowing that it was not safe. So I just wanna make it clear that that trust has been broken and that trust has not been repaired. So educators are not just speaking up on behalf of their profession, they're speaking up on behalf of their students and of their entire school community because teachers are only one part of a school. We have extraordinary school food workers, crossing guards, school safety, you name it, who have been working throughout this entire pandemic as well, feeding our families across the five boroughs. Educators, even though the buildings were physically closed, have still reached out to try to deepen connections even in this era of physical distancing. Principals have not had a day off this summer, work around the clock under impossible circumstances with inadequate information. The theme for principals this summer has been guidance forthcoming, which is code word for they have no plan. This has been a planning failure on the part of the administration. And schools have been forced to plan for the impossible with inadequate resources, time, and information. So I think it's important to get that out there as we proceed. And uh, just to say thank you for, to all of our education family members who have been doing courageous work. I also wanna just acknowledge, we've also uh, been joined by council member Kalos and I also, and also council member Rosenthal. And I wanna recognize that uh, council member Barron uh, raised her hand and she is an educator as well, who I have much respect for, principal educator, and Councilman Barron, if you'd like to say a few words. Uh, thank you very much. I want to uh, give acknowledgement to the chair for calling this extremely important hearing to look at this resolution that is being introduced. I also want to thank all of my colleagues for joining and hearing from those who are most impacted by this so that we can move forward in an informed way. I too am extremely disappointed that the mayor himself or his representative, the chancellor, did not come and sit with us in this environment to talk about what the plans are. I have said from the beginning that based on history, we can expect a resurgence in October. And I felt that we should continue the remote learning until after this resurgence and then look to have the in-class teaching instruction. I think the plans that have been laid out look to that kind of setting, but I think that it is inappropriate to start it at this time. I also think that there should have been additional resources, and I've said this to the chancellor, that were offered to parents during this time of their children being in a remote learning environment. Just as Mark, uh, Council Member Traeger, you and I know, teachers are deep into their pockets throughout the year to support what goes on in the classroom. I think that the board, that the Department of Education should have designed some type of guidance of what kinds of support and instructional and hands-on materials parents could get and that they should have provided that in some type of financial assistance for them to purchase it or have provided to them directly. That did not happen. We cannot rely just on a screen 
and the instruction via the staffing, the teachers and system principals and all of those persons to get our children motivated. This is a very stressful time. I can't imagine what it must have been like to not be at that first day and greet your students as, as Council Member Traeger has talked about. It's such an important day. And for the first day not to have happened in its usual format is a little disturbing and depressing, but we have to move forward. I agree with all that's been said about making sure that all of the technology for all of the students, if there are five in a family, five functioning devices with adequate access and that we have to make sure that when we do open the schools, we have to be guaranteed. We have to be able to see records and documentation that everything that was said in terms of the staffing numbers and in terms of securing uh, the safety of the physical building have in fact been met with a check off so that we can verify that that's what happened. So I wanna thank you for calling this hearing. Thank all of those who are here. We wanna hear from you to help inform how we will proceed with opening of schools. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Um, I also recognize that uh, Council Member uh, Steve Levin has his hand up. Council Member? Council Member? Council Member Levin, give us one moment. We're having a trouble unmuting you. Okay, Chair, we're having issues with that, so we will come back to Council Member Levin. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, the procedures since we will be moving straight into public testimony. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger. I am Malcolm Buterhorn, Counsel to the Education Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin public testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on persons to testify in panels of four, so please listen for your name to be called. I will be announcing in advance who the next panel will be. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, while you will be placed on a panel, I will be calling individuals to testify one at a time. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raised hand function in Zoom. You will be called on in the order with which you raised your hand after the full panel has completed their testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including both questions and answers. Please note that for the purposes of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. We have more than 140 people signed up to testify today. And in the interest of fairness to all who will be waiting, we ask that everyone please limit their testimony to two minutes. Please listen carefully and wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony as there is a slight delay. 
The first panel that we will be calling up will be Leanne Nunez and Meryl Masoom. Leanne. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leanne Nunez, and I'm the, I'm the Executive College Director of Integrate NYC. COVID-19 hit during my last semester of high school. A week before schools closed, I was surprised to see that we finally had fully stocked soap and toilet paper in our bathrooms, and that it took a global pandemic for it to happen. Now here we are, months later, and the building I virtually graduated from is in the same, if not worse, condition. There are six schools in the building with our larger facilities in the basement. Our cafeteria, auditorium, and gym spaces have no windows and poor ventilation, making them unusable for spreading out larger classes. Half of the classrooms on our floor don't have windows actually, and, there's, and the issue of poor ventilation persists throughout the building in the other five schools. My high school campus is not a one-off occurrence. There are many schools across the city in similar conditions that are at a loss as to how they will be able to ensure the health and safety of their students and staff. The DOE proposal is simply not possible for many schools in the NYC DOE that lack the space and funding to fulfill the capacity needs required for safe social distancing. The plan is also largely inaccessible for many low-income working families of color, as well as many students with disabilities. Promoting hybrid learning in this way is putting many youth and their families at risk. Low-income communities of color has been carrying us through this pandemic and have been the driving force of the city even before we all knew COVID-19 was going to be a thing. The options for scheduling that currently exist would not work within a working family's capacity, especially if there are multiple children in the household. The criteria being used is not reflective of COVID-19's disproportional impact across the city and the strain it has had on low-income families we call essential when we need something delivered is high. These families are essential in their service, but not when the futures of their children are at risk. All we need is for schools, is for schools to stay closed until it is safe for everyone, not just some. We as a city need to make sure students have the guidance and resources to learn during remote learning without the added risk of harm to themselves or loved ones. So we I'm You can go ahead and finish. I see the chair nodding his head. Thank you so much. We recognize that some schools would benefit from in-person learning, but we also recognize the citywide harm that school reopening at this time would cause. We need to prioritize the most vulnerable during this time and make it safe for them to learn as well. We cannot go back anytime soon, not until it is safe for everyone. I'm done. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Meryl. Start in time. My name is Meryl Noshum. I'm a 16-year-old organizer from the groups Teens Take Charge and Dignity in Schools. I have also been working with the group's movement of rank and file educators and Press NYC. The thing that comes to mind with the school reopening is anger. Anger that low-income kids like me will be left behind either way because our schools don't have the money to provide devices and, and internet access. And in trying to reopen, the city neglected remote learning. Anger that my learning is at stake because of teacher shortages since teacher problems are student problems. Anger at our schools not being given enough time and resources to implement outdoor learning despite it being the clearer, safer alternative. Anger at the lack of socio-emotional learning plans, the cut to guidance counselors and social workers that will drive our generation to despair and suicide. Anger at the fact that my fellow parents, my fellow students, my parents don't know anything about the nurse shortages that will kill us. Anger at our questions about PPE, testing, ventilation remaining unanswered. Anger at everyone who tells us students to go back to school in person from their Zoom forums. Anger at being seen as nothing more than a prop to reopen the economy, a dollar sign, not a person. Anger at knowing that this experiment that was set up to fail from the start will culminate in a generation starved of care and education and a graveyard full of dead bodies. 
anger at knowing that there is an alternative, a better plan for my education, for my future, to further delay reopening, but that is not happening yet because students, educators, and parents have yet to be heard. Thank you. Wow. I, I, if there's like a way to do a virtual or in the council, we, we do like the, the spirit hands. That was extraordinary. Thank you. And I, I'm going to borrow that phrase, if you don't mind, that teacher problems are student problems. That, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate both of the amazing students. I wanted to hear your students first uh, to center you. Um, and I really, really appreciate your courage and speaking up for your entire school families. Thank you so much. Um, I know that I've been informed that uh, council member, uh, just making sure, uh, uh, Malcolm, uh, who is the next panel afterwards? Or any more council members, hands up. Uh, council member Levin, we will try one more time. Okay. If we can unmute council member Levin. Okay, I think he may have stepped away. So um, the next panel, I'm having a technical issue myself, one moment. The next panel will be the Honorable Gail Brewer and the Honorable Robert Jackson. And we will begin with the borough president. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to summarize, Mr. Chair, and then um, submit later. But I have been meeting with executive superintendents, CECs, and parents, just like you. And I just want to say in the borough of Manhattan, I'm just going to summarize the many concerns that you know only too well. Just in terms of PPE, the parents ask, and the custodians ask, they point out the guy with the shorts, uh, you know, spraying the COVID killer. He's got to have on a gown a massive mask, et cetera. Uh, they don't have that in custodians. We know all the parents are concerned about 30 day PPE, is that real? Kids are supposed to bring masks. Parents don't have masks. Temperature, are they gonna be giving it out? When? All of those kinds of issues. Number two, just adequate testing and tracing. You know the questions. I know that some people in the government are doing the 75% accurate instant test. Is that really? what DOE is going to do? Are we doing the 24 hour turnaround? Is that going to happen? And of course, you know, if somebody's sick, they uh, 24 hours is often too long. You got mandatory testing. Is that going to happen for the family of the student and the teacher who's sick? Is it free? All of those questions. And of course, October, some parents feel it's too long to be able to start. Are, cheap, are nurses hired? Even the ones that have been hired, they don't have not been informed of the random testing procedures. I have great uh, confidence in custodians as you do, but I know one school I know well, the Martin Luther King educational campus on the Upper West Side could never ever be ready. I don't care what you do to it. Same thing with 324 in Washington Heights or CPE in East Harlem, and I can go through others that are, have the same issue. And parents want to know, is the air quality report even of other schools going to be made public by the independent inspectors? All the issues of social emotional, I've been talking about social workers, you've been talking about social workers. I don't know how many, and I don't even know if there's enough guidance counselors. I understand the teachers have I'm been sorry. trained. So those are the issues. Um, just to bring up some, I just want to say in terms of this quickly, in terms of uh, devices, we put in money, the mayor won't spend it. And that's another challenge. Buses, outdoor space, teacher shortage, and what are these learning centers really supposed to do, they don't know. I love the RECs. I would just go with RECs if I was in charge. Thank you very much. And next we will hear from Senator Robert Jackson. Start in time. Thank you. Well, I have a lot to say and I have two minutes because I know you have over 120 people on this Zoom conference. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, so uh, regarding the development around school reopening, we know that that is fast and furious and things are changing. So we have to have flexibility and backup plans in order to get things done. Obviously this resolution put forward by Chair 
Traeger 1410 take stock of where we are now because schools have been delayed. But a lot of people are saying that's not enough time. And, and I say to you, uh, I have talked to labor union leaders, uh, leadership about schools were not ready. Uh, ATU, Local 1181, uh, who t thousands and thousands of employees, mainly people of color, uh, that depend on the yellow buses for our students. No one is talking about that. What about all these children that are riding the yellow school buses and all of the employees? They have not been called back. The policy of DOE and the mayor and not coming into hearings and speak about resolutions is totally unsound and without merit. Let me just say that. Because what the city council is gonna be moving forward on a resolution to the state legislature about borrowing $5 billion to avoid layoffs. Hello, let's get real. People wanna hear what you have to say even if you disagree with their position and you need to hear what people have to say in a formal setting. So I support this resolution wholeheartedly. Uh, I think that knowing all of the situations, even at the panel for educational policy, when I asked the question, so they're holding up 20% of your education funding. How much is that? You know what the chair of the policy of education panel said? We don't respond to uh, questions. We just listen. Hello, this is a dialogue. But the director of finance came on and said the 20% held up by Sorry. the state of New York is $2.4 billion. We need to talk about these things and we need to have the mayor's office and the chancellor's office involved in these discussions along with the unions and parents and everyone else. Thank you, Chair Traeger. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Senator Jackson, who is one of the most courageous, bold, leaders we have not just in the city, the whole state of New York, you were an education champion from day one. Thank you for your courage and for always having our kids backs. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Council Member Kalos has questions for the panelists. Starting time. Thank you. I want to just start with joining Chair Mark Traeger and Public Advocate Jamani Williams in my anger and disappointment with the mayor and Department of Education for failing to show up. They're getting marked absent today. They're getting an F on today's pop quiz. And that's just putting it lightly. Uh, there are so many people, including the teacher and student that we heard from today who are just concerned about what the city's plan to reopen is and they need to show up. And I have a question for the borough president, Gail Brewer, as well as Senator Robert Jackson. Uh, to the borough president, uh, you made reference to technology, uh, if you could please uh, develop that. Um, is it, are you referring to the fact that you buy technology such as laptops for schools? And we actually have done that jointly and they're now telling schools they cannot buy laptops and then send it home with the kids. Uh, and to Senator Jackson, uh, we've had families asking, how are they gonna get to school? And uh, we, we've sent letter and so uh, whichever wishes to answer first, but do we even have a plan for how kids are gonna get to school safely? Go ahead, Gail. Then I'll go. So the thing is that they have to be called back. They have to be trained. Everyone is in a new COVID-19 stage. So they have not been trained. And what about all of the kids, tens of thousands of kids that use yellow buses? No one is saying how they're going to get to school and what's going to happen with them. That's number one. I'm so happy that the administration agreed to have a nurse in every school building. I'm so happy that they agreed to have two teachers in every classroom, one for in class, one for virtual. That's a good thing. All of that costs money. And so to talk about your needs are very important overall. So I look forward to, to them coming up to Albany to discuss with us what their needs are and why they need it and what they're gonna do with it to avoid layoffs. In terms of devices, council member, yes, we worked together on this. My understanding from uh, yesterday with DOE is that there are 20,000 devices available citywide, that's it. And um, the superintendents are tracking current and incoming students who may need them, but we know that there will be many more than 20,000 in terms of the need. Um, the issue of course is people, uh, they break, they don't last, et cetera. Number two, the issue of remote, everyone's gonna need remote, no matter what program you're in. And we don't know how many places have 
still, because we haven't done that kind of work, what kind of planning has been done in terms of internet access. In terms of funding, as you saw in the New York Post, I uh, allocate funding as you do every single year. But guess what? Last year's money, 12 million in my case, for technology, for ventilation, for the gyms has not been paid. The mayor will not release that funding. I don't know if that's true going across, but it is killing the Manhattan public schools. So on many levels, this hybrid remote learning will not work if we don't have the right devices, internet connection, and of course the uh, academics to go with it. Right now, I do not see a sufficient supply of devices, not to mention everything else. I want to thank both of the elected officials for their advocacy and ask that the uh, education chair and committee uh, pass these concerns along as well as everything else we're going to hear today. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, council member. And absolutely. Um, I, I think we have been beating the drums and I also want to thank also Borough president Brewer, who has always been a champion supporter of our schools and yeah, resume money is, is being uh, pulled up. Um, which is a concern. And I just want to give some updates to folks because I'm in touch just like everyone else's with principals and educators that um, I am being told that when principals are calling the DOE to request additional iPad devices, they're being told to hold up and to look in their budgets first to see if they can purchase them. Um, so even if the DOE has 20,000 or so iPads left, they're not giving them to schools uh, that at least have reached out to ask for them. Um, additionally, um, children living in shelters, even if they have a device, some of the shelters have a very weak or no signal to uh, log on to internet. Um, and that's inhibiting their ability to, to receive instruction. Um, also, as a teacher, I could tell you there's something called devices break and there's something called maintenance required. Uh, there is no plan, to my knowledge, for the maintenance and upkeep of these devices and whether there's adequate bandwidth to run these platforms and programs. Um, so to this date, there are a number of students who do not have laptops. And also, if you have a laptop, it doesn't mean that you have internet on it. Um, that means you need internet accommodations. Uh, so to my knowledge, there is not a plan to provide internet for, for all kids who need it. So, you know, the administration was so focused on trying to get things ready for in-person, remote learning is nowhere near ready. And it's unclear to me what they have been doing this entire time. And they should have been using this time to do a technology check to make sure that every kid from every zip code has the technology and internet they need, because regardless of whatever model, remote learning is a part of the program. So this was not new, this was not breaking news. Uh, and so they, they are not ready even for remote learning. So I, I thank the borough president and the senator for, for highlighting those points and for their advocacy even before this year on these issues as well. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, also want to recognize that we've been joined by council member Justin Brennan as well. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back to, uh, to Malcolm. Thank you. We'll now move to our next panel, Michael Mulgrew and Mark Canizaro. We'll start with Michael Mulgrew. Start in time. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much to Councilman Traeger and to the City Council and to this committee uh, for all the work that we're doing here. Um, we are at, as we have heard from many of our speakers, we all understand that we are facing one of the greatest, if not the greatest challenge our school system has ever faced. The uh, whole world is looking at the New York City public school system, not just the country, the entire world is now looking at our school system. Over the next two weeks, we're going to try to get a lot of the problems that have been already spoken about here, uh, get them to a place where those questions are answered and things are working. But we have no guarantees that that is going to be the actual situation. The agreement, or really it wasn't, it is not a collective of bargaining agreement that we reached with the city of New York. What we did was we reached an agreement on amending the state plan. If it was a collective bargaining agreement, anything inside of it would be subject to a grievance and arbitration process, which we could not, which would be completely ineffective. Because if there's a problem anywhere, we need to be able to move swiftly. We're not talking days, we're talking in hours. So the state plan 
has now been amended. And because the state plan is basically a legal document that has been attested to by the Department of Education, that, that att attestation means that they are saying and guaranteeing that everything in the plan is happening in every school in New York City. So now that becomes our challenge to hold this administration's feet to the fire. If something is not in place and happening in the school, we need to use our legal authority to get it stopped and or to get it fixed. And if it's not fixed in hours, then the school must go remote, period, end of story. There is no playing around here. What happened in March, we will never allow to happen again in our school system. Fighting with the mayor in the streets for something that was so clear that had to be done, which was the closing of our schools and moving to remote, took way too long. So now with this plan, the new state plan, we all now have the strongest and most aggressive policies and the greatest safeguards of any school system in the country. But it's only a plan on paper. It's not real in a school unless we all work together to make sure that it is real. Remote learning, as Council Member Traeger has said, and part of our great frustration with the city and with the Department of Education, for months we've been saying more than 70% of all instruction in New York City next year will automatically be remote and we need to have a remote plan. Today I have a meeting with the Department of Education and it will not be a pretty meeting because all they have done to the schools is confuse them, send out dozens and dozens of documents contradicting each other. When this should be a very, and we've, we've been very clear, each school has a functioning educational platform. You break down each class, you load it into the platform. Inside of the platform, you put the curriculum and the scope and sequence and all of the supportive materials. And then you have different the teachers who are working with these groups of students because we will truly be doing teen teaching uh, throughout in every school in New York City next year. Those teachers then all know exactly what page to be on when they're teaching the students. This sounds simple, but it's complicated but the Department of Education has done nothing to try to clearly explain this to their to the schools. The safety stuff, it's a clear checklist. Anyone can look at it. Either you have it or you don't. If you don't have it, you don't go, don't, nobody goes into the building. If the Department of Ed and City Hall says, oh no, it's there, so go into the building, we're ordering you. We will go directly to the building at the same time, our lawyers will be going to a judge for a temporary restraining order. This can be done because the agreement we reached in our plan absolutely was stamped by some of the top epidemiologists, independent of everyone, not consulting for us, not working for the city, independent of everyone, not health and hospitals, not people working in city hall on the mayor's task force for COVID. These were independent doctors, which is why it took so long to get to this agreement, because the city kept thinking they knew what was best. In the days of politicians trying to tell people what is the correct medical um, decisions really should end. So I, I look forward to working with all of you, but I want to be clear, we have a lot to do. And it's up to all of us to make sure that every single school, every school, has everything that is on that uh, that they're supposed to have. And when you need that information, it is on the state website, anyone can access it. So this way we all have access, it's transparent, it's clear. If a school doesn't have it, then it doesn't have it. You have to give them a couple hours to rectify it. If they don't rectify it, school goes remote, period. That's how it has to work. No other way, because the whole world is looking at us everyone. And they all said over and over again, well, New York City is rate is so low, positivity rate is so low, they can open. You don't just open because your positivity rate is low. You only open if you're doing everything the experts are telling you has to be done. So that's what we have on paper. Now our challenge is to make it real for each and every one of our schools, the communities, the parents, the students, 
and the teachers and the staff of every school. So I thank you all again for all of the work that we've done together, but just because we have an agreement, the hard work really is now just beginning. Next, we will hear from Mark Hanazaro. Starting time. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having this hearing. And uh, Chair Traeger, especially uh, for your staunch advocacy throughout this uh, pandemic, um, you have been just a strong guiding voice for all of us, and, and we certainly appreciate it. And we recognize the role you played in um, assuring that we were able to get this delay in the opening until the 21st, which is so critical from the perspective of school leaders needing the time to work with their staff to implement protocols that are not usual protocols, things that we haven't done in a number of years, things that we've never done actually, and being able to coordinate all of the instructional plans that are need, gonna need to, be get, to need to get done between working with our remote teachers and our in-person teachers. This is a tremendous undertaking. And Michael Mulgrew just said the work has only begun. And that was an understatement. We have so much to do between now and then. And really what I'm here to do is just to thank everyone on this Zoom meeting, all the elected officials, uh, Senator Jackson and, and um, uh, Borough President Brewer for, for your staunch advocacy, as well as Councilman Kalos and, and all the folks that are here have been speaking up and speaking out. And one of the things that is going to be a great challenge between now and then, you know, we've been talking about safety a lot and that's because safety is first and foremost and we need to keep everyone healthy. But there's another huge challenge ahead of us and that's staffing. And the fact that we're going to have these teachers working, you know, remotely separately from those working uh, in the buildings is terrific, but it presents a huge staffing challenge. And, t and principals right now are submitting numbers to the Department of Education of additional teachers they're going to need. And it's really mind boggling the numbers that I'm seeing come across. So we're going to request and, and, and ask for your support, not only for the safety uh, aspects of this, but making sure that we have appropriate staffing to make sure all of our children receive the education that they deserve. Thank you all so much for having this. And I look forward to our continued work together. So I want to thank uh, President Canizero and President Mogro. I want to take a moment to acknowledge something that really is worth acknowledging, um, their courage. And they're speaking up not just for their members. I know I've been in touch with members of CSA and UFT and DC 37, 32BJ, uh, and, and, and all others throughout this challenging year. Uh, what I want folks to know is uh, CSA, UFT, they are speaking up for much more than just their profession. They're speaking up for every single student and every single uh, school stakeholder because we are a school family. You know, teachers and principals, administrators, they're part of a school community, but it takes a family to do this work. And the emails, the calls, the messages that I've received have always been very student-centered about keeping my kids safe and supported. Principals, a APs, teachers have become, you know, caseworkers, making sure that kids are getting food delivered, uh, taking money out of their own pocket uh, to get kids hot food because some of the delivered food is always is only cold. Um, the stories I will never forget. The advocacy has been so powerful, and it's it's never about them or about their job or their, it's about the kids and their well-being. And I shared earlier, uh, President Mulgrew and President Canizero, that as a teacher, there was a moment in each new school year in the beginning, which can't be overlooked, that before I ask students to open up a notebook, I have to first establish trust in my classroom. I have to first establish that safe and supportive learning environment for each child, K 
Kids are very smart. They sense when something's wrong. They're brilliant. And that trust this year has been broken, not by folks on the Zoom call, but by, by leaders. And that's, that's a whole big thing that we just, we just went through. And so there's work to do to repair that trust and to build that trust to, to instill a sense of confidence because that's required to make this work. And so I just want to publicly thank both CSA, UFT for the, out, the, the, just the outpouring of advocacy and, and giving a voice to our kids this entire time. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's courageous, it's noted, and you, know, you helped us you know, push the administration, which was not moving at all. And we know that we have much more work to do. Um, I, I just uh, want to just ask very quickly to, to each to each leader, um, where do you believe, from your point of view? I have a point of view about from the city's budget negotiation team about the state of city's finances. How dire is the city's need for additional money from Albany to truly operationalize plans? Uh, to keep our school buildings, not just whether it's open in some fashion, but to, to remain operational and safe throughout the school year. How dire do you believe our need is from Albany for those resources right now? I'd like for each each president to please say a few words. Mark, Mark you start. I, it's, it's dire. Um, it's, it, it's, it's critical, and I, I don't think we can function without some additional resources. So um, it's, it's that simple. We need, to, we need to be able to borrow money, and we need to be able to make sure that we get some um, money from the state that is supposed to be coming. Yeah, we, uh, right now, we're requiring every school to have a 30-day COVID supply. It's not just PP. It's cleaning materials. It's all sorts of different things. I don't know how long the city can continue to keep that supply uh, chain moving uh, with our current uh, finances. Um, the federal government failed us all. They're a disgrace. They all stand up and give speeches about how important it is to open schools, knowing that these schools have all been decimated by fi financial hardship and they did nothing to help. So at this point, we're on our own in terms of our state. Uh, but I believe that we will be able to get to a place where we have Albany understanding this is a need of every community to stop worrying about politics, but also at the same time have complete transparency and clarity from City Hall. Because let, we all understand there's not a lot of trust between this administration and people in Albany. And I'm not talking about the governor, I'm talking about other uh, elected officials. So to us, it's like, that's irrelevant. We have to take care of our children and our children and our schools. So knock it off, we'll be in the room, everything is clear, transparent, on paper, this is what we're agreeing to, and stop telling us how you feel about this one or that one. It's irrelevant. And worse than that, it's a disgrace when you know we're talking about children coming to harm, and that's why you need to get over this stuff. Thank you both. Uh, I, I am in full agreement. Uh, we are in dire need. Um, and I just continue to be very grateful uh, for the courageous advocacy on behalf of the teachers, the administrators, and our entire school community members. Um, I am very grateful to my education family. This is, I'm telling you that they're not speaking up just for their profession. This is not about professionals. This is about a family. And you, if you mess with one member of the family, our kids, we're gonna fight like hell for our kids. And that's what this is all about. So I just wanna thank uh, both of you for your outstanding uh, leadership and courage. And we'll con continue to work together on, on, on behalf on behalf of our, of our, of our city. Um, Malcolm, do, do any of the other, my colleagues have any additional questions for, yes. for the panel? First, we'll hear from council member Kalos. Okay. Time starts now. I wanna start much like our education chair, Mark Traeger, by thanking both of you for using your organizations and the might of your members, our teachers and principals to support our parents and students to close the schools in March, delay opening and your forceful advocacy around safe schools. I have two questions. Uh, the first is for uh, UFT President uh, Michael Mulgrew. 
Uh, I believe testing will play a role in keeping our schools safe. Can you share any agreements you may have one on COVID-19 testing for adults and students in every school building? And a question for CSA President Canizero. You've heard from Borough President Brewer and me that the city won't use our capital dollars to make ventilation safe or buy laptops or students who need them. Are your principals getting additional funding for infrastructure improvements or the additional teachers you need? All right, Mark, I guess I go first. Sure. Uh, you know, we, we, we had the head epidemiologist from Harvard Medical School, as well as from the Northwell chain, um, working with us on the testing protocols that we uh, said we needed to have. And, and the main piece, uh, you could do a large pool test, test every one time, but as they were clear with us, that only lasts three days, three or four days. They even argue about three or four days. That's how they should just decide and stop arguing about it. Um, but they said, if you're going to open up this school system, you, you're going to have to monitor, screen every school community. Um, and just urging and telling people to go for tests is not going to do it because that's not what this is about. Uh, people go for tests when they have symptoms. The danger to the school system is those who don't have symptoms. And the way you deal with that, very clearly they told me, they were very forceful on this, is that you have uh, a scientific random sampling of each community on a monthly basis. Unless you have an issue, unless there's an issue going on in the community, a zip code has a, is a growing number of positive cases, then they basically said you flood that zone, you flood your school. And they said you can keep your school safe this way because what you'll do is identify quickly if somebody has the virus before they start to demonstrate systems, uh, symptoms, um, when they become much more uh, contagious, you can isolate and do all the other protocols automatically kick in. This, is, this was the biggest stumbling block we had with the city of New York in trying to get our schools open. So here you had top two experts have the same interests that we do. They absolutely agreed the schools should be open, but you had to do it in the right way. But at the same time, they have, a, they have an interest in making sure that the virus does not spread again inside of our city. And that is why they were, they were like, you can open up without this, but you'll get spikes inside of schools because you're not monitoring and you'll close schools down left and right. And you might think that's OK, but then we're going to have to deal with the fact that you might have just started a new surge in New York City. That's why they said you cannot open without a medical monitoring program and one that's de designed by actual epidemiologists, not the measure. So that is what we now have in place here in New York City. And I wanna be clear, it's a monitoring program. So the test is not as invasive as having a COVID test. I I've had all the different COVID tests because my wife and I take care of both of our mothers who are absolutely medically fragile. Um, and the, you can, and when you're doing just monitoring, um, you can do what's known as a nasal swab that doesn't go all the way up into the nasal cavity. It just comes into the beginning of your nose. Those are, the, that's the medical monitoring program we'll be using here in, our, in New York City schools. And it's mandated for everyone. You know, some people were like, well, you don't mandate the teachers, just the children or mandate just the teachers, not the children. I said, no, we're in this together. We're going to these schools together. We all gotta be there. We gotta show each other we're all in this together. Um, so that's what we have, and I thank you for that question, and let me and, and allow me to explain that. Thank you, uh, Council Member Kalos, for your question as well. Um, no, there, there's no direct funds coming to schools for the uh, upgrading of the ventilation or the technology. Uh, however, we have been assured, and, and, and or the staffs, um, but we have been assured that those uh, issues would be settled by the city and handled that way. So I haven't seen exactly how it's going to happen yet, but we have been assured that it would be taken care of. Um, as far as the need for technology, the need is coming mainly for new students into the system. There is certainly, there certainly is that need, like, the, like um, Chair Traeger mentioned a, a while ago, for um, you know, maintenance and repairs. But a big need is coming for the new students into the system. And that's mm -hmm. where we're seeing some of the principals reaching out um, and looking for funds in order to purchase the technology. Mm -hmm. So we do have some issues there. 
but the funds are not coming directly to principals. They're uh, apparently going through the city of New York. And Mark, what do we do if a school doesn't get what it's supposed to get in terms we, of safety? We reach out. Oh, we, there you go. If, if they don't have what they have in terms of safety, they're not going to be able to open. We don't let them open, period. Thank you. Next, uh, Council Member Rosenthal has questions. Time starts now. Thank you. Trying to unmute there. Um, thank you very much. I really just wanted to take one minute because I know we have a lot of people lined up to speak and ask questions. Um, just to thank both of you. And uh, you. the work you've done is extraordinary. Um, but uh, President Canazaro, I have to tell you, your principles on the Upper West Side are truly rock stars. Um, I uh, I, um, we, we have an additional set of issues uh, where parents are very concerned for a variety of reasons about their kids walking to school. So in addition to getting their schools together, uh, you know, making sure they have enough teachers for, uh, you know, on-site learning and coordinating the teachers and the the students and, and the different models that they want to have. And then um, on top of that, making sure their buildings are in good shape. Uh, it's extraordinary what we've asked these people to do. In my mind's eye, it's on the level of what we've asked Catherine Garcia to do as, you know, commissioner of sanitation, the food czar and the lead czar. That's what each of your principals are doing every single day. It's yeoman's work. I don't understand how we can ask them to do it, but even on top of that, how we can ask them to do that with so many unanswered questions. You know, as you just said, uh, we're assuming every school will have a nurse. Well, is that every school or is that every building? We're assuming it's every school. But what these principals are really asking for is more social workers. And Chair Traeger, that is something you've championed uh, for a long time. And, you know, these kids have been through extraordinary trauma. There's no question every school needs at least a couple of social workers as well as guidance counselors. And you know, when we talk about borrowing for our schools, in addition to the fact that we can't absorb any cuts from the state government, um, when we talk about borrowing, I think we should be asking to borrow more money to make sure there are at least two social workers in every single school. This is an extraordinary time. We've never seen a crisis like this. Our kids are going through a trauma that none of us have ever experienced. And we have to make sure that they are as healthy as possible in every way, both physically and mentally. So all of which to say, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next, we will hear from Council Member Lander. Time starts now. Thank you very much, Chair, for the hearing and to both of you, uh, Michael and Mark. And your members have been extraordinary in their commitment and their solidarity and their compassion and their organizing. Uh, for themselves and each other and our families. And, you know, this has been and is a really dark time, but watching people organize together um, has really been powerful and I'm grateful for it. And um, it's making a, a tremendous, tremendous difference. Um, and of course, in addition to the teachers and principals, to the paras and cafeteria workers and everybody that's showing up in those schools, too long a list to name. Uh, though I do want to underline what Councilmember Rosenthal said, because I think um, I know for myself, I praise teachers a lot. And I don't know that I always praise principals. Somehow you have like the principal in your head. It's like the, you know, the, the big principal from when you were an elementary school student. But I will just say that watching what principals are doing right now, fighting for their teachers, fighting for their kids and planning to make this work. And I say this as a public school parent who is so grateful for our principal, as well as the ones in my district. It, it's really extraordinary what they're doing. 
Um, the question I want to ask, and, and I apologize, I was having some technical difficulties, so I got kicked off during some of Chair Traeger's questions, um, uh, is about the chi wraparound child care plans for those of our teachers and school staff and principals that have kids themselves. Obviously, it's essential to put safety first, so organizing and, and letting us know what the agreement is on safety, top, top, top. But there's also some just very practical things, like if you're a teacher who yourself has an elementary school kid who's only in school one or two or three days a week, what, who normally was in school five days a week, how could you go to work? So when the city originally announced their plan, they had no proposal for this. Thanks to our organizing together, the mayor made an announcement that there would be uh, 50,000 slots to be able to serve 100,000 kids, assuming they're in kind of half-time education. Um, but now we have not heard anything yet. I mean, they put up a portal that people could apply and it did at least ask, are you a teacher? Are you an essential worker? Are you a low-income family? But now, you know, we're still just a few days from the start of the school year. And as far as I know, we haven't yet heard anything. No one has heard back. Um, so have you guys heard anything for your members who have uh, their own elementary age school kids, um, uh, what are they doing? And how are they gonna be able to show up and teach if they don't have childcare? And um, what are we gonna do together to make sure that that program gets stood up in a way that is safe um, and that shows up on time or that, you know, for our, our teachers, our school staff and our principals. And I'm committed to work together with you to make that happen. I know this is a question I wanna be asking the, the administration uh, because they're the ones responsible for standing it up. And certainly I am asking them, but, uh, but I wanna ask what you guys are, you know, how you're seeing that and what we can do together. I haven't heard a word about it since their announcement. We keep asking and we get, oh yeah, we're coming out with it. Yes, and same, I, same, same thing here. The only thing I can add to that is I do know they did reach out to schools, some schools, to see if there was space available um, for some of these uh, programs, they're calling it the Bridge Academy. But um, you know, they they reach out to schools thinking they identified space, but not understanding that most of the principals have used all of the space available for social distancing in this age of COVID. Mm -hmm. And and so where they think there's space, there isn't always. So yeah. uh, that that's all I've heard though. So so. And I We've been talking to them a lot. I know they are reaching out to space providers and childcare providers, but it's time to stand it up because I, I assume, yeah. I guess I'll just ask with this. I mean, you each have members who have young children uh, who need childcare if they're going to come to work and take care of other people's children, teach them and uh, right. I mean, that's not crazy, is it? Right. That's why we were running. We ran a campaign until he made his announcement. And now we keep asking, where is it? And um, I, uh, it'll uh, be the normal, I guess, the last minute or late, and that's going to be a problem. All right. Well, I'm pledged to work closely with you guys to, to hammer and follow up on this. There's so many other things. So I guess we have to kind of like spread out as a team for which one we really push on. And, and I care deeply about all the others that you're working on, but I'll uh, continue to work with you on this one so we can get this stood up for, for all those families uh, who need it. So thank you right. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Levine. Time starts now. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, Chair Traeger, for fighting hard for the safety of our school system. And a heartfelt thanks to both of our presidents, President Mulgrew and President Karen Sorrell, for standing up for students, for parents, families, and the women and men who are staffing our schools during this difficult time. And, in my role as chair of the health committee, I've been proud to stand with you to stand up for safety. And so in that led, I wanna ask about two things. Um, you were able to negotiate a citywide trigger that if the positivity rate in testing exceeds 3%, then the whole system will revert to distance learning. Uh, as you know, we have real inequality in the way this pandemic is playing out. And there are some communities, especially low income black and brown neighborhoods where the positivity rate is already higher than the city average. And uh, we could easily see neighborhoods where locally the rates are above 3%. Uh, I believe you've neg negotiated protocols for how the city should react in such cases. Wanted to ask you about that. And then secondly, on testing, uh, thank you for fighting so hard. Um, you know that a test is only good if you get a quick result. 
We have tests today in the city that are delayed seven, 10, 14 days. That makes it pointless. Uh, really, a test needs to be uh, 48 hours or less. Could you talk about the guarantees that you've extracted on the quick turnaround for testing so it's really useful to protect the okay. safety of our state? Our agreement says 48 hour turnaround. So just want to let you know that now the city's trying to figure out how to make that happen. But you have to understand, I mean, just think of it in scale. You have close to 1,500 school buildings. Each one will have between 10 and 20% of the entire population tested on a monthly basis. And all of those tests have to have results back within 48 hours. So that's how uh, it's a challenge, but I know that it, it can be done. Uh, when it comes to the neighborhoods, uh, in terms of monitoring each zip code, uh, we had to we put in the provisions that we can really do uh, flood the school itself with uh, all sorts of protective testing, monitoring, uh, in hopes of being able to try to keep those schools open. Uh, I don't think that schools should be, uh, you know, I, I have a real hard, it, it's difficult when you're dealing with, you know that certain communities were hit harder than anyone else, so do they not deserve to have their school open? You know, and it's a tough call. So how do you balance that need of safety because they've been hit so hard with the need of when you know that that school is basically the foundational rock inside of the community. Right. And it's, it, it, that's a tough, that's, that's a tough decision that we're stuck with. So it's, we're trying, what we've done is that we have a plan that we think will actually allow the school to be held safe. But if, it, if, if, if once you get, Basically, if you have positive right. tests in different in two different parts of the school, then the school is going to be uh, go to distance learning automatically. Uh, but we do believe that, you know, that's in terms of equity. Uh, there's one thing about the, this plan that we have. Uh, no one can come. No one can deny that this is the most equitable plan, plan ever, because this is for every school. Every school has to be treated the same. But we do know certain communities, we're gonna have more challenges because of the, as we see the fluctuation in positivity rate. What we saw earlier this, uh, last, in the middle of last month on in Sunset Park, uh, actually it was sad, but it was good because we actually saw the flooding of the zone works. You just yeah. flood it and you test everybody and you quarantine them quickly and all of a sudden you can push your rates down. That's what the epidemiologists have been telling us throughout, which is why we have this program. But thank you for your question and support. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Um, go oh, ahead. sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's, no. That's, that's all. I was just gonna, I was just gonna re reiterate what Michael said. That's, that's fine, move on. Next one's yours, Mark. <laughs> uh, next, we will hear from Council Member Menchaca. Time starts now. Thank you, and I also wanna say thank you to both of you your hard work and not just your work in the union, but all the members on the ground that are fighting really, really hard. And I'm glad um, that you brought up Sunset Park. And I think Sunset Park really taught us a lot. And I'm not sure that, that there are, um, I don't think we're at the level yo, though at how we can respond quickly enough. I saw a lot of issues even with that rapid response, especially for immigrant communities. And so I want to ask a little bit more about, about if you could go deeper into that Sunset Park incident, which I think will, will happen, and what happens to the entire neighborhood. Uh, and a school is a school, but a school is also embedded in a neighborhood with multiple children going to multiple schools. And so that's how we're thinking about it in Sunset Park as one larger community, uh, multi-generational folks living in one, apart one apartment. And so if you can talk a little bit more about Sunset Park and the learning from that, I'd like to hear that um, from both of you actually to see, see what you're all thinking on the principal side and teachers. And then also a question about isolation rooms and, and talk a little bit more about what, what, what that means if, if a child is uh, and tests positive while at school, what happens and walk us through that process. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. I said, <laughs> uh, the, the Sunset Talk actually is just, everyone has to understand now that data is king in terms of uh, COVID. We can always look at it. We know it's faulty at times, all right? But 
what when that was happening was when I was spending the most time with the epidemiologists we were working with. And they said, if you actually flood that zone and you start testing and quarantining quickly, uh, you, what you will do is you should be able to stop it from spreading as long as you move rapidly. And we know that some folks uh, have issues with being tested at times, but this is a virus. Uh, and the virus is not political. I, everybody's trying to make the virus political, but the virus itself is not political. Um, so we have to treat it uh, by using the data that the experts are telling us we need to be looking at and when then following the directions that we have to do. So that was the first time, in t as far as I was concerned, where the city actually responded appropriately because I was working with our own epidemiologists and they saw the testing numbers in the area where that were having the, the mini surge and they said that seems as if they're doing it correctly now let's see if it works I'm in excited. terms of in terms of the isolation rooms what happens is if anyone is showing some sort of symptoms in the uh, in a school building if they've already tested positive they're not coming to the school building they're going to be remote, hopefully, uh, because maybe because hopefully they don't develop any of the severe uh, so, uh, effects of COVID, and they just are asymptomatic for a period of time. Uh, but for those who are de uh, demonstrating symptoms inside of a school building, uh, they are then brought to the school nurse. The school nurse determines whether they are COVID symptoms-like symptoms, and at that point, the parent is contacted or the adult is. Uh, Asked, uh, is basically said it's time to, for you to go home or and at the same time we are hoping that the nurses uh, we think we're going to have this done in time the nurses would also be able to arrange for a rapid test for whoever is involved and of course at that point it's the parent uh, and the adult what they can make their own decisions but they cannot come back to the school uh, uh, unless they've been qu uh, quarantined or have a negative test result so, I mean, same thing, look, look, when it comes to the, the positive rates and the high positivity rates, we need to, we need to leave the, um, the decisions to the, you know, uh, the, the, the nonpartisan doctors that are, are helping us out and put politics aside and listen to the experts. You know, I, I know where my lane is and, and I don't know what I don't know about epidemiology and, and the virus. And we have a lot of experts that are out there uh, helping us and advising us and advising the city of New York. And that's the key, just making sure that we listen to the experts. And when these rates tick up, we flood the school, make sure that the, we don't have too many positive cases or any positive cases in the building. And if and when we do, we go to the protocols that we have, either quarantining classrooms or, or shutting schools down for a period of time. And that's critical. Um, as far as the isolation rooms, uh, yeah, like, like Michael said, if, if somebody's exhibiting symptoms and we're uh, concerned that it's a potential case, we isolate them until they're able to be tested by a professional. And then there's a determination made whether or not that child needs to be kept out of the building for a period of time. So um, again, you know, we're, we're relying on, on people that have the expertise in this field. Got it. And I think the last thing I want to say is that up, up until the, you know, the politics should be out of this, but politics is driving a lot of the impacts on how people engage government, especially when government is saying, get tested, come to a government program uh, in the park to get tested. And in the Sunset Park situation, there was an ICE raid that happened right before the spike went up that caused a lot of folks to step back and not engage. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is that that's only going to increase because of politics, because there's a big November election. And that I think is going to, is going to, and New York City is a focus right now by the president. And I'm just thinking that can be, I think, and should be a factor in considering how we think about engaging parents, immigrant parents. And I'd love to work with both of you after this hearing on how to make that happen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Council Member. Um, I uh, also want to recognize that uh, we've been uh, joined 
by Council Member uh, Rose and also Council Member Chaka. I just note that you're here for the record as well. Thank you for your questions and advocacy on behalf of your district and, and, our, and our kids. But next, I think we have Council Member Rose who wants to ask a question. Time starts now. Councilmember Rose, uh, Debbie, trying to unmute you. You have a question. Okay, it looks like she may. Okay, have... uh, I'm unmuted now. Okay, go ahead, Council. Yes, Rose. you are. Thank you. Um, my concern has been about um, the REC centers, and and what level of. Um, educational exchanges is, is taking place there um, um, and the need for central workers to continue to utilize these centers what what is the plan in terms of you know um, these children that are going to be there is are they going to be certified you know, and, and, and lessons with these young people and how are they going to do it um, when there are people there of, of varying ages? Um, I'm really concerned about this because our workers still have to go to work and, um, and I'm not clear how um, are going to lose these parties. Education centers. Okay, I'm not sure if we heard the entire question, but I think the concern is about the the rec centers right now. Uh, you know, the Department of yes. Education with us, we worked to put those rec centers up rather quickly uh, in March. Uh, the city had no plan, and uh, uh, actually, uh, this and I don't say this, I don't say these things often, but this phenomenal person at the DOE, Ursulina Ramirez worked with myself and Mark, and we got those centers up rather quickly, almost immediately. Um, and then we were lucky enough uh, because over 3,500 uh, teachers and administrators volunteered to make sure that they were staffed and they've been open throughout uh, since March. The thing is now, uh, now it becomes, it, it can, because the school system needs to open and function, it can't, it's no longer going to be the Department of Education. Um, so this is where the question before came up about the child care program that the mayor announced. Right. Uh, we don't have the answers for that. Uh, we're all slightly frustrated we're not getting answers. Uh, all we hear is, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I know, I asked you a question, the answer's not yeah. It's like, what are the details? When are you standing the program up? What's gonna go on inside of it? Because our members' children are gonna be in there also. Right. Um, so, um, so we you know, is there any attempt answer. to, um, are, are there going to be man teachers? Is there uh, going I gotta to be honest you know, with you. Uh, right. any, are lessons going to be? <laughs> uh, that right now, every teacher in New York City who works for the Department of Education is I'm needed sorry. to teach. Right now. Um, we are actually the Department of Ed is in the process of redeploying any central administrative staff with a teaching certificate. We are so short teachers. So in terms of uh, the child care programs, it, they, may, they may or may not have someone with a teaching certificate, but if they work for the Department of Education, they're going to be in sh uh, being utilized for the Department of Education because we are so short staffed. Thank you. I, I, I'm just really concerned about these child care um, centers and the rec centers and, and if there's going to be any um, level of, of education, you know, being done there. Is there going to be, you know, any pedagogy going on? They may or may not. I know if they have, I know that we've had conversations with utilizing some of our daycare providers. All of them have been trained in early childhood development. Uh, but I know that that won't be enough for 100,000 children. But I know all of the UFT early child care providers are 
actually have been certified early child development uh, specialists. Yeah, and, and some of the CBOs have been contacted also that have folks that have some experience um, to do this. But again, like, like Michael said, and, and Chet Traeger alluded to very early in this, um, in this hearing, the, the mantra of guidance is forthcoming is another, this is another example of it. And we're just waiting for this guidance um, that we so desperately need. And, and Chair Traeger, we, we don't want to be rude, but Mark and myself do have to get to a meeting. <laughs> um, Council member Grudenchuk did have his hand up if he wants, if he can quickly ask his question of you both. That's fine. Very quickly, yes. Time starts uh, as, as the husband of an educator, I know it, uh, time is uh, at, a, at a premium. I, I just have a question for you. I, I was hoping perhaps one of my colleagues would ask it, but I am very concerned um, as someone who counts well as a, a graduate of New York City Public Schools, when they did the survey about education, whether you were going to be, you know, in school or, or remote only, um, the numbers to me, I mean, I wish I had an election where the default was, if you don't vote, your vote counts for Grudenchik. I know that doesn't <laughs> work like that. And I wondered if either of you gentlemen would like to comment on that. I wanted to make that statement. Uh, to put it on the record, because it to me is uh, practically an obscenity that we would count votes um, that weren't voted. Um, we seem to be having that problem in many areas of this country. But uh, I wondered if, if you, either of you gentlemen would like to talk about this or would like to politely decline. I'll take either, uh, and, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to put that on the record. You could start, Mark. Sure. No, I, I'm happy to comment on that. And, and, and I, I agree from, from the perspective. I'm not even looking at this from a, a political perspective of what we put out there. But principals need to know how many students are coming to school in which grades so that they can program classes. And right now, what we know is that a very large percentage of those families who responded to the survey have opted for all remote learning and making the assumption that all the others are coming to school, we know is a faulty assumption. So we're trying our best to have an idea of what it's going to look like. And, it, and a lot of schools are actually reaching out and calling parents individually to try to find out what those numbers are going to look like. So yes, it would have been a, a service to us had we known, had every, everyone been asked to respond. But uh, you know, this is where we're at right now and it, it is causing us some uh, programming headaches. So uh, we needed to do the survey, uh, let's yes. be clear. That was part of, of course of uh, programming issues, but then for the mayor to claim that anyone who didn't fill out the survey was standing by him and his, his <laughs> plan would just be classic New York City uh, Chutzpah is a nice way to say it. That's a nice way, uh, that's a nice way to put it. I will, uh, I will, uh, my wife is teaching upstairs as we speak right now, uh, her students at Nassau Community College. I'm gonna leave it there. I wanna thank both of you uh, uh, for your incredible work on behalf of not only the children of the city of New York, but really um, everybody, because um, as Chair Traeger knows, uh, I feel um, as many of us do that uh, our schools are the bedrock of our community. So. Thank you both and uh, thank you. Continue. Thank, thank um, you very much. Councilmember Barron had a very short but urgent question before you go. <laughs> well, since she's one of us, she can ask, of course. <laughs> Time starts now. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, we hear the phrase, we're all in this together, which you would think implies equity. But we know that we may all be in the storm together, but some people are in ocean liners or yachts or rowboats and some people just have life jackets. So, or some people have learning pods and some people have summer homes that they can go to. So there is mm -hmm. existing inequity and this novel coronavirus has exposed it, put a spotlight on the racism that exists in these institutions across the country. Coming out of this, what are we going to have in place that will address those materials that we have purchased in the past in the form of textbooks that don't acknowledge, or reflect what our contributions have been as a people. And additionally, what kind of pedagogical approaches are going to now correct what has existed for so many years. And uh, also, what are we going to do to recapture the lost instructional time that children have been subjected to? for these last six months and moving forward. How are we going to recapture that time? 
Well, we, we have, um, first, first of all, that, that, that was perhaps a short but not easy question to answer, that's for sure, um, and, but, but a very important one indeed. We, we have put, the, the Department of Education has uh, assembled a group from the CSA, the UFT, and the Department of Education to rethink our curriculum. And actually, we were, we were in the midst of really getting through that when the pandemic struck. And they're still working, but they were sidetracked a little bit. But those, um, it, you know, it, it, it was focused on a culturally responsive education, uh, as well as the New York State standards. So there is a lot of progress in that area, although we're certainly not there yet, and, and we should be there. There's no, there's no doubt about that. As far as the lost instructional time, that's going to be one of the biggest challenges that we're faced with, especially as we're going into this remote and hybrid environment where we're still not going to have the children in front of us on an everyday regular basis. So our teachers, our school leaders, and all of the folks are extremely dedicated. They're going to be looking at the students and, and doing the absolute best they can. But there is, there are facts here. The facts are there are, the, the, the gaps have grown wider, the, the uh, inequities have grown wider, and we're really going to need to uh, redouble our efforts to try to bring some semblance to this. Yeah, I, I'm going to echo what Mark said. Uh, the shame, the, the the, the shame was our project, our curriculum project was really moving forward. Uh, and when this pandemic hit and we were really getting to a place where there would be a choice for every school community, but everything was going to have cultural responsiveness uh, inside of it. Um, and, you know, the pandemic, let, let's, we, we can't paint this like we're, we're going to be able to make it all better. We're not. There has been some damage that's done that will not be undone. We just have to face that. And, and we're also now facing uh, this, this cohort or this, the, you know, council member, I can speak to you that way. This cohort uh, of children, uh, as soon as we get through this virus, we'll be looking at a very, very difficult recession, which makes this even more complicated. Mm -hmm. And then when we have a recession, it really becomes even worse, as we all know, for the children with the, who really have uh, faced the greatest challenges. And that's something we're going to have to all work on to make sure that we don't allow that to happen in our city. Everyone talks about equity, but we really never have it, do we? We don't. Right. Right. That is why, like, on this safety plan, I get to say we have equity. It's every school, period, end of story. It doesn't matter. It does you no, you don't get to yeah. have the mask, and they, and they are, you don't get to not have them, and they get to have them. We're not doing that anymore. So I think yeah. we need to take the same approach when we get out of this when it comes to educational support, because it's going to be rough, you know, and, it, and if yeah. things work out, everything for the best, we're looking at three really bad years. I was in a meeting exactly. yesterday and I said to someone, I said, your administration's not going to be here in a year and a half. You know, all you keep talking about is next year. All the economic forecasters are telling us next year is going to be bad. The following year is going to be the worst. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this virus has done a lot of damage, and but we still got a long way to go because this recession is directly as a result of this virus. So we got a long way to go through this, but... I, I hear you clearly, and we will continue this fight. We will get the curriculum project done, but then it's really about fighting to make sure each school is is being supported exactly the same, or at some times being supported even more because of the challenges that that school faces. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Thank you. So, or equal is not always you know, the equity is not always the equal. Thank you. All right. And that concludes questions for this panel. We will now thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Chair Traeger. Thank you, thank you for your courage. Appreciate you. We will now call up the next panel: Erwin Redlener, Jessica Yeager, Adam Grumbach, and Dr. Ramon Talaj. We will first hear from Erwin Redlener. Starting time. 
Um, I unmuted. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this, and I'll, I'll try to keep my remarks uh, brief. I first of all want to just uh, uh, thank the City Council, and and I also want to make note of uh, Council Member um, um, Menchaca's points about the politics of all this, and everybody's points about the disparities. And I and also uh, Michael Mulgrew and the UFT have been uh, spectacular in uh, dealing with this and working with the city and trying to get something done that is fair and appropriate. I'm a pediatrician. I direct the National Center for Disaster uh, Preparedness at Columbia University and the pandemic program there. So um, uh, two quick points. The politics is real, and it started at the top with the most incompetent management of a crisis in American history that Donald Trump has engaged in uh, since this whole thing began. And it, this incompetence has seeped down and caused tremendous damage in America in every city, every rural area, and so on. And uh, the other thing I wanna say is that I know we're doing a lot of hand-wringing here about disparities and they're real, but they existed well before this pandemic happened. The poverty, the adversities, the, the struggles that kids that uh, were, were failing in schools and so on, these are intrinsic institutional problems that we're gonna have to take on. In some ways, the pandemic has shed light on some long, long problems, and hopefully we'll be able to tackle them. But as Michael Mulgrew just said, it's going to take a very, very long time to fix this. So uh, I just want to make a couple of uh, quick points here. I'm glad that uh, the reopening has been postponed. I've been deeply concerned about this. Uh, and by the way, we've been, we've been living in a bubble in New York for and everywhere for six months. Children have been basically isolated at home with their nuclear families, and that's it. Now we're putting nationally 55 million children back into schools in one way or another, and we don't know what's gonna happen. Like we didn't know what was gonna happen at the university and college campus level. We're, we're doing even uh, a bigger, broader experiment with our uh, uh, pre-K to 12 students. Anyway, uh, I just wanna say the testing issue, we're about to, we're on the verge of having a, a point of care testing, which will change everything. Uh, we need to be testing way more frequently than monthly. Uh, we're, we're not there yet. Uh, we need to really uh, focus on the remote learning. The disparities there are unconscionable. Sure. And the final point I want to make is where are the billionaires and high net worth individuals in New York who any one of them could have provided the resources to make sure every single child in New York City had the Internet access, the equipment and the mentoring to make sure they were able actually to um, uh, to, to perform in a remote learning environment. Where are those billionaires? Has anyone asked them to help save the children of New York City? I'll leave it at that, thanks. Next, we will hear from Jessica Yeager. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger and members of the Education Committee. My name is Jessica Yeager and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Planning at WIN. As New York City's largest provider of shelter and services for homeless families with children, we're gravely concerned that homeless students are being left behind by the city's response to the COVID-19 crisis. Wynn supports the City Council's Resolution 1410 and urges the city to prioritize the health of our students and school staff at the same time as ensuring that all children, especially our most vulnerable children, have the resources they need to learn. We are heartened by the recent agreement between the mayor and the UFT delaying the school opening date and urge the city to only reopen schools once the experts determine it is safe. In addition, DOE must immediately address the lack of preparedness and resources for homeless families. To date, remote learning has failed children in shelter. These students continue to endure late and inconsistent access to technology and other critical academic supports. For homeless students to succeed, the DOE must ensure that they can access technology and the services they need, such as individualized instruction and tutors, paraprofessionals, bridging the gap social workers, and a live IT help desk, even during remote learning. We are also extremely disturbed by DOE's inadequate communication with parents and shelters. There is no known plan to provide transportation for homeless students. A number of students in our shelters have not received notifications of which schools they are registered to attend. The closure of school buildings has severed important communications and administrative channels including the near disappearance of family liaisons and shelters and the closing of district offices. And these have not been reestablished in preparation for the new school year. To open schools without these critical supports for the city's neediest children in place would be unconscionable. Thank you very much for your consideration of this important topic and all that you do for New York City's homeless families and children.
Thank you. And next we will hear from Adam Grumbach. Starting time. Thank you, Mr. Chair and council members. My name is Adam Grumbach. I'm a recently retired principal from a consortium high school in New York City. I actually retired on Monday, which means I can spend some time with you today. I've been working closely with principals these last six months to plan for this coming year and the failures of the Department of Education have been placed in high relief during this time. The essential problem is that the central department pays zero attention to the voices coming out of schools. The balance between accountability and support, which are the two functions of the central department are completely out of whack. It's all accountability all the time now and the department is just not very good at support. And these failures have become very clear. Rather than asking school leaders and school communities what they need to engage students and make this year productive, the department has ignored our requests until the 11th hour, instead issuing directives and protocols that throw everything into chaos. Specifically, my frustrations this year, we have been requesting along with parents, outdoor space. Everybody knows that anything you can do outdoors is much safer than what you can do indoors. Until August 28th, the mayor ignored these requests, made it impossible to get outdoor space reserved for schools. So far, the only outdoor spaces that have been approved have been already in the controls of schools like the, the schoolyard, no adjacent streets or anything like that. We don't have tents, we don't have tables. The fire department and the police department have tents and tables that could be given to schools. That hasn't happened. The central bureaucracy could be efficient at providing these things, but it just doesn't do it. We've been asking for ventilation and to have our ventilation checked for two months now. That started this past week and they are discovering to their chagrin that a lot of schools don't have working HVAC systems or have windows that open. We've been asking for a nurse to be provided for every school. That was, I guess, guaranteed, promised by the mayor on August 14th. It hasn't happened yet. I'm, I'm glad to hear Mr. Mulgrew say that it's going to happen and that there's going to be rapid testing available. But the department has provided a protocol for what to do for confirmed cases. What do we do between the time when someone has a suspected case and we get confirmation? What do we do for the classroom of students who've been sitting in the room with a sick student or staff member? These are the issues that need to be addressed and we need help quickly. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And the final panelist will be Dr. Ramon Talaj, please. Okay. Pardon John. Good morning. I would like to put this on in my speech, the state of denial, that I believe the school reopening is important. This March, my colleague is almost in a free will, knowing the risk, have free tested hundreds of thousands of families, fed hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers at our expenses. We didn't wait. We did it because it's the right thing to do. And we continue to treat our patients and their children in the neighborhoods where they live, not in hospital, not with ventilators, but with family medicine in the value-based care. We ourselves have lost a lot of college to COVID virus, particularly pediatricians. We know what it means to be in the field uh, with the kids. So I'm here today to tell you about our experience, offer our help, share our perspective as the trusted voice of healthcare for the school in community of color that their parents choose us to take care of them with good preventive medicine and high quality. There's no question that you need to postpone the opening of the school. And I'll tell you why. Nothing has changed since March. The same killing virus, no vaccine, no treatment. We know that in our neighborhood, 40% of the kids are IUG positive. We have tested 120,000 tests we have done in children's, more than 400,000 in general. 60% then haven't seen the virus. At any point, if you accept 2%, that means for every 100 kids, two will have the virus. And they will go and mix with the 60 who haven't seen it. And they will come back home, the majority without symptoms, and deja vu, it will come again. Those apartments, multi-generational, small, with the grandparents and parents, somebody's gonna die. Those apartments are the nursing home equivalent in our neighborhood. But there's also other things. 90% of our family tests say they don't wanna bring the kids. I don't know what they're talking about. 90% say they don't bring the kids back to school. Now, we believe that a minimum offer testing for every student, teacher, principal, and a school employee should be done. And we give our offices and we be in any school if asked to do the test for them. Now, by bringing, second thing, by bringing the school nurses, independent nurses, as suggested by the teacher association, we would like to have computers. We will donate 500 computers to connect with us with all HIPAA compliant 
to be sure that everything, not only the vaccine, not only the testing, everything is a good communication. We start doing different kinds of family medicine. And to finalize, I'll tell you this. We should look at this for, we take care of 200,000 kids, 20% of the kids in New York City and our group in Network and Somos. If you know that 42% of our kids are already positive or 40%, those kids are free to start. Yes, we don't know how long the immunity lasts, but we know that for four months it's still there. We've been testing that. We know. Therefore, those kids should start school. The real infection, we haven't seen that. Somebody mentioned somebody in some place. We haven't seen that. And the immunity is still there. Now we only have to deal with 60%. That's my belief. The state of denial is this. Virus is still there. In August, 3.5% in our neighborhood is still positive. Not two, no one, no 0.9, 3.5. Therefore, there's no guarantee. It doesn't matter how you open, it's a virus. As Mr. Morrow said, the virus will not stop because you are a politics, you have papers, no papers, insurance, no insurance. It will move from one place to the other in human beings, especially now after this vacation in these days. Please, we've been there since the beginning, pay attention to what we're saying. And we're here, here to help in any direction that we could do. Thank you. Thank you very much for your powerful testimony and sharing your very serious and powerful concerns. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a hand raised by Council Member Levin. Time starts now. Thank you very much, um, Chair, uh, and I want to thank this panel. Um, uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Redliner if he's still on the call. Um, so, uh, Dr. Redliner, you had expressed some concerns a couple of weeks ago that there might still be, or that there would be um, uh, an outbreak associated with, um, with schools in New York City you know, this fall. Um, is there anything in this plan that you see would um, change, uh, you know, change that potential. Uh, Dr. Redliner, one moment. We just need to unmute, unmute you. Hi. Uh, thanks for that question. I am glad mm -hmm. that the schools are reopening and to your question, but I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that, that we're going to have to close the schools again. Uh, and uh, what, the, what Dr. Tollers was just talking about is real. We have three potential mm -hmm. uh, hotbeds of resurgence. Now, one of the universities and uh, colleges that, are, that have already reopened have already seen tremendous outbreaks. We have uh, the Labor Day weekend coming up uh, with all sorts of activities that we won't be able to control. And finally, we have this massive return of many, many students and teachers and staff uh, to the school system. And yeah, we're trying to be ready, but uh, I absolutely uh, still stick with my point. I'm glad we're trying to do this, but I'm very uh, pretty, pretty certain that we're going to see a resurgence. It's just, there's too many factors here that we can't control. And uh, mm -hmm. like, like Dr. Talaj said, uh, it's just, it's a virus and it's going to spread and the schools are not as ready as they could or should be. Unfortunately, even even starting um, with where we are now in terms of our case uh, levels being so low here in New York City. Yeah, and I, I was never a big believer in the in the infection rates as the criteria because that can change in a heartbeat. It, it could change, mm -hmm. you know, in a week after we get started here. These children, it's not just a question of the children getting infected. We're going to have asymptomatic children with the virus going home to multi-generational families, the people at tremendously high risk, and they're mm -hmm. gonna become spreaders. And that's, I mean, I don't, I don't know how we're gonna avoid that. I mean, I hope we do, but I'm just not, I don't know how that's gonna happen. Right. Um, okay, I mean, that's, it's, so it, you know, is there, are there um, uh, physical changes to the layouts of the buildings, improvements uh, that you could see being done to ventilation and configuration of the schools, the outdoor, the outdoor space 
do those things are do those move the needle or are they kind of uh um you know uh, around the edges no they move the needle and they're all good and we need the separation we need the mass we need the teachers and staff being ready and prepared we need to use uh utilize outdoor spaces um and the ventilation system is a big problem i'm counting on what uh, Michael Mulgrew was saying and what the city and the mayor's office was saying that all the rooms will be inspected and I hope that they'll inspect them and, and, and fix uh, the ones that are not ready, but they can't let children or teachers back mm -hmm. in a classroom that does not have adequate ventilation. That's a, another formula for disaster here that could be avoided. Mm -hmm. and so many spaces available in the city. We turned the Javits Center into a massive hospital center uh, a few months ago. Why don't we turn that into uh, classroom space? Why don't we use more outdoor space? Uh, there's a lot of things that we could have done, including, as I said before, asking our corporate leaders and our very, you know, our, you know, massive amount of uh, high net worth individuals in New York, find us the space, find us the extra support that we need, find us the people that will help us uh, uh, deal with children who need the support in doing, trying to do remote learning. The city is not prepared for these things. And uh, there's, there is more that we can do, and we're going to hope for the best here. But um, mm -hmm. I'm not betting the ranch that this is going to work for all that long. And uh, okay. maybe so, Dr. Collage wants to weigh in as well. But, okay. But so far, my takeaway is that Dr. Red Leonard thinks that we're probably going to have to close the schools again. <laughs> is that... That's, that that, that's, what, that's what I'm concluding. But uh, here's the, the countervening force is that forces are that children need to get back into the educational mainstream. These children who were behind the eight ball uh, last February are now in a far worse situation. They've got yeah. to get educated. This is their lives and their futures at stake here. But they have to do it safely so they don't become vectors for a resurgence of COVID in the community. It's, you know, this is, this is the reality. If I might ask, my answer yes. is one thing is important you to know. If we keep using the mask and everybody we should put the mask, the flu will be less this year. Yes. We that. Yeah. We have to keep using that. That will help a lot to not to yeah. see what's going on. And Dr. Talaj, do you, do you also think that um, if and when we reopen that we're, that we're gonna, that we're gonna start to see resurgence? There's no I mean, question about that. It happened with the people in college, which are 18 and above. Imagine with kids yeah. changing masks, hoping one to the other. You can't control them. I know. I know. I have, two, I have two little kids in there. Well, you know what? 99.9% of them will not suffer. A few of them will get some kind of crazy yeah. thing and also die. It's the elderly back home. They mm -hmm. want only to work. And it's back if you do it, but you don't do it because then they don't prepare to leave having at home the teacher teaching because the two then have to work to sustain the family to pay the rent. It's difficult. Mm. But this so, is the point. We are in the state of the Nile. We are in something called pandemic to a virus. Things are not the same. For you to try to make it the same it was before, that's when we are wrong. It can be. So you so you think that we'll also probably have to, to close again? I say, I, all I want to say is deja vu. I don't want my grandparents in those buildings to die. We saw so many already died again who survived. If we now decide nothing happens just in March, no, 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 no. they will come back. They will be together, the children. They come back home. Our buildings, we had a problem with our elderly people who survived so far. Remember, 60% of the kids still. Oh, I know. Yeah. You can see the virus. And that's very, and that's high, and that's like that's a high rate. Okay, so I'll turn it off. Bigger in other places, it's bigger. We have yeah. the people die the most. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctors. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I just want to ask a follow up question to the doctors, uh, Dr. Redwinner and Dr. Talaj. One of my concerns with the hybrid model, and this was based on a report that I read. Uh, from a Harvard infectious disease expert that argued that the hybrid model actually increases exposure uh, that students and adults would have, meaning that on, on Monday, you would be with one group of kids in a school building. 
But then on Tuesday, when you're not in the school building, and if your parents could afford a childcare setting, then you're in a different group of kids with different adults. And he argues that that actually is not wise in a pandemic, that you should limit the amount of folks that you're exposed to, as Dr. Redwin mentioned before, that folks have been in a bubble for the last couple of months, and now we're reintroducing kids back into you know, uh, society again. So can anyone speak to uh, the concern of the hybrid model increasing uh, e exposure uh, uh, to our children? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is really the point of what I'm trying to say also is that uh, we had them isolated and now they're not isolated. They're back in the community. Whether it's one day a week or five days a week, they're going to be exposed to each other. They are going to get infected. They may or may not be all that symptomatic. And by the way, there's all this all of new data about the number of children in the U.S. that are getting COVID and being hospitalized and, and uh, not surviving. It's, it's slow and still a small percentage, but it, it happens. And this is where we are in a very difficult uh, situation where the kids are now going to be exposed and they in turn are going to be exposing, as Dr. Kalaj also said, they're going to be exposing either other children in other settings or certainly their families and their family members. And, uh, and especially for people, they're going to go home. You know, used to, we used to say to the children, weeks ago, you cannot visit grandma and grandpa because you might, you might get them sick and they're gonna be at high risk. But now we have to say the same message to the parents. So the 35 and 45 year old parents of these children who may have obesity, who may have diabetes, who may have other risk factors, they are now gonna be exposed to their own children who are carriers. And this is why I'm saying it's inevitable. And I do agree with that uh, analysis that says, you know, we're entering a whole new uh, uncertain territory here uh, where we don't know what's going to happen, but we're clearly uh, going to see children as vectors for a potential uh, resurgence here. And it doesn't really matter what the pattern is uh, of uh, the hybrid pattern. If we're going to put kids in congregate settings, we are going to have problems. If we do them all remote, we'll have other kinds of problems, like a vast percentage of the uh, 1.1 million students in the New York City public school system uh, will not be able to do remote learning. They'll get even farther and farther behind, which is a, it's a disaster for them and their families and our country, frankly. We just cannot have this. I, you know, I, it's hard to know what to do. If it was up to me, I'd be pouring a fortune of money into allowing children to be able to learn remotely. Uh, you know, with, with tutors, with coming from the private sector, with uh, making sure there's no child without internet access, uh, the hardware they need and the mentor that they need. I mean, this is this is about everything, and uh, we're trying to balance the health issues with the need to get back into the learning trajectory. And you know, you guys and uh, Mr. Chair, you're you're in this very important position now. And I better you than me in a way because I I am completely torn about this. I know what we're facing. I understand the danger that we could be experiencing in, in not too many weeks from now. Uh, but I'm sick about the fact that kids are falling behind the eight ball and their parents need to work. It's not just the, it's not just the essential workers. Every parent that's, you know, struggling to get by needs their job. What, what are they telling their employer? I can work Monday this week and Thursday and Friday next week. I mean, what, what kind of reality is that for them? Anyway, you guys are doing a phenomenal job and I really appreciate your sticking to this, but, um, uh, it's very, very challenging. I've never seen anything like this, and I've been practicing in pediatrics and working with underserved populations since 1971. We've never had anything like this in the U.S. and globally. Let me let me add to that this three factors that you should understand. A lot of those parents lost their job for a few hours. Then they had diseases; they had no way to buy the medications, and they will be more propensed to get in, in trouble. And they have no way to pay rent. Now, if you hear what I say about 42%, 42%, we don't know how long it lasts, but those kids already had the disease. They saw the virus, they create immunity, not 100% secure. You will have a lot of people talking what it means, what it mean. but we know that. Previous, previous diseases, we know the same thing. You check for immunity, checking for the IgG, the same serum that you want to have people put in their hospital. If you check on that, those kids, 
As I said before in March, when we have so many people, 70% positive, and we're asking for rooms for hotels, uh, schools, beds, whatever it was, gym beds, to isolate them from the building, it ha never happened. Now we had a chance to understand that you put this kid together, they will be infected themselves because they already had the disease. They're less likely to have the problem. If you have to reduce capacity, and they take care of the 60% at home. That could be a star. That's my personal opinion. We don't share the whole opinion because it's cellular immunity or it's IgG immunity only. You know, it's both way. But right now, you get more reliable in having the 42% going back to school, being in the room together. They still could touch a place, we had the virus, and pass it to somebody else. But they don't have the disease. They already pass it. They won't bring it that home unless the situation happened. But it's less likely. It's less likely. The other 60%, let's take a look who they are, how they live, what do they need. So resources have to be addressed in that direction. That's my point of view. For I know my whole group point of view. But those people are less likely to have it. Again. Uh, I, I appreciate those very thought, uh, very informed uh, uh, opinions and thoughts. And uh, I, one final thing here is there was recent reports back early this summer, and I'm not sure if it still stands because the, the science on this continues to evolve, that children under the age of 10 apparently transmit less virus than kids over the age of 10, that they still can transmit the virus, but it's not uh, the same virus load as kids over the age of 10. And that type of research inform some decisions by European countries to prioritize uh, in-person services for younger grades as opposed to older grades, uh, uh, you know, later grades. Could anyone speak to the latest science on that, that, that they're aware of and about the concept of prioritizing in-person uh, for er early grades because of, of the science on that? I'd appreciate it, thank you. So and let me just make a quick comment about that. That is that is true. So older kids, you know, teenagers and so on, actually can get infected and transmit as the same as adults, basically. Under the age of uh, 10 to 12 and in the younger grades, uh, children could still have a very, very high viral load in their nose. Uh, they could be carriers, they could be spreaders, probably not to the same extent as older children. But all of this, Chair, is relevant. It's all relative. You know, it's like, Yes, they may be less likely, but when you're talking about, I don't know how many of the 1.1 million are in the earlier grades, um, whatever it is, though, there's going to be a lot of children who are going to be carrying it and could become spreaders. So, not, so theoretically, yes, they're less likely than older children, but it's not zero. So we're still dealing with some level of risk, which is very difficult to assess. And a lot of those studies, by the way, about the prevalence of the virus and, and spreading, uh, those studies need to be replicated in other places. Uh, these were done in Europe, but um, there's uh, a lot more to be said and thought about. I'm sorry, in South Korea, but there's a lot more to be said uh, and done about this. But it doesn't give it doesn't get us off the hook with the younger children. Uh, well, who, I, mean, yeah. I don't know how many casuistic they have where they say that we have more than 25,000 in those ages, uh, young ages, tests done, and probably 70 to 80,000 different ages, and we have something different. You know why so many pediatricians die at the beginning? The kids were dispatched first <laughs> on the hospital early because a lot of COVID. They're coming back where they had to go to get the vaccine to the pediatricians, remain open, start dying, start getting very sick. A lot of them very sick, some of them die. Our pediatricians in our group, we had to close down. In May, we reopened because we knew people were getting behind. We didn't want an epidemic within the pandemic. Moms, measles start showing up because we don't vaccine the kids. I mean, it's difficult to understand where they get us number from because what we've seen, and I know for proper experience, uh, my grandkids who transmit to my daughter and she got, she got very sick. You know, it, it's the important is you're gonna have it. They're gonna have it unless we wait for transmit. They sneeze, they cough. Certainly, the other one moves more around, more outside, touch other people. You control the small kids better in the house, in quarantine, 
The other one tend to do more free to go somewhere else and pass the virus to everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very, very much for that important point. And uh, the last thing I'll say, Dr. Redwinner and Dr. Talaj, I want to also give voice to a number of educators who um, yeah, they fight like hell for their kids, for their students, but they're also human beings. They have families at home. Some of them are primary caretakers for, for their families. There are a number of folks from the education system that are in a position where they themselves, for example, might not be in a high risk group, uh, but they are the primary caretaker for mom or dad or for a relative who is in a high risk group. And they are petrified of, of doing anything uh, that would jeopardize the health of their loved one. And they're being denied medical accommodations by the administration. Can you speak to the, 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 the level of risk to folks who work in a school who, you know, even, you know, if they're in a high risk group, obviously they should be immediately granted medical accommodations because no one should be put in that type, type of, uh, you know, compromised situation. But what if they're a caretaker for mom or dad or for a relative uh, who is in a high risk group? Can you speak to the need to also consider those accommodations which they need? Uh, I, I'd appreciate the doctor's input on that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair you should know this, Mr. Chair. This is very important. It's gonna have the same risk that everybody in the population has. This is a virus. We have to protect them. We already been talking to Mr. Morgo. We offer to test all of them. We, as, as a matter of fact, we are opening some school charters already call us. We are opening school charter place. The Catholic chair call us. They want us to open. We start opening places everywhere. We begin in conversation to do the schools, public schools. There is a need to be testing, 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 testing. But also, I keep saying we have to do both tests. With the blood test, we know which kids already have passed the disease, suffer it without symptoms or with symptoms. Those are the easy ones to teach. And we monitor, monitor, monitor them every month in blood to be sure that the immunity is still there. Not to let them fall to the crap without. When the vaccine shows up, we know who need to get vaccine right away. We will know more if we need a booster, how frequent the booster should be. But the teachers, the employees are in the same risk than anybody. I'm 64, my grandkids. I can't, I haven't seen them. That's the, this, if you ask me what's the thing that I most miss is that embrace my grandkids. But I know, even when I'm in the street dealing with the food, dealing with testing since March, we know the risk we're taking. There's no question about the teachers. We have the same kind of risk, their parents, their family. So, That's yeah, it. let me be clear about this, Chair. So, um, absolutely without exemption, every teacher that is personally at risk or is taking care of some people that are at risk should be given appropriate and immediate accommodation so they don't have to make, they don't have to make a choice like that. There's just no question about it. This, we, this is what we have to do. And I, I just want to reiterate something that I, I really think in, in four to six weeks, we will have available these point of care tests that do not need to go to the lab. It's a little bit of saliva or a little uh, anterior nasal uh, swab. And on a piece of paper, like a pregnancy test or a blood sugar test, uh, that we'll be able to get the results in, uh, you know, 15 or 30 minutes. And that's going to be a game changer. And when that happens, you know, we need to kind of respond to that with appropriate new policies. In the meantime, if a teacher declares, I am at risk, I am very worried, or I'm caring for somebody who's at risk, immediately there has to be a protocol in place to allow them to be accommodated. So they continue to get paid, they can work remotely, whatever they need to do, but we cannot have policies that put anyone in danger. I'm talking about obviously the children, the teachers, the staff, the bus drivers, the entire system uh, is made up of individuals working hard and they have to be protected. That's the least that we could do for them. My Mr. Chair, one more thing, Mr. Chair, before I finish. You know, Mr. Chair, I came to this country looking for the American dream. We are the land of the free. But this is the land of the people. You represent the people. Like the House of Representatives represent for the state. You represent in the city, the people. The grassroots is where the people should come from to make solution. Yes, the whole world is looking at us. We have to come with solution 
that protect our people. We are known, we are known at regular times. We have never lived through this time. Nobody in this panel has lived through time of pandemic. This is the first experience that we have. We had no idea when it started. You know, it's crazy for me to say this. We were more prepared to defend this country with arsenal of nuclear weapons, to defend the life of the American citizen with PPEs to save our lives. Thank you both. Thank you both for your very powerful and informative testimony. And also just for, for clarity purposes, the, the, the unions are still battling the administration on this issue of accommodations for staff. This is still an unresolved matter. Um, that's why I wanted the administration to be here today, but we're gonna press them still on, on this issue because as mentioned, uh, Dr. Redwinner and Dr. Talaj, no one should be put in this type of, type of high risk situation um, that puts their families at risk. So I, I appreciate your testimony and your, your powerful leadership and speaking truth to power as well. Thank you very much. The chair, before you go, I have to say one more thing. Those nurses should be independent. Be careful. That's when I heard that the resignation of the, of the Secretary of State, I'm not looking that this nurse should be belong to a public hospital only and they take it away what we've been doing in the community. It should be nurses independent. We are offering the computers for them to connect to any doctors in the community that the family choose to be the primary care. And we will work to be sure that we help in any direction. And we've been doing this for free so far during the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes this panel. We will, um, we have two Thank things. You. We're going to move up, Sophie Zhu and William Deep. Following them will be a panel of parents, Liz Rosenberg, Kamala Carmen, Taj Sutton, and Megan Schianimio Adala. So we will first hear from Sophie. Start in time. Thank you all for having me here today. My name is Sophie Zhu and I'm a rising high school senior. I would like to deeply thank the Chair of Council Member Traeger as well as the members of the Committee on Education for holding this hearing. A hearing that should not have to exist but is necessary because of shameful circumstances. Reopening would directly impact all of us, educators, school administrators, adult allies, citywide youth activists, and parents. As a student and person of color and Asian Pacific American, my and others like me's lived experiences are valid to and inseparable from this topic. Yet many people in power have tossed our perspectives to the sidelines and irresponsibly made no attempt to truly heed or include our community-centered organizations and unions conditions for reopening. As a viral symptom of capitalism, they have chosen to prioritize their positions, reputation, and capital of any form over the lives of our young people and teachers, and likely by extension, their households. In this undemocratic status quo that pushes folks to choose between their fundamental rights of education and health, I am a comparatively privileged outlier that can choose both. I can only imagine how little access the most marginalized people across lines of ability, immigration status, and more may have to shifting policy. For every single excuse to reopen, such as the need to combat food insecurity throughout schools, there are healing-based alternatives that do not risk exposure to the virus. I will name a few. One, reach out to underheard communities in their desired languages to identify educational barriers they've been facing since COVID started. Two, remove blended learning as an option. Instead, make remote learning more equitable. Three, expand resources such as regional enrichment centers. And last but not least, reopen schools only when they have fully met all safety and health guidelines, regardless of when that time comes. We students will stand in solidarity with teachers and stay outspoken. We are unafraid to strike. We cannot afford to wait on this delay and we cannot afford to cost our lives for politics. Thank you. Next, we will hear from William. Thank you Start so much. Thank you so much. Dear City Council, my name is William Deep, and, and I'm a rising high school senior at the Brooklyn Latin School. I'm also the founder of Virus Racism and a member of Team State Charge. So as a student of color in our nation's largest school system, I am frustrated that Mayor de Blasio has chosen to delay the in-person reopening of our schools only until September 21st. My school does not have the answers or resources to quickly respond to the questions that we have. How will extracurriculars work? What will the grading policy look like? My school shares a building with two other schools. What about that? 
will there still be student metro cards? How will we guarantee a nurse in every single school in our public school system? These questions dictate my education. And if we don't have the answers to these questions, then why are we reopening schools? I'm not risking my own life to go to school and neither should anyone else in our school system. My school is not ready to reopen. We do not have the proper ventilation system. Our school population is increasing every year and we're not prepared for this upcoming school year. And I think that every other school is not ready to do so either. This is coming from a student who did in fact struggle with online learning and was able to be privileged to have the choice between remote learning and the hybrid learning system. But I know that it is smarter and safer to stick with the fully remote learning system for until this virus is gone and has been minimalized. If we're, re if we're not reopening indoor dining at restaurants, then why are we returning back to in-person schools with a blended learning system? Once schools reopen, the DOE will experience its second wave, like how other school systems have. Look at the examples that we have seen in different parts of the country. Mayor de Blasio, if you're hearing this, listen to the voices of the students and teachers. You only had one student in your reopening task force, and you barely, and you had members from upstate New York, from other parts of the state, controlling the New York City expired. school system. And if you're not going to listen to this testimony, and if you're not going to listen to this hearing, then shame on you for not hearing the voices of those who are oppressed and those who are discriminated against, who you obviously don't care about from your previous actions. City Council, I urge every member here to stand for the voices of all students, families, and teachers and advocate for the delay of the in-person return to schools until January, January or until we are safe to go back. I'll end my testimony with this question. Mayor de Blasio, why is it your choice to take away our right to live? Thank you. There are no council member questions, uh, Chair. Thank you to the students who continue to speak so powerfully, truth to power. And um, I, I, I really appreciate their courage and the civic activism. There is no uh, textbook that can match the power of what students are, are speaking here today. So truly appreciate them. Thank you. Actually, when I said that, two people raised their hand. Council member Levin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to thank this panel as well. And um, I just uh, want to pose one question that's something that I've been wrestling with um, when thinking about this topic now for the last several months um, of how, because I, I agree with you and in, in uh, listening to the panel before you, uh, um, the two doctors expressing concerns that they think that there could be um, you know, another outbreak in New York City related to schools reopening. Um, and that's, you know, in their, um, you know, with all the experience that they have is uh, leading them to that conclusion. Um, on the other hand, or the other side of this conversation is for families who have to, who have to go to work. So parents that have to, um, that can't work remotely, whether they're uh, central workers or they're working in some place where they have to actually be there. Um, how do you, how are you as students looking at, um, or thinking about that question of what do we do for, if we were to do all remote learning, what would we do for, for families where a parent has to go to work and the child is too young to stay at home alone? I can start this. So I first want to say that our current remote learning system, although it's ideal over a blended learning system, it still needs to be reformed because the students who have been oppressed and discriminated for so long continue to be oppressed and discriminated against because of this virus. So because of that, we need to provide resources and services virtually and in a safe and socially distant way for students and families who are undergoing these, this discrimination and this oppression and that who do find remote learning who do find remote learning and the remote learning system difficult to captivate. And for those parents that do have to learn, we need to be able to provide services. We need to be able to provide resources, both virtually 
and in a in a system where everyone can stay safe because every student deserves to live, but every student deserves an education. Yes, and adding on to William, I think it's very important for parents to be able to go to regional enrichment centers, meaning we must expand RECs throughout the city, especially since feasibly, I think a lot of the times, young people who do go by remote learning, they might lack, like I mentioned in my testimony, say they might lack food security. And so that's one of the instances in which a working parent, regardless of whether they're an essential worker or not, they would likely struggle to provide for their child. So I think it's very important that we do establish those equitable centers throughout the city, just to make sure that, like you said, those parents that do, aren't able to economically stay full time at home even, for example, or even have caretakers for their kids, they will have an extra option for daycare centers throughout the city to provide for them. And I think that's that would be my main sample solution. And I still think, like William said, remote learning is has a whole host of problems on its own that I myself grapple with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think- I'm expired be reformed oh, you, you can go ahead and finish that i just i'm done with i um i can't ask any more questions but you could finish what you were saying one second sophie we'll get you unmuted so thank you and i was almost done anyways but i do think it's very important for parents to receive the opportunities to have citywide welfare centers essentially not not any places that promote segregation rather places that will give them the resources they need because again when we make these we, when we propose these solutions we believe it's in the hands of the city to provide for us at the end of the day it's on onto the, it's incumbent on them to provide for us it's not incumbent on those families that are struggling and also this is why we must get rid of blended learning we must go fully remote and provide for those kids in an equitable way nothing is lost by going fully remote. If you're worried about parents, then there must be ways for the city to provide because the city has so a very high budget and they definitely can do that if they redistribute it. Council member Menchaca has questions. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, William and Sophie. I, um, I'm, I'm again moved by the young voices on, in this topic in this very important moment uh, as we think about education. And, and I just couldn't help but feel such clear uh, voice about what needs to happen and pointing to the concept that the city has resources. Yeah, the budget is contracting, but we still have resources that we can allocate for the most vulnerable. And I think you've really presented some very, very clear policy recommendations that uh, I think we're all we're all trying to hold, but but it just kind of distills it, and I, I just want to say thank you for distilling it, and and maybe my my because my question was going to be about the regional centers and how how you really thought the Richmond centers and how you thought about them, maybe my 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 question to both of you are um, really about how you're organizing as young people with other students. I know in Sunset Park there is a there is a mix of students that want to go back to school. And we're trying to figure out what what's driving that question. Is that something that is 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 playing out within your your kind of organizing right now, or are all the students that you're organizing with pretty clear about the recommendations you just gave us? Is that representative of of what what's happening, uh, or is there really a, a a debate? So if I could go first, then I would say that I would definitely not want to speak on behalf of all the fellow organizers and powerful youth citywide activists I've been working with, including William. So I do think that even though I have taken the time to educate myself and inform myself on why it's important to stay remote, I know a ton of people, including my parents, I've had to speak with them and in and inform, inform them and, and tell them why they've been fed misinformation about why they should stay blended. So I know in the past people weren't unable to understand that going blended and staying in this blended environment is very unsanitary. And that's the main point because you're just going to do everything you would remotely, but you're going to put your health at risk and you're going to make yourself susceptible to this highly infectious virus. So that's why I know a lot of other youth activists generally 
I do think there's a greater consensus that they do support remote learning, but I would not want to speak for all of them. And I know that the ones that do support blended learning likely haven't taken or gotten the opportunities to learn more about the harms of blended learning and why blended learning really is not the way to go, especially since it jeopardizes everyone and it just does not work out. And like William said earlier, we both have had negative experiences with remote learning, but it's, there's no reason to choose our to choose our education over our lives in that sense. We should not have to be able to go to school and get that privilege while putting our lives at stake. And in the last eight seconds, I wanna ask, um, give us two or three ideas of what equitable le remote learning looks like for you. Time expired. I think one example of equitable learning is that we make sure that we look at different students' capacity. So I know the city has stated that we are mandating attending Zoom classes, but are, why are we mandating Zoom classes when students are at homes, they are dealing with our financial situations, our socioeconomic situations with our households. So why are we mandating something when we are at home, we have to deal with our family circumstances, we have to deal with obstacles. So we need to make sure that we have an equitable system where we look at each student individually. We make sure that every student has, can do the best that they can can academically, but we also look at every student's mental health, we look at every student's capacity and see what the situations that they come from. And at the end of the day, young people are so powerful. Young people, we are the ones who are in the school system and because of that, we are the ones who are making the school system, we are the ones learning it. And so the, the mayor and the chancellor and everyone who works in the DOE, we experience a direct effect. So we should be the ones who are in lead of our education. And because of that, we should be able to have, a, we should be able to have leadership and we should be able to have that capacity for flexibility. Thank you, both of you. Um, and I hope to follow up with you. Um, I'll find, I'll find a way to, to get a hold of you, but if you follow me on social media, send me a message. I'd love to keep organizing with you. Thank you both. And we're now done with this panel. There are no further council member questions. We will move on to the next panel. The next panel will be Megan Skianimo Adala, Liz Rosenberg, Kamala Carmen, Liat Olenek, and Taj Hutton. We will start with Megan. Time starts now. Hi. My name is Megan Chenameo, and I am a teacher at PS one in Sunset Park, Brooklyn in District 15. And um, thank you for the platform to speak today at the People's Hearing. I am also a proud member of Press NYC and the Moore Caucus and a parent of a UPK student. This is my 15th year at PS1 and it is the only school that I've ever taught in. I desperately miss my students, their families and my colleagues. And I know that remote learning can never take the place of in-person education and connection, but the mayor and the DOE's plan as well as the new deal struck by the mayor and Michael Mulgrew is not safe and it is not equitable. There are simply too many deal breakers. I want to thank Councilmember Menchaca for pushing them on this and for advocating for our Sunset Park community. This deal still allows teachers and staff members to walk into unsafe school buildings en masse on Tuesday. What magical work was done in this deal to make this neglected and underfunded school system safe and equitable? Did I miss the press release about improved ventilation for all school buildings? Buildings that have been defunded year after year, including this one with the city budget passed in July, or is the six inches the windows in my school building open up to let in the air from the congested BQE enough? Did I miss the announcement that the mayor and the DOE and the union had struck a deal with private internet and cell phone companies to provide increased yeah. bandwidth and spots for families? Honey, um, I know. What, how can I help you? I must have been sleeping when an improved plan for testing and tracing, not the random and hazard current plan was announced. I must have missed when the mayor and the chancellor and Michael Mulgrew decided to prioritize our students who are most in need and when a real concrete plan for students with IEPs and English language learners were put forth. Before I close, I wanna read from a letter that I helped draft uh, with the PS1 equity team, a letter that was translated into three languages, something the DOE and the mayor have not done with their surveys and their outreach. Um, when New York City and the DOE and union leaders disregard the diverse needs of communities like Sunset Park and others around the city, students, families, and staff will continue to bear the brunt of the inconceivable consequences first, which will then cause a chain reaction that negatively affects the entire city. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Liz Rosenberg. Time starts now. 
Thank you for creating this space for parents to share our thoughts about reopening. I hope you will schedule an oversight hearing for next week so the DOE will respond to everything that is said here today. The narrative, narrative is that parents can make a choice, remote or blended, blended or remote, six days, six days a month or of six hours with masks on all day in rooms whose air safety has not been certified by a ventilation expert. If there's a case, then all bets are off, especially if that case is your kid. Remember, remote or blended, blended or remote, what's best for your family? That would be the question if we didn't have nine day testing lags or a failed tracing program, what's best for your family? Would make sense if there weren't so many school employees telling us that they are going in against their will. People we love and admire who don't get to get their high risk, don't get to protect their high risk loved ones, um, and, uh, which is not a criteria to work from home. Okay, honestly, what's best for your family has never been the right question, and that's one reason we have so much inequity in the system. This is about safety. This is about listening to the wisdom of school communities. This is about doing absolutely everything we can to refuse to accept a mayor's plan that resembles no model tried in any other country. With the U of T's deal, it would seem like there's no stopping this train, but you all were elected to protect the people of this city, and this is the moment we need you to do it. Go visit schools, ask them if they've surveyed staff. Many have. In my two kids' schools, the staff that participated in the survey shared that they do not feel safe returning to buildings. 90% in my son's elementary school and 87% of participants at my daughter's giant high school. No pledge or press conference can erase these truths that exist in all of our schools, blended or remote. It's really unsafe or safe. Most let more lives lost or fewer. Magical thinking or the facts. It's not open schools or, or have no childcare. It do, it's don't rely on schools to do childcare, expand RECs and support students in the most local, most responsive, equitable and safe ways possible. Next, we will hear from Kamala. Time starts now. Okay, we will come right back to her. Next, we will hear from Liat Olnick. Time starts now. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Liat Olenek. I am a elementary school teacher, um, chapter leader, and more member, um, and in support of the resolution to delay in-person school reopening. Um, I will also be teaching remote at home. I have a medical accommodation, um, but I'm here and I'm continuing to advocate because I'm concerned for my entire school community. Um, although the mayor has made it seem that teachers who are opposing his inoperable reopening plan are doing so out of selfishness and, um, and a lack of interest in working, that is absolutely not true. We're concerned for people's lives. And I'm especially concerned about what the mayor and the chancellor refuse to talk about or address in their plans, which is what happens when a school community member dies. Um, I also wanted to note that although the, there is a delay to students starting school, staff are supposed to be in the buildings this Tuesday, even buildings that we know are not safe um, and have remaining ventilation issues. And many of these staff members will also be required to go into school buildings even if they are teaching remotely, which makes no sense. Um, I wanted to respond to, I know uh, Council Member Traeger talked about trust. Trust is incredibly important. He is right that trust has been broken. Trust has also been broken with our union leadership, um, with Michael Mulgrew, who was on this call earlier. Uh, it is who cut a backroom deal earlier this week with the mayor without any input from rank and file members. Um, and then has not once surveyed U of T members on their position on going back to school or their concerns about returning to our school buildings. And finally, I wanted to respond to what the uh, pediatrician mentioned earlier in this hearing about schools definitely closing again. I'm extremely concerned about this instability and the effects on children. Time so expired. Can I finish my sentence? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, we all know children need predictability. They need routine. They need stability. 
I'm on my school safety team, this plan is going to fall apart. And I'm particularly concerned about neighborhoods with high infection rates and how quickly those schools will shut back down again. We need an approach that provides something stable for kids and families for at least a few months. That means starting fully remote, investing in quality remote learning. It means expanding rec centers and using limited outdoor learning where possible to support students with the highest needs. But we need something that will last more than a week or two because this will just re-traumatize our children and staff. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Kamala. Time starts now. We want our kids in school in person, but we're smart enough to realize that the virus doesn't really care what we want. We can't just wish students in their seats without taking the infection control steps that science and common sense dictate. I will focus on just one of those, COVID testing. In addition to my rising 11th grader who I won't let step foot into her crumbling, HVECless, 100 plus year old building, I have an older child who is returning to college. Why the difference? Because we believe her college is acting in good faith to address just the sort of demands being brought up here today, including a serious test and trace regimen. All students and staff returning to my child's campus must have onboarding tests. Additionally, all students and staffs are scheduled via app for mandatory testing one to three times a week. The school maintains a dashboard updated daily where you can see how many tests have been administered, the number of positives, the number of people in isolation or quarantine, et cetera. When I looked at the dashboard last Thursday when students were starting to trickle back for Monday's first day of classes, there were zero positives and no one in isolation. When I look at it as I prepare this testimony, that number has climbed to seven out of nearly 7,000 tests. And those seven individuals who would have otherwise been circulating among the campus population, potentially vectors of infection, were drawn off immediately into isolation. So take a moment and extrapolate. Of course, it is more expensive and involved in every way to do this for a million plus students and staff. But the virus doesn't really care how much it costs nor how difficult it is to organize. It's simply what must be done to keep infection at bay. And in our ex exponentially greater pool of students and staff, we would have far more than seven positives that wouldn't be caught. And those positive individuals are more likely to live in multi-generational households with the frail, et cetera. It's a ticking time bomb. We can't responsibly return in full force to buildings until we address this. First step, raise the money for comprehensive COVID testing by taxing the rich. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Taj Sutton. Time starts now. Hi, um, and thank you. I think the first thing I need to do, we're, we're patting, there's a lot of patting each other on the back happening on this call. So I wanna acknowledge the Moore Caucus of the United Federation of Teachers, who was calling for a delay months and months and months before the UFT finally came out with a much less comprehensive plan. I wanna acknowledge the principals on the ground in various districts throughout New York City who gave the CSA the power with their voices to come out in against an unsafe reopening. And I wanna acknowledge the parents, students and teachers on the ground who have been saying what our leaders have just finally found the courage to say all summer. We have been fighting to remove police from our schools and to fund them even before the pandemic. And someone on the call said, you know, all this hand wringing about these inequities, but they existed before. Yes, they did. And we were fighting for them before the pandemic, which is why it's really frustrating for us to be operating within this silver lining framework where we acknowledge and focus on the good and ignore the problems. It's also inappropriate that our leaders would gaslight parents, teachers, school staff, and community members asking valid questions that they don't have answers for. All of the red flags and the deal breakers brought forth by the public advocate, by council member Mark Traeger, by Press NYC, which is a group of parents from over 20 New York City school districts who are saying we don't have what we need and we can't open with in circumstances where only some schools are going to function well. In my district, there are schools raising money for PPE and there are also schools who cannot do that. So to address the inequity, not have a plan for it and try to open the schools anyway is outrageous. We need a delayed, further delayed reopening. We need phased reopening and we need to ensure that our most vulnerable students are prioritized for in-person learning first. Fully opening schools at the same time will result in more sickness and death. And that is not something no one in our city deserves. Thank you. Time expired. Thank you to this panel. We will now move on to the next. For the next panel, we will have Lisa Pines, Cherie Gibson, Judith Canepa, 
and Melissa Alvarez. We will start with Lisa. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Lisa Pines. I teach art in District 75, and our district serves 25,000 children with significant disabilities, over 80% of which are kids of color. The mayor and the chancellor say we must return to school because of kids with disabilities, right? They need in-person learning, and then they do nothing, nothing to to plan for my significantly disabled students. All of our kids in D75 are mandated to take the bus. There are no busing contracts. Many kids, because of their disabilities, will not be able to wear a mask. There is no safety plan for any of these classrooms to protect either the adults or the kids. Uh, our kids require physical proximity. They require paraprofessionals, teachers, speech therapists, to do hand over hand help using a pencil when I teach art, helping them to use a paintbrush and learn how to do it independently. There is no plan to keep anybody safe in this environment. There is nothing. My union has been fighting a really good fight and I wanna thank Michael Mulgrew for all he's done. We have been trying for months to get these safety issues answered and we have gotten nothing, nothing but a shrug from our district and District 75. No answers at all. And they pretend to care about students with disabilities. I wanna ask every city council member on this call, ask that question. If you wanna help kids with disabilities get back to school, let's do something to actually help my students, please. Uh, I also just wanna say, you know, we're, a lot of us are teachers and this mayor is like a student who has not done his homework they, and then tries to fake it in class. The mayor is not fooling. A Time expired. Thank you. And next we will hear from Cherie Gibson. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I am Cherie Gibson, a parent of a rising fifth grader and a parent leader in Community School District 29. From my entry to the New York City public school system as a parent, I've heard from all levels in this system to trust them. Trust school admin, trust superintendent's office, trust teachers, trust the DOE Central, trust the chancellor, trust city council, trust the mayor. I ask, when have you ever trusted me? When have you trusted me? As a parent, I have no trust of any of you to keep my child safe and secure in school buildings because I'm tired of my emotions being used like a ping pong ball between the mayor, DOE, UFT, CSA, D7, D37, as well as many others. I have no trust in if remote learning will be beneficial to my child or not. Why? Because I have no idea what remote learning will look like and no priority has been given to informing us. If you trust parents, talk with us really talk with us, listen to us, hear our concerns, hear our anxiety, hear our fears, then work with us to address or solve those issues. Trust us to understand when you don't have an answer. As a parent, I support a further delay in remote reopening of schools. As of today, there are still too many unknowns for families in what this new school year is to look like. My child is asking me questions that I cannot answer. We are supposed to be preparing our children for school and we don't know what to prepare them for. This is further example of the inequity going across the system. As a parent leader, the anxiety and concern about schools reopening is high because parents have not been included consistently in the planning. Information and inclusion are two different things. And even in information, it has not been comprehensive, consistent, frequent across the entire system. How is this equitable? I'm Please expired. Take... Please go ahead and finish your thought. Please take a moment to truly consider that parents need the time to get their kids prepared just as much as teachers and school administrations need to get themselves prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next two people we have called are not there. So we're next going to call Tracy LaGrasa, followed Time. by Mariella Graham. Tracy? Time starts now. 
Hi, sorry. Um, thank you. I'm Tracy LaGrasse as a high school teacher, member of the Moore Caucus, PhD in biochemistry and New Yorker. The current UFT DOE plan is not safe or sane. In early March, one of my confident high school seniors walked into class pallid and shook. He told me that he did not feel well. I think I have the coronavirus and I'm scared I'm going to spread it. He went to the medical room, but he was sent back to class. No fever. I'll never forget the fear on his face and my helplessness. Later, he told me his parents had the virus. He was never tested. Those weeks were anxiety pure. Students were panicked. Parents kept their children's home class discussions centered around the virus and school closing. All this as members of our community were getting sick. Each one far too many are students, children telling me they felt so sick they couldn't move for days too weak to turn a doorknob while paralyzed with fear of making their families sick. This is not over. As a teacher, I know schools need to eventually reopen, but we cannot risk returning to this anxiety and suffering. As a scientist, I also can't help but see this reopening as a capricious experiment being done on all of us, one that remains needlessly, poorly, and dangerously designed. How could this experiment be redesigned so that my deeply traumatized students and fellow school staff can return without stupefying anxiety and without setting off a second wave of COVID in New York City? At a minimum, three things. COVID testing that can realistically, timely detect and stop an outbreak, so at least twice weekly for everyone in the school, not this useless current plan of once a month starting in October on 10 to 20% of the school. What epidemiologist or infectious disease expert signed off on this current plan, given the availability of pooled PCR testing and the imminent promise of inexpensive rapid antigen testing? Two, ensure all classrooms have sufficient PPE and ventilation. Specifically, classrooms must have air replaced with clean air four to six times an hour, which can be done using window fans, HEPA air purifiers, and ACs with the correct filters. And three, a phase reopening like you, Chair Traeger, have proposed. A good experiment, indeed a clinical trial like this is, starts with a smaller sample, sometimes even based on the most urgent Time needs. expired. Can I finish my statement? Yes, go ahead. Please finish your statement. Let's first prioritize safe reopening for students and families who need it most. In the meantime, please, please help us get the resources so that all our students can participate fully in remote learning in the spirit of public education free for everyone. The science is on our side. This is what our school communities need. We have been fighting for this of months. Why aren't these requirements part of the current plan? How can we get them in there? Where is the will? Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Mariella Graham, and the panel after that will be Ellen McHugh, Gloria Corsino, Azalea Vulp, and Paulette Healy. So, Mariella? Time starts now. My name is Mariella Graham. I am the parent of three New York City public school children in grades five, six, and eight. I'm also a member of the Community Board 12 in Manhattan, representing Washington Heights and Inwood. And I am also the principal of the High School of Arts and Technology, a school located in the Martin Luther King campus in Manhattan. This will be my 14th year as a New York City principal and it is a job that I absolutely love. And there is nothing that I would want more than to be back in school with my staff and students. However, the Martin Luther King campus has no classrooms with windows. The windows that do exist are in the hallway and none of them open. We are fully dependent on mechanical ventilation. There have been no fewer than four walkthroughs by various agencies and groups in the last three weeks. We have yet to see any reports associated with those walkthroughs. The one report that we have received is from the UFT that says that there are significant concerns with the operation of the ventilation system serving the building. We have not received a report regarding the findings of the ventilation action team that visited the campus on August 25th with the infamous tissue paper, yardstick, and binder clips used to measure airflow. On Monday, August 31st, the principals of the Martin Luther King campus received a list of 18 classrooms that were deemed to have minimal or no airflow. We were told to relocate those classes to other rooms. We do not know the basis of how these 18 classrooms were identified. We are asking for two simple things. One, transparency regarding the process about how a classroom is deemed safe and two, a quantifiable measure that confirms a classroom is indeed safe. Until we have these two things, we cannot look at students and parents and staff in the eye and tell them that it is safe to return to our campus. Thank you. Principal, I wanna thank you and also to our, all of our educators who have spoken. Um, and I, I just, I mentioned before, 
principals have been working nonstop, no days off, uh, trying to plan for the impossible. The mantra has been guidance forthcoming. I think many of your colleagues would agree. Um, but I want to share, and, and if you can elaborate further, one of the most infuriating parts of the tissue paper, infamous tissue paper test, was that what I what I was told, and I, I'd love for you to you know, elaborate further, is that no one even had the decency of picking up a phone, calling a school, uh, you know, stakeholder, a school leader. And say, you know, you might see something unusual today. You might see someone coming into your building waving a yardstick with a piece of toilet paper attached to it. <laughs> now, they're 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 gonna they're gonna they're gonna argue CDC guidance. I read the guidance. The guidance does not mention toilet paper. It actually talks about the preferred use of a of a of a handheld device to give you a numerical uh, value on a daily basis. But can you just speak to the communication or lack thereof between those who are responsible to support you um, and uh, speak to the public about what information, if any, did you get in advance of that infamous visit to the school community? There was no advance notice at all. Um, a colleague and I were actually in the building because Martin Luther King is also a planning building. So we were trying to figure out how do you have students pass through metal detectors in a socially distanced way? And when we got to the building, that is where we found out that there were um, members of SCA. We were told that our ventilation action team were actually um, people from SCA who were there to check ventilation. And I spoke with them and they had a chart of all of the rooms in the building. And it is a yes or no checklist and they were going into each room. I went with them to at least four or five classrooms and they pulled up the stick looking for some sort of movement of the tissue paper. And then it is marked a yes, regardless of how big the room is, how many of the vents moved the tissue paper. Um, they told me it was a yes or no checklist and that the mandate was just to check for airflow not how much air was there, um, and that that was, that was the job that they were tasked to do. And, Prince, and Principal, uh, how, how many years have you been working in the system? Um, as a principal, this will be my 14th year. This will be my fourth year in this school, and I was a principal in Brooklyn for 10. I was a teacher for eight years, and I'm just asking, because maybe I missed this, have you ever seen anyone wave a yardstick with a piece of toilet paper in a classroom before to check for ventilation? In the Martin Luther King campus, it is actually not rare for staff members to hang their own tissue paper um, on certain vents, actually, to know that there is airflow so that we can call the custodian when we can feel that there isn't enough airflow so if you were to visit, some rooms always have tissue paper hanging from vents. Um, that is the kind of building that we are in on a regular basis. And I think that given the pandemic, it is not surprising that really everyone is, is alarmed. I, I, I am so sorry for your entire school community to be subjected to this. That is unacceptable. In the 21st century, the largest school system in the country, it is not acceptable to have daily tissue tests to determine flow, air, air flow. And I have never seen this before. Um, it's not normal to me, it's not acceptable to me. And it just proves a point that they're looking to cut corners uh, to try to advance this impossible agenda. and. Um, I, I like to follow up on the Martin Luther King campus uh, because there's clearly more work to do here. And quite frankly, I also had heard reports that the folks from, from the borough field staff uh, who have been conducting some of these walkthroughs with their surveys were quite frankly 
you know, concern themselves that they're not qualified to make the call on a safe reopening of a building or not. And we're discouraged from putting concerns down in writing and rather pick up a, you know, at a call director of operations. And there, there's, there's too many concerns here, unanswered questions. And I, I really appreciate your courage. Uh, it's, this is not easy, Principal. I know what you're doing. This is not easy. And I appreciate you speaking up for, for your children, for your entire school community. And I like to follow up here uh, with the Martin Luther King campus because this is not acceptable. And I, no school should have to go through daily tissue paper tests. That is unacceptable. And I, I will be following up on this case. Thank you, Principal. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal has a question. We can unmute Councilmember Rosenthal. Starting time. Great, thank you very much. You know, I, Chair Traeger, I just wanna thank you for your quick response um, to following up on the Martin Luther King campus. This campus has been a problem since I started in the council. And uh, they have spent years trying to fix the HVAC system um, to no great effect. Uh, it's remarkable how many experts, experts they have brought in to fix the, the HVAC system. I believe the situation there is so dire that the DOE should open up someplace like the Javits Center for this school. There, in my experience, in six and a half years, they have not been able to fix the HVAC. And I can't comprehend how they think they're gonna fix it in the next 12 days or 24 days or year, if they haven't been able to fix it in six years. So here's an example where using the Javits Center for this reason will be um, a life and death decision. So I wanna thank the principals. I, I'm so grateful for your coming here to to testify, and I'm gonna go one step further. I believe that we need a better solution for the school, uh, the Coffin School of Music, uh, for their, their high schoolers. Being in the basement of a school is not good enough. We have argued this over and over again, and here we are where the rubber meets the road and we're stuck because of a decision that wasn't a particularly good one in the first place. But there is no way that building can open in the state it is in now. And uh, I really, just to double down Chair Traeger, I appreciate your taking interest in this particular building. We need help. We really need help. Thank you. Uh, and I want to note, uh, colleague, that Councilman Rosenthal has always been and continues to be a champion ally uh, in support of uh, direct support to school budgets, has always uh, worked with me and, and our key folks to increase fair student funding um, and, and to also allocate money to increase accessibility because you know, the mayor also forgets to mention that most of our buildings are not truly accessible for all kids and all staff. So this is not a reopening plan for all, quite frankly. Um, and, uh, but we also, I think my colleague would agree that uh, state legislators, federal folks, we need state federal support to bring our buildings up to the 21st century. Uh, the city has a lot of responsibility, but it cannot do this on, on its own. Uh, and doesn't put the mayor off the hook because that means when we get the resources, he has to spend it the right way to indirectly into our schools and not into his pet projects. Uh, so Councilman Rosenthal has been just a stalwart ally and champion uh, for our school communities. And I definitely wanna work with you colleague because no school and no zip code in New York should be conducting tissue paper tests to determine air flow. That, that is just unacceptable, unacceptable. And thank you for your support colleague.
All right, thank you to this panel. We will now go to the next one. The next panel will be Ellen McHugh, Gloria Corsino, Azalea Volt, and Paulette Healy. We will start with Ellen. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Um, before I start, I want to give a shout out to my city council person, Justin Brannon, who is an education advocate and the son of the inimitable and newly retired Mary Brannon kindergarten teacher. My name is Ellen McHugh and I am the co-chair of the Citywide Council on Special Education. Like many others on this group, I have been doing this for a very long time. 30 years is not an unconscious, unknown amount of time for advocates to work. Returning to school after the pandemic may seem to be a dream right now, but it will happen. It will only happen because parents acted as teacher, therapist, counselor, mentor, nutritionist, and advocate. Our students, no matter how many times leadership in this community calls them their most vulnerable or most precious, are often an afterthought. At this point now, we should drop fuzzy phrases about differently abled or special needs and use real language. These children have disabilities. Their disabilities are as much a part of them as being tall, strong, funny, or having brown eyes. Yet we treat them as if the only thing that would define or describe them is their disability. Oh, that kid in the wheelchair. Oh yeah, did you see the kid who uses sign language? Oh yeah, she's an SWD, student with a disability. Or worse yet, he's a SPED. When I heard that the first time, I thought they were calling the child a spud. We ask how many times do we need, how many children do we need to create an ICT class? It's usually shorthand for those kids are over there. You know, we have to do something about them, but I'm really not sure. Children with disabilities don't move up from pre-K or kin to kindergarten. They turn five. I don't know. Kind of mixed by it. I don't know what that is. I still don't know what that is. If our goal is to use the lessons learned from this pandemic to affect our children, why can't we change our ways of teaching and improve our learning? Pre-pandemic, our students were struggling. Post-pandemic, we can take a hard look at the past and learn from it and stop repeating the past. These children, all children, deserve a new proven age-appropriate education. They deserve our respect and recognition. We have a responsibility to recognize their diversity, which the DOE refuses to do, their diligence and their dedication. We have a responsibility to change the way the system educates, includes, and respects all children. I would dare you to be inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Gloria. Time starts now. Sorry, sorry about that. Good mo afternoon, everybody. Before I get started, I wanna take a moment and thank the UFT and especially Susan Perez for including me on a walkthrough of a District 75 school in the Bronx. Susan combed through that building like a crime scene investigator. She gave me a whole new perspective of safety in a school building. Let's remember that safety for students and staff should come first. No one wants their children in the school more than myself, but I want it done safely. I wanna address the topics of parent engagement and translation. This is not a new topic for me, but necessary one. When we are living in such a unique and trying time, when the deal, I feel it as if it, as if it, an IEP is left on the outside of the door when they have not, they are not afforded reports or IEPs in their native language. Parents can only be successful advocates when they have been given the tools to do so effectively. This just does not happen with IEP meetings or conferences. It also happens when there are information sessions held by parent leaders, organizations, and, and, and such CBOs such as the CCSE, for example, who represent students and families citywide who are educated and served by the DOE. And because of a technicality of a 10-day notice for translation for parents, we will be holding an information session tonight via Zoom that will leave many non-English speaking parents without answers on busing and how their children will be transported to school safely. 
if FACE is charged with supporting education councils, this would be a perfect time to show that they can certainly work to assist them by expediting this request more efficiently. And during these trying times, instead, we are being refused this accommodation by enforcing a rule of a 10-day notice. That seems petty when this information will be crucial for parents to make the decision for their children and traveling to schools that may not be in the communities they reside in. How heartbreaking for our families. Let's stop stating that we are working to. Time expired. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Azalea. Time starts now. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me because I think I'm having some issues. So just a thumbs up would be great. No, we um, can hear you. Thank you kindly. I appreciate that. As a member of the Citywide Council on Special Education, I will focus my advocacy on the 277,000 children who are in receipt of the special ed services in New York City. As I cannot focus my energy on the labyrinth of inconsistencies that continuously come out of the DOE and the mayor's office, because we don't have enough time for that. While we are speaking of remote learning, I would like to remind all of us that in January of 2020, the DOE entered into a voluntary resolution agreement with OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, to provide interpretive and translation services for our families of limited English proficiency. There has yet to be any mandates that I know of that have been issued by the DOE, or at least on on a school-wide level. So that is concerning to me. Furthermore, my concern is, and our concern as CCSE is, that Zoom meetings are taking place or in other platforms for IEPs. There are not translation or interpretive services being offered to parents unless it's upon a parent's request. This is ridiculous. This must end. As such, I would ask that this panel of city council members and parents and educators, please remember that we are also speaking about 277,000 children. 93% of those children are children of color who need to understand what's going on with their schools and their services provided. So I'll ask that we do not lose focus on these children where we are asking that we continue along the path of offering services to these most educationally fragile. Time children. expired. Thank you. Thank you to this panel. We will now call the next panel up. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Paulette um, needs to testify. Apologies. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I'm in a spotty area. Um, my name is Paula Healy, and I am a member of the City Right Council for Special Education and a parent member of Press NYC. I am here to speak out against the blatant disregard for our students and families in special education in the latest DOE reopening plan. Our students make up 20% of the total students enrolled in, in, in NYC schools and need very specific supports and structures in place. Yet a can response from schools such as we'll get to it when we get to it or we will figure it out when, we, when it comes does not tell our parents how related services will be provided. It does not tell us how ICT classes will look in the blended learning model. It does not tell us if adapted to ed will be restricted because our kids can't keep their mask on. And it does not tell us who is taking our kids to school with no bus contract in place. Not to mention the lack of necessary PTE that is needed for our parents to provide toileting services or the lack of ventilation in the school basements where a lot of our co-located D75 programs are housed. The fact that the chancellor isn't here today speaks volumes, but it falls in line with how he has continued to ignore our special education families and disrespects outspoken traumatized families and students overall. The chancellor cannot talk about putting our most vulnerable population first without addressing these deal breakers. Ventilation issues will not be solved in 10 days. Right now, we have reports from families getting calls from their schools, asking them to remove busing off their IEPs. Students in Horizon programs are being displaced into community settings without parents' consent. COVID hasn't disappeared. I buried my aunt two weeks ago. My brother-in-law, who's an MTA worker, still 
feeling the effects left behind from COVID back when he had it in April. He can't still take a breath. Our children are in tears, begging you not to sacrifice their well-being. Our school staff are not expendable. No plan is acceptable until our concerns are recognized and respected. Finally, I just want to thank your service as council members for pushing this narrative and supporting our families throughout this pandemic. And special shout out to Justin Brennan. From Time our expired. Thank you, that concludes this. Oh. Thank you very much, thank, thank the panel. That concludes the testimony for this panel. We will now move on to our next panel. Our next panel is Johanna Garcia, Harlem Fall, Cynthia Nixon, and Christine Marinoni. We will start with Johanna Garcia. Time starts now. I'm grateful uh, to the work that went into this resolution. My name is Johanna Garcia. Um, and I am a previous uh, CEC6 president as well as a member of Press NYC. While I'm grateful for the resolution, at the same time, I'm disappointed to see that parent voices were not included in this resolution. Press NYC set the terms for the reopening debate with our deal breakers framing. I speak here as a mother who is raising three children with very different learning needs. Against the backdrop of historic underfunding of our school community, the poor planning during this pandemic continues the neglect of the needs of students and parents who keep waiting for the city to finally step up. I can tell you firsthand, the utter failure to plan around a robust remote learning experience is pushing the physical and mental health of our families and educators to the breaking point. We know in-person learning is preferable, but we can't risk it, not even on September 21st, based on the scattershot communication stakeholders have had to hear from the DOE. Just yesterday at a D6 equity and remote learning meeting, I learned that the special ed teachers have been given no plans for how to work with kids who have IEPs. There's no guidance for custodians for cleaning practices, no mention of how we're supporting our heroic cafeteria workers who exposed themselves the past six months so they can feed the hungry. Inequity plagues us at every turn and we as parents know it comes down to money. How are we going to make remote learning work for all our students, not just the ones whose parents can stay home and support them or pay for private tutoring pods? How do we expect outdoor learning not to exacerbate inequity when it's been thrown into the mix at the last minute without regard for environmental conditions? We need to plan a plan that centers on equity and forefronts English language learners, students with disabilities, and those experiencing food and housing insecurities. Anything less says to our black and brown working class families that your banner waving and embrace of Black Lives Matter earlier this summer was just empty rhetoric and PR. Thank you. And next we will hear from Harlem McFall. Harlem. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Harlan McFall. I am gonna be a seventh grader at UNMS Middle School in District One. I'm speaking today to give my opinion from the perspective of a kid and not parents or teachers or people in power. When my mom asked if my brother and I wanted to be in school or online school for the next year, I said online school. She explained to me and my brother that we would have to wear masks all day at school and be the, in the same room from the morning to the end of the day. And online school would be the same that we did when we went into quarantine. I would not like to be in a class for hours with a hard to breathe mask on and not being able to talk and hang out, out with my other classmates, basically being tortured by te teachers and parents. My mom listens to a lot of news on her phone and we talk about how many people are getting sick and dying all over the world. I hear that black people and Latino people are getting sick and dying more than anybody else. I don't want to die. I guess what I am saying is to wait to open school so we feel safe to go back and make learning on Zoom and online school better for all kids. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Cynthia. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christine Marinoni and I'm, on, I'm speaking on behalf of my wife, Cynthia Nixon and our family. Um, Olympia will be speaking on my behalf following me. Um, our nine-year-old goes to school in district one where like everyone else, there isn't money that we need to open safely. 
Like many, like many New York schools, our school is significantly overcrowded. And one of the most important things the city could be doing to help us open safely is to find extra space to spread people out. Instead, they said every school for themselves, every school had to make do with their own resources, um, which is ridiculous. So much for equity or putting the city's might and muscle into what should be an all hands on deck effort whose outcome could save or literally cost lives. Our school doesn't have enough teachers, so they will be exposed to a dangerous number of students making the pods all but irrelevant. And I don't know about this UFT agreement on randomized testing, but in LA, they're making plans to test every student and staff before coming into schools and regularly after that. Why isn't that our goal here? I am appreciative that the city council is now speaking up, but I wanna remind you of the budget you passed just this last June that cut almost a billion dollars from schools instead of the NYPD. All but nine of you, and some of those nine are here on this call today, and we appreciate your voice. But all but nine of you voted for a budget that went to the Met to make sure not one single police officer would be laid off. Even if that meant that now the city could, is now sacrificing critical school, school staff that we need to open schools stay safely. There's no point in crying over uh, spilt milk, I understand. And I am thankful that you are acknowledging we don't have the resources needed to open schools safely now. But we need you to make up for lost time and stand up strong. We need you to go as an entire body to Albany and demand that this governor who wants to cut 20% more out of our schools, quit playing a shell game with our children's, our teachers, our communities, and our cities. Time life. expired. Thank you. Thank you. If we can now unmute the Christine Marinoni account. And my son, he's in kindergarten at the East Village Community School in District One. They call. I want to thank you for holding. Oh, we're having a. We can't hear you. I'm trying to take off my headphones. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Yeah. Time starts now. Okay, thank you. So my name is Olympia Kazi and my son will be in kindergarten at the East Village Community School in District 1 this fall. And I wanna thank you for holding this hearing, even if the administration has ignored it, this is very important. It's, it's important because reopening plans are underfunded and that's why they are unsafe. And on September 21st, there will still be unsafe. We need to prioritize in-school learning for the highest need students. And we need to expand regional enrichment centers for essential workers, students with disabilities, students in temporary housing, English learners, and all at-risk students. And we need to do that now. We need to invest in a robust and comprehensive remote learning. And we need to invest in district-wide outdoor learning now, because unfortunately we'll need it in the spring and the fall of 2021. Outdoors learning will be very important, not just for the safety because it's safer to be outdoors, but for social, physical and emotional development of our children that have been quarantined and they haven't been seeing other human beings. And that's why we need all this to be equitable and it will only be equitable if you invest in it district-wide, when district-wide planning now and investment now. I ask for a lot of investment and I know that New York is the wealthiest city in the globe. And I don't understand why we're planning for this one of a kind challenge with complete lack of urgency and creativity. Why are we accepting budget cuts? Christine said it already. We need to tax the rich and we need to pass uh, Senator Jackson's bill. You as city council have done us wrong. You passed a budget that cut 1 billion from our schools. So please, Join us now and let's do the right thing. Let's all call on Governor Cuomo to tax the rich and fund our schools because the lives of all New Yorkers depend on that. Our kids and the New Yorkers that you all represent are not pawns in political games in order to extract more federal relief. Thank you. Time expired. So I wanna thank the panel and thank them for their advocacy for more resources to city schools. And I just wanna remind folks that I was a public school teacher and schools mean the world to me. And I also wanna let folks know that during this council's tenure, this, uh, this under Corey Johnson, this is a council that added $125 million of fair student funding a couple of years back 
We added 200 new social workers for the first time in history that much in the last budget. This is a year that with the pandemic and the shutdown of the, a lot of the economy, a $9 billion budget deficit. And I just wanna make it very clear just from a factual standpoint that the city of New York has a legal obligation to advance a balanced budget by July 1st. And if we did not advance a balanced budget by July 1st, because there was disagreement still with the mayor, we still disagree on a number of things. But what happens is that you would turn the city over to Governor Cuomo through a state financial control board. So we hear criticism of the governor. I criticize the governor. The governor has not fulfilled the campaign for fiscal equity, legal obligation promises. The governor chronically underfunds, not just the New York City School District, but a number of school districts. I support Senator Jackson's bill to raise taxes on the wealthy. I support borrowing authority immediately. But if the city council voted to not advance any budget whatsoever by July 1st, the governor would form a state financial control board and, we, and he would take over the city's finances altogether. And to be clear, the governor already has extraordinary power by the state legislature. The state legislature voted to give the governor extraordinary power over the budget and policy. And he should hand that power back to NYSET, the state education department immediately. But he still holds the, he, he still holds the cards. So I would do not support, I do not support handing the city finances over to Governor Cuomo. And we have a lot more work to do. And to be clear about the schools, the $1 billion or, or, or so folks in terms of the sort of DOE budgets, we saved $100 million in fair student funding cut. The mayor wanted to cut $100 million in fair student funding. For the public, so you know what that means, those are city tax levy dollars, fair student funding, FSF. That's the funding stream that is so precious to school principals who are on this Zoom, and they know what FSF means. They know that that's the stream that funds your teachers, your social workers, your counselors, your paraprofessionals. If that $100 million cut would have advanced, thousands of school positions would have been lost, thousands. We also restored Single Shepherd, which is a critical program in Central Brooklyn in the South Bronx for social workers and counselors, including for the late Principal Erin Gary uh, from, 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 from Letters School, where she passed away tragically, and her students desperately needed those social workers and counselors to stay in the building. We saved that. This was a painful budget. There's no victory laps, but I'll make it very clear that we saved thousands of school positions and if the council did not pass any budget whatsoever, the Governor Cuomo would be in control of New York City at this time, which I would, which I do not support. Thank you, Malcolm. You call the next panel. Thank you, council member, and thank you, panel. Um, we will move on to the next panel, which is Tom Shepard, Shakira Oliver, Atina Bazin, and Dr. Bur uh, Miriam. We will start with Tom Shepard. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger and the committee for giving me this opportunity to testify before you. My name is Tom Shepard, and I am the CC President's appointee to the Panel for Educational Policy. I am not speaking for the panel, but I am speaking as the CC President's appointee on the panel. I'm here in support of Resolution 1410. Here's the deal. During our last panel meeting on August 19th, we spent almost 10 hours hearing public comments from about 160 people. We heard from students, parents, teachers, community-based organizations, and various city and state elected officials. 159 out of 160 people who made comments opposed reopening, the reopening of school buildings until it's safe to do so. What's clear to them and what seems to be clear to almost everyone, except for Mayor de Blasio, is that it's not safe to reopen these buildings. I'm not gonna get into all the reasons because I'm sure that many other people are doing that today. What I will add, however, is that MLK 
is an example of a broken system. Whether we are talking about toilet paper on a stick or a collapsed roof at Taft High School campus in the Bronx, these buildings are death traps. As parents, we want our children to go back to school. We want to go back to work. We want to reconnect in person with our families and our friends. We want to be around each other, spend time with each other, and live our lives in peace. But we also understand that 6 million people have been infected with this virus and 181,000 souls have been lost to it. We all know that it's not safe. I need to make something clear. May I have a few more seconds, please? Yes, you can wrap up your thoughts. Thank you. I need to make something clear. My issue is that there's this narrative uh, that things are being shaped. It's kind of like a binary choice right? Whether you want to go back to school or, or whether you want buildings to be reopened or not. But I'm here today to respectfully submit that this is not a binary choice. It's a conditional choice. As parents, we are saying that we want our children to go back to school buildings only when it's safe. Because the Department of Education has not answered all the questions about the condition of these buildings and their ability to keep us all safe in them, right? With so many unanswered questions about what blended and remote learning will even look like. And until we can get past the half-baked policies with no plans or resources to support them, we as parents are uncomfortable placing our children into this environment. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Shakira. Time starts now. Uh, Yes, I'm a math and science educator and a consultant and a parent in District 23 in Brooklyn. And I'm going to speak to you from two lens here. Um, During the height of the pandemic, there were constant nightly sirens with double lanes of ambulances to enter the emergency room of our nearest hospital at Brookdale. And of course, multiple sirens and police escorts. And there was literally no amount of distraction that could take your mind away from the urgency to save lives. And this same community um, where I live now lost the first administrator at Brooklyn Democracy Academy. Uh, This pandemic has impacted black and Latino families in my area of Brooklyn significantly. And so with schools reopening in an unsafe manner, uh, they will once again be disproportionately targeted for their health and safety with a double burden here. So um, according to the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper, over half of all the Bed-Stuy schools currently and in Park Slope uh, have issues with ventilation. And um, parents are trusting that elected officials are making the right decisions and keeping them informed. Uh, And so now I'm going to switch from that lens, you know, the parent and then the educator part of me now is speaking, uh, you know, research suggests that when schools establish effective family engagement, students benefit. But the city hasn't effectively engaged parents on the key issues necessary for remote learning, supporting multiple children learning at home, and the proper usage of these remote learning platforms. Uh, The district has to provide more accountability, mental and social emotional support as these schools reopen, and definitely sufficient community engagement with the planning. And though it is delayed, it is still an insufficient amount of time. I have assisted uh, Washington, D.C. DC and uh, policymakers there and ed leaders there with um, establishing the need for equity across the remote learning platforms and really providing supports. I would suggest Time one recommendation expired. if I can finish my sentence. Yep, please do. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, one uh, medical organization reached out to me and they're now servicing Nassau County. It's um, IMBA Medical, it's schools.takeaction. Dot XYZ, and it, I did submit this in my written testimony that I uploaded on the platform, and they've integrated um, testing um, from admin to bus personnel all the way across uh, in a cloud-based platform and also um, communication so that they can handle connecting the data and um, the frequency of air ventilation and those proper procedures. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Rosenthal, I saw your hand before then went down, but now back up, so I apologize. So, Councilmember Rosenthal. Starting time. All right. 
thank you so much. I actually have a question for the uh, someone on the last panel. So, Johanna Garcia still um, available? If she is, could we bring her back in to as a panelist? I have a question for her yes, specifically. We'll, we'll go ahead and unmute Johanna. Great. Just give us one moment. Thank you so much. I, I'm not sure. I mean, she may have hopped off. And it, just to keep it going, uh, the reason I'm asking uh, to chat with Johanna is because I've known her for actually decades. Um, she, when she worked for um, then council member Jackson, we worked together on the schools uh, in the northern part of my district uh, in, uh, which is now an area that she is more focused on. And I just, I know she is a compassionate and a, a great advocate for the schools in her district. And I'm wondering specifically um, about those schools and and uh, what's going on, if she could just be a little more specific because I know how, how much she really uh, knows each of those schools very well. Johanna, welcome back. Um, I was just Hi, saying- Sorry. No, 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 I mean, I was just saying, I know you and I have worked together for years on the school's issues. And uh, I know how well and intimately you know the schools uh, in your part of the district, uh, which kind of overlaps with mine. And I was wondering if you have specific examples or concerns of your district, just what you think is going on specifically. Uh, so specifically in District 6, uh, there's a huge concern about how children who are English language learners and students with disabilities, IEPs, are actually going to get services. Um, that's closely followed by the fact that the hybrid does not address that we have a huge uh, number of parents who are part of the working class. Um, and it doesn't do anything in terms of not understanding that wraparound service of supporting them. Teachers are not childcare, uh, but at the same time, parents need the DOE to kind of think out of the box as to what happens with these kids, understanding that safety and equity is at the heart of that conversation. And that hasn't been going on. And I'll also say that there's, because of a, a lot of the misinformation or backtracking from the DOE, there is a risk that we have in our district where parents who just want their kids to be educated being pitted against teachers and principals who also want kids to be educated, but everyone wants everyone to be safe because no one knows what to believe or what's going on. Um, and in a district like ours that has- Time um, expired. Um, there's, Thank you. Keep going. Just, oh, please finish. Um, there's, real quick, uh, um, there's so much, we can't afford to be divided. Um, so we're trying to keep it together. Last quick question, Chair, if it's okay. Um, do you feel that in your district, all the kids have the remote learning devices they need? So how they is don't. that even possible? How is that possible? Chair Traeger, I, I, that is a mind blowing answer to me. Can I just add, There's. I heard from a special ed teacher that it's not just about having the device, but there are some children who don't even know how to get on the device. There's just no way. There, there's been attempts to try to get a device uh, because we're not even thinking about that homeschool connection. We're, we're, we're taking it for granted that every child is equipped with this. These adults in their house, they know how to do those things. And that's just not true. Bingo. And that, I have heard that over and over, that the principals know that the kids may have the device, but the parents, don't even know how to use the device. I mean, not for anyone's, no fault of anyone's. It's just not something in their lives. And so the DOE needs to take that extra step of responsibility of educating the parents so they can be even involved in their children's learning and the parents can help the children 
use the device. So Johanna, thank you for bringing that up. And thank you for the amazing work that you have done for decades for the children in your district. Uh, it's always been a pleasure working with you. Um, uh, we will hear from Atina Bazin, please. I, and I, I just want to add quick, very quickly, Malcolm, that uh, and Johanna raised a very important point, so did my colleague, uh, Councilman Rosenthal. It's not just parents who need more support. Remember, as a former high school teacher, a number of my students were caretakers for their younger siblings. High school students are you know, being asked and, and, and stepping up to help their younger siblings with remote learning, which means that high school kids don't have enough time to focus on their own instruction as well. So the remote learning certainly has a lot of a lot more gaps to, to, to address, but very important points. Thank you. Next. Uh, Tina? Yes, thank and you. And starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Ati Bazin. I'm speaking as a parent advocate and a member of District 28 Equity Now. We stand in solidarity with teachers, administrators, and families in support of the resolution to delay in-person learning, and we support robust and equitable remote learning that is culturally responsive as well as trauma-informed. This is an exercise in futility. I'm not understanding what's going on, but essentially what we're doing is attempting to prop up normal at the expense of our most marginalized and primarily to the benefit of the most advantaged among us. Um, we're in a global pandemic, so uh, I would urge everyone to heed Dr. Talaj's warnings. This is essentially inhumane what we are trying to do here. Um, as a parent of black biracial children, I just have to say it's, uh, it's especially troubling for me uh, and my family members um, because we are impacted uh, as well. Um, how can we utter the words Black Lives Matter uh, while simultaneously placing uh, Black and Brown communities in harm's way again? This is nothing short of performative allyship, which has deadly consequences. In-person learning during a global pandemic is a deal breaker, full stop. Elected officials do not have a safe enough plan to protect teachers, workers, students, and their families. So why are we pretending? This is nothing short of an absurd and inhumane pretense to pawn off what is safe in the face of overwhelming scientific data that says otherwise. No, I'm expired. It's not safe. If, may, I, may I finish? I'm actually nearly done. Yes, please do. Thank you. Uh, we risk losing human life and children do risk more than trauma. Uh, it's trauma on top of trauma. They risk losing parents, grandparents, loved ones and unwittingly being agents of, of something that is horrible, uh, of being agents of death and further traumatizing all children, especially our most vulnerable and most marginalized. Teachers and administrators and administrators are not frontline workers and neither are children and they should not be pushed into the front lines. Neither should parents or children be forced to assume so much risk. We are pitting parents, administrators and teachers all against one another. And we're putting everyone in an untenable position of having to make a false choice between safety and learning versus making enough money to feed and house their children and family members. We all need protection and assurances. And like with 9-11, we cannot rely on a patchwork of untenable safety measures and empty promises. We've been here before. We know exactly what this is. What COVID lays bare is who we are as a society, as individuals, and what our legacy burdens are collectively. But it also is an opportunity in closing to live out our stated values to be the equitable society that we all claim we want to be. It is an opportunity to lead. Black Lives Matter in schools. Thank you. Thank you. And next, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing people's names, but next we'll hear from Dr. Merrim. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank, um, I would like to thank uh, Chair 
Mark Traeger, and I would like to thank everyone on this panel. And um, I would like to share with you a few points. Uh, we are talking about reopening the schools, and I would like to just remind everyone uh, what happened this summer when we reopened all the societies worldwide. There was a great surge in cases worldwide. I would like to share with you um, something concerning uh, what scientists wrote about, more than 200 scientists wrote a letter to WHO, uh, World Health Organization, to declare the COVID-19 uh, as having also an airborne mode of transmission. And this has been published in the Clinical Infectious Disease. Um, and it has been signed off by more than 200, 240 uh, scientists, uh, which means that uh, not only there are the droplets, but there are also aerosols, which are uh, much smaller droplets that can stay uh, more in the air and travel, travel further uh, than the droplets. So that means that we need more distancing, etc. Okay, next point. I would like to share with you also what has, has been published by the Academy, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, showing that, alors this is going to speak volume, showing the children infections, hospitalization, and death rising two or three times higher than adults during last three months. Now listen to this. Latino children are eight times more likely to be hospitalized than white children. Black children are five times more likely to be hospitalized than white children. This has been published by the American Academy of Pediatrics and has been also published by CDC uh, in volume 69. Hispanic Time or expired. Latino. Oh, Lord. Can I just finish quickly? You could just wrap up your thoughts. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Okay. And I would like to finish this by saying that the ventilation system is totally non-working in our schools. The, the buildings are too old. We should really concentrate on full remote learning, outdoor learning, provide the teachers with tech support. Teachers have no tech support for remote. Uh, provide the, the, the children with social emotional, uh, uh, provide the children with the, the, uh, the device with the internet and provide the parents with workshop, non-speaking English parents who still do not have their device. Um, and I would like just to finish by saying that uh, one of the French officials said, oh, well, school has been obligatory and mandatory for the past 40, 400 years. We are not going to be um, intimidated by an invisible little virus. I say that we have to take a pause and remember that as soon as we have a vaccine, we will be able to go back to the old fashioned, modified, old wash fashion school way of life. But right now, and as uh, someone else said it already, actually it's uh, the UFT president, union president who said it, it will be about three years of waves coming in and out, in and out of this. We cannot have the bubbles of all these families with these children remixing again. It will be a disaster because our schools are not ready for that. Thank you. Thank you to this panel. Um, we will now move on to the next one. I do just want to remind everyone that we are only on panel, um, moving on to panel 10, and we have 30 panels in total. So uh, when the sergeant calls the two-minute clock, we just ask that everybody please wraps up their final thoughts. All submitted testimony um, to the committee is read by count, uh, committee staff. So your words will be read in full, but in the interest of time, we just ask that folks wrap up as soon as the sergeant calls the two-minute timer. So the next panel, we will have Dr. Christopher Hazelton, Kim Watkins, and Jessica Kim. We will start with Dr. Christopher. Time starts now. Hi, Council Member Trager. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Um, I am currently a teacher in District 14. Um, this is my 17th year as a public school educator. Um, I've been in charter and public, and I will say this is the most dysfunction I've ever seen um, the NYC DOE. So not too long ago in March, um, the UFT threatened to go to court to close schools. The mayor's argument was the numbers are low, even with an uptick in cases. The mayor got it wrong and New York City became the epicenter. The mayor is using the same data to reopen schools because the numbers are low. Let's hope and pray we do not have a repeat of March, but what happens when we do? 
why is most of New York State going remote and their cases were never as high as ours, not even close? New York City could have been saved, could have saved billions of dollars keeping schools remote. Instead, the failed leadership at City Hall is asking New York State to bail us out. We are wasting taxpayer dollars. All that I was on, and so cool. Uh, three schools with UFT, CSA, parents, students, health experts, DC 37, uh, custodial engineers, or politicians. And after 17 years of living in New York City and working in uh, NYC DOE public schools, public and charter, like many of my colleagues, we are being forced to pack up and leave New York City because as the mayor mentions that parents need to work and students need to be in school, I am one of those single parents who needs to work and my child needs to be in school too when he says those types of things. Um, and I just wanna end and for the sake of time, uh, the UFT survey, um, that people have mentioned, or I know Michael Mulgrew's done a great job speaking on our behalf. Of probably hundred has been surveyed by the UFT. Um, on school reopening and our thoughts. Um, I do agree with everything. We're not. Time expired. Not sure. Um, and then there's this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kim Watkins. Time starts now. Can you guys hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Hello. Good, good afternoon. I'm Kim Watkins, and I'm president of CEC3. I'm a member of many of the parent advocacy organizations that have formed as a, as a result of our conditions since uh, the beginning of this year, Parents Supporting Parents Press NYC, and, and uh, a staunch advocate um, and supporter of the Moore Caucus. And I want to thank you, Chair Traeger, for holding this hearing and for sitting through all this testimony. It's really informative hearing from everyone. I, my remarks I wanna to limit to uh, in making sure that you know that CEC is chimed in on, um, on, the, uh, on the delay of the school, of school's reopening. We have not yet chimed in on the, uh, the you know, sort of timetable that we're using right now. Um, however, I, I support the resolution uh, as an individual uh, chair Traeger, and I'm really encouraged that we're taking the time to to go through this, you know, this heavy duty work in terms of community involvement on what we should do next. Um, so many of the panelists have spoken with emotion and with eloquence and with data on what we should be talking about right now. And I think the most important thing I want to make sure I mention is to echo some of the concerns that um, that we have with respect to the conditions of our buildings, um, specifically in District 3, where Martin Luther King Building exists. Uh, I tweeted a little bit ago, um, Chair Traeger, about um, the work CEC3 has done on that building, and I would love it if we can, um, we can participate in next steps on that. Um, and to that end, I also want to remark that one of the things I think we should be talking about and you guys should be pressing for is the compliance with something called Chancellor's Regulation 414, which mandates that the parent leader of a school be on the safety team. Now, it's my understanding and really my theory that the DOE- Time expired. Been, thank you. Um, one second. That the DOE has been able to get around involving parents in the walkthroughs by calling them something different, right? But we need to reinstitute our safety teams and so that we can begin to re rebuild trust without the documents being public necessarily, or maybe we don't really know. So parents really should be involved in those discussions. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jessica Kim. Starting time. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Jessica Kim and I'm a high school science teacher in Manhattan. Um, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity for uh, me to uh, give my testimony. So just to give a, um, an idea of what it's like to be a teacher trying to plan this and trying to like, you know, figure out what it is that we're doing. Um, it's pretty much, we don't have a school calendar, number one. Um, I don't really know like who is in my class. Um, basically the understanding that I, that I know of, and this is a, a confusion between the DOE and what the UFT, we don't really know what our responsibility are. Um, so we're pretty much for in-school staff, including myself, we're expected to do remote teaching, 
um, monitor the kids in front of us in, in class. Also do the blended learning online, offline, on our own. So let me tell you how ridiculous this is. It's ridiculous because I have nine kids in front of me, but I'm talking to my computer while policing the mask compliance in my classroom. And we all heard about the ventilation and the building conditions for um, New York City schools. Most of them are old and terrible. Let's be honest. When was the last time we had, you know, new construction in any of these schools? So um, with that and the fear of I have to be careful and watch for the safety of students, I now also have to be worried about my safety, my staff safety. And this is just even before going into the building. And we're going to the building next week for staff. Um, just to talk about what it was like pre-pandemic, um, um, our school windows were many classrooms. They do not stay open on their own. Like we would have to prop them with textbooks, stack textbooks, or stack them with whatever knickknacks that's lying around our classroom to make them stay open. I mean, we had AC issues in our school and we're told that when we report to school on the 8th and so forth, we are not allowed to turn on the fans or the ACs. So you have sweltering heat with all these bodies in the classroom and it's still September, it's still hot. We, now we have masks and somehow I'm supposed to, we're all supposed to understand each other and stay six feet apart. I'm expired. Sorry, um, I just don't think the reopening is possible at this point. I, I wanna thank you um, and you just brought me back to my teaching days. I know all about those windows that don't stay open. Um, and I thank I, I just, I have one, you're a high school teacher, is that correct? Yes, correct. And I am hearing from some high schools and I wanna hear from you, um, are students gonna be moving around in different classes or are they staying in one class throughout the day in your school? So to my understanding, the most recent staff meetings that I've had with my schools, um, it's the teachers actually moving around in different classrooms. Okay, okay. So so they're gonna to try to keep students in the, in the same class throughout the day. Because uh, I'm hearing, and how many total kids do you have in your building? Uh, we have about approximately 432 students and we share this building with the school. I think, I think that's why. Uh, because some of the schools I'm hearing from that are going to have kids move around are schools that have over three, 4,000 students in them. Uh, so you have relatively a smaller school, but still a sizable number as well. I mean, we haven't even talked about entry and exit protocol. Like, that's not even an issue that's been raised. How do we make sure the kids, you know, distance themselves on the stairwell? How do they walk around the hallways? Absolutely. And also, quick question. This was something that I have a concern with that we didn't have a chance to ask the administration today, but I'm going to still press ahead. Um, I used to teach many, you know, multilingual learners in, in my classes. And I remember when I was asked uh, to return uh, from them the learning surveys, it would always be a challenge because many families understandably would be nervous to return documents back over to the government. And this was before the Trump administration. Now it is extremely difficult and challenging right now. So the concern that I have is with the city's contact tracing program. Can, we, can you just imagine a stranger coming into the building looking to speak with our kids, particularly our vulnerable kids, our immigrant students saying, come here, I have to ask you a bunch of questions and you have to answer them. Can you speak about that concern that I have? D do you feel that that's a valid concern? Because I know that my kids would be certainly nervous and anxious about that. Um, absolutely. I mean, this also is taking into account that a lot, of, well, at least in my school, I know for a fact there's gonna be students with and like high service or high need, you know, students. So they might need an interpreter, they might need a para, all of those things are already like been consented to. But I'm not confident um, that a lot of the students or even their families are gonna be okay with that, to be honest with you. And then, then to tell them, if you don't comply with this contact tracing, you're now full remote. You can't come into the building anymore. No more services for you. You're on your own. That's, that's been the theme this entire time from city administration to schools, you're on your own. Um, and and, and, and uh, I, I just want to tell you, I know 
this might not mean much, but I, I appreciate you. And I, I appreciate all of your, your colleagues who have been working nonstop. You know, people keep referring to school buildings being closed. The work that you're doing has, is, has probably been exponentially increased in terms of trying to maintain connections with your students and your school families. And you're speaking up for more than just your profession. You're speaking up for every single kid in your class, in your school community, and every one of your colleagues, school food workers, social workers, counselors, aides, you name it. So I just, I appreciate you. I will continue to have your back and continue to hold them accountable uh, on behalf of your safety and the well-being of, of your colleagues and of your students. So I just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Sure. And that concludes this panel's testimony. We will now move on to the next panel. The next panel is Jenny Lowe, Richard Aguirre, Chauncey Young, and Rachel Paguaga. Uh, we will first hear from Jenny Lowe. Starting time. Okay, we are going to move to Richard and we can come back to Jenny at the end. Richard? Starting time. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, thank you uh, for the whole panel and what the great work that you guys are doing um, for your consideration of giving people and families the opportunity to be able to speak up. Um, I do have one thing that is really uh, bothering me. It's about the accountability of SCA throughout the entire process. I cannot, I cannot believe that we're not holding them accountable for what is going on right now. The problem that uh, COVID uh, did uh, search on it was that there was a failure of mechanical systems and that these mechanical systems in the schools have not failed just yesterday or three months ago. It has been an ongoing issue for so many years and SCA and DOE together should be accountable for this. I, have, I was able to, uh, I am part of a task force of my local school and I thank uh, my school because they gave me the opportunity to be able to see uh, what is going on. And not only that, I get the report from so many other schools from New York City with their uh, systems. And this is a back in 2018, 19 report with so many systems being defective and broken. Um, I, I, I question this and I think that the council has the power and authority to be able to question SCA for this failure. We pay enough money in our, through our taxes for us to have to send our children to be able to have this kind of experience. I am part of a citywide council for high schools. Uh, and I'm, I'm one of the members there and I have raised this voice, raised this concern uh, to so many other venues to no answer. Mm -hmm. SCA must be able to give us a full report and, account, and they, somebody should be able to be accountable for what is going on right now with our, all the schools, the mechanical systems and ventilation. So once again, thank you for all your work and thank you for all the parents and all the parent leaders who are here together. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jenny Lowe who we have back on the line. Starting time. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to testify at this hearing. I am Jenny Lowe, a proud product of New York City's public school system and a parent whose child graduated from public schools a year ago. I am also a candidate for city council in district one. How to reopen school has been an incredibly difficult and complex decision for city leaders. I'm glad the mayor and the Department of Education are listening to our concerns and have delayed in-person learning to September 21st. This is a relief for families and teachers who are concerned about the lack of a clear reopening plan and have been operating in the dark so far. We know that the consequences of any decision about school will fall hardest on the most vulnerable among us, including immigrant populations and communities of color that have been disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. These communities are more likely to be essential workers who are at higher risk of infection. Immigrant families like mine 
often living in multi-generational homes, posing a higher risk for our senior population. While delaying in-person instruction is a good first step, there is a lot more work to do to ensure the health and safety of all students, teachers, and staff this fall. The DOE needs to release clear plans and clear safety protocol for busing and communicating the plan to all bus drivers. All school must be thoroughly inspected to ensure that the right ventilating system, windows, fans, and other safety measures are in place. And DOE needs to make masks mandatory in all classrooms and Time provide expired. a clear, just a couple more minutes, clear once a month testing for virus to can ensure that the outbreak can be contained. There is far too much risk at the nation's largest school system that makes such a monumental decision without fully prepared. This risk is higher, especially for immigrants and community of color who have already suffered so much. The city needs to take these steps and fully communicate its plans to educators, students, and family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Next, we will hear from Chauncey. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, council members, parents, students, school staff, and community members. I'm speaking today on behalf of New Settlement Parent Action Committee, a parent organization that has been fighting to address educational inequities for over 20 years in District 9 and the Bronx, and a member organization of the Dignity in Schools Coalition and the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice. First, let me state that our members feel that in-person education is superior to remote education, but plans provided by the DOE and the city are inadequate to address the health concerns. And until these are addressed, in-person education is gonna put our students, school staff and families needlessly at risk. There are too many unanswered questions. It is not only about the safety and cleanliness of school buildings and classrooms, but how students are getting to school. For students taking public transportation, the MTA buses and trains, how can we ensure safety? For students being bused by the DOE, logistics of busing, safety plans and procedures are not clear. In terms of child care centers for families that need care for blended learning students, there is no plan to address the demand. Unfortunately, the New York City public education system has been inequitable for decades, and the crisis has only highlighted these inequity, existing inequities. For example, I invite you to visit Public one, School 126 in District 9, a school with basement classrooms, a dangerous combined auditorium, gym, and cafeteria. 126 has outdoor rooftop play area that should be the highlight of the school, but is instead dangerous and unusable. The community has demanded that the city repair this space for decades. It would be ideal for outdoor learning, but instead we can't use it. There are many schools like 126. We must center and engage our most impacted students and families, such as multi-language learners, families with limited literacy, families with disabilities, IEPs, and students in temporary housing. We must invest in equitable remote learning to make sure that every student has a device and that can be quickly replaced and to make sure that everyone has internet for public schools. Time students. expired. Could I say this, the last statement? Yep. We need to address the enormous cuts for New York City schools that have received during this historic health crisis. We need to delay reopening until we fully fund our schools and have equitable, safe, prioritized phase plan. We need to fully fund New York City schools. We need a millionaire's tax now. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Rachel. Starting time. Good afternoon, all. My name is Rachel Paguaga, and I'm testifying as a first grade teacher in Carroll Gardens, as well as an alumnus of PS222 and Marine Park Junior High School, both in Council District 46, as well as Madison High School in Council District 48. First, I'd like to thank Chairperson Traeger for bringing this resolution to the City Council and to the City Council members who sponsored the resolution. When I began writing this testimony, the UFT was on the brink of voting for a strike authorization. As been made clear, things have rapidly changed over the course of this week, but one thing remains. It is still unsafe for any of our school communities to return to their buildings. To say that Mayor Bill de Blasio and Chancellor Richard Carranza have dropped the ball during their back to school preparations would be a gross misunderstatement. 
Their lack of clear communication with all families and DOE employees has been absolutely abhorrent. I have received seven emails from Chancellor Carranza since the end of the school year. The amount of hubris driven posturing on part of these individuals is absolutely repugnant. Every day I find myself trying to make sense of any of the information and outright lies that are being presented to us from cherry picked survey data to the claim that teachers have received any type of training to the amount of COVID supplies purchased for the entire school system. It's never made sense. It will never make sense. And I'm entirely unsure as to who this plan is designed for other than themselves. It's entirely clear that the primary goal is to declare the reopening of the nation's largest school district a victory and use it as a talking point for their future political prospects. This 10 day extension is merely breadcrumbs intended to appease many unions that have said it's unsafe to return to school buildings. As an Italian American, I've had a lot of breadcrumbs in my day and I can confidently say these are stale. In two weeks time, we will all have a sense of collective deja vu. 10 more days of preparations does not a safe reopening plan make. Those responsible for reopening plans are merely arranging deck chairs in the Titanic as the band provides a score for their demise. Teachers, principals, custodians, custodial engineers, school aides, cafeteria workers, nurses, and parents have all called for a delay in school. I'm expired. Can I just finish? I have one more sentence. All of us cannot be wrong. Thank you for your time. I, I want to. I want to thank the, the extraordinary teacher. Um, uh, I will not forget that breadcrumb uh, connection as well, and they are definitely stale. And uh, thank you for your service. I truly appreciate you, and we're going to continue to speak up and hold them accountable. So I just want to thank you for your service. That concludes the testimony for this panel. We will now move on to the next. The next panel is Jasmine Del Valle, Rob Roskowski, MNM, and Nelson Marr. We'll first hear from Jasmine. Starting time. Yes, hi. I'm the IEP member for CC6. I'm one of the parents for a PSP. Um, and having a child with special needs myself, I've seen the principal's guide handbook, and there is no mention of any type of guidelines for kids with IEP in District 75. I cannot send my child to unsafe environment, not knowing how his services for PT, OT, speech therapist is going to be done when even the principals themselves have no idea. There is no conversation to this day of how this is going to be done when yet school is literally around the corner and it still has not started. I don't see how I can send other family members to an unsafe environment and knowing that my son realistically would be more beneficial at a school, I cannot send him. Um, and I also wanna add that, you know, it's, it's we should, we're gonna show that our schools are such divided and like where schools are more capable and able versus schools with, with kids with low in income and kids of color. And that's why I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Rob Roskowski. Starting time. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. All right, sorry, the, the mic wasn't going. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rob Roskowski. I'm a teacher in District 75, a parent of a rising 12th grader with an IEP and a member of both the UFT Delegate Assembly and my school's BRT team. In respect of everyone's time, I will cut right to the chase. I am aware that District 75 protocols and specifics are still in discussion at the DOE, who are unfortunately not elected to attend today. Any opening plan needs clearly defined District 75 protocols and nothing specific to that population has been addressed. One of the health protocols released by the DOE on July 30th for blended learning outlined that if there was one confirmed case of COVID-19, only that class is to close. Two confirmed cases would close the school community. While there may be a measured safeguard for general education classes, this does not work in the District 75 model. To keep our safe, our most vulnerable population with the most desperate needs of service, a minimal consideration if blended has to occur must be that the rule for one case closes a class, not a class in District 75, but is amended to close the entire site. Considering the following briefly, 
95% of all District 75 students are bused to school and the buses are not broken down by classes or school generated cohorts. Students are on the buses for up to two hours. A majority of students receive related services and these providers share more than one class in some cases even the entire site. A significant portion of the students require direct supervision. They cannot be left home alone, so they go to after-school programs where they will be mixing in different cohorts. Most District 75 students cannot wear a mask, and mealtimes and hands-on self-care are instructional for many 1214 and 611 students. Again, these are the numerous, these are numerous other reasons. This is why blended learning for the rule one case closes the class in District 75 must be amended to close one case closes the entire site. As Councilwoman Barone said earlier, equity is not always equal. The mathematics of the safety equation is one such example. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from MNM. Starting time. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I'm an ELA teacher at a District 15 transfer school. Um, earlier, we were told that the $1 billion cut to education was um, in order to avoid having the governor control the city. However, I still would like to acknowledge that a choice was made to cut the education budget. And I think we need to make sure that we understand that is a reason we are now in the cluster fund that we have. So. We keep touting equity um, and we definitely need to acknowledge this. This brings up a lot of questions that I have. Um, we need to question why the dozens of billionaires that New York City have, have not been taxed properly in order to support fully funding our education. This would be a great help, but yet nothing has been said about that. In regards to remote learning, um, it hasn't really received, I feel enough or significant attention in terms of its development. Apparently teachers have been trained on remote learning. I am a teacher. I have not received an email, a text message, snail mail or courier pigeon offering me any such training. So parents have no idea what remote learning is going to look like. Guess what? Teachers don't either. In addition to these questions around equity, I want to know how are students getting free or low cost Wi-Fi or broadband? How are staff? going to get that because some staff cannot afford that. Um, how will devices for those students who need it be distributed because 200,000 citywide does not seem to be adequate? What will be the process for tech support when these devices invariably fail or glitch? These rec centers, I'm very concerned about that because right now it doesn't seem that we have enough available, especially as more and more parents are opting for either full remote or blended. And if they do go full remote, as my understanding is that they don't qualify for these centers. How will they be staffed? Who will be vetting these people that are staffing these rec centers? Will there be background? I'm expired. I'm just gonna finish my last point. There are too many deal breakers and I won't die for DOE and I will not ask my students to die for DOE either. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Nelson Marr. Starting time. Uh, Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to request if I could um, speak a little bit later. I'm in a place where I really can't talk right now. Uh, yes, we can move you to a later panel. So uh, Chair, do you have any questions for this panel? Thank you. Okay, we will move on to the next panel. The next panel is Nancy Bedard, Robin Menikoff, and Ted Leather. We will start with Nancy. Starting time. Good afternoon and thank you very much for the, an opportunity to speak today. My name is Nancy Bedard. I'm an attorney with Brooklyn Legal Services. I am providing testimony for Legal Services New York City, which is a, uh, rep we represent low income communities throughout New York City um, in litigation, advocacy, education and outreach. I'm here to talk about the social and emotional well-being of the students when the school reopens safely. Um, we are very concerned and we'd like to give recommendations on what discipline will look like in the 2020-2021 school year. I'm sorry. We are asking for a moratorium on suspensions 
We also want rethinking of the police presence in schools and the role of school safety officers in order to adopt a healing centered, culturally sensitive approach to learning to reduce the trauma and the alienation brought on by the pandemic and the continued police violence and systemic oppression against people of color. On that, we ask for withdrawal of pending suspensions for students and that no new suspensions be done either remotely or in person. The stigmatization and isolation of suspended students who the vast majority have disabilities and our students of color have suffered adverse trauma and otherwise feel marginalized. And that will serve no purpose to discipline them. We do understand that there are many concerns about how potential breaches of social distancing protocols and the quickly changing expectations and rules of conduct in light of the pandemic will be dealt with and how this might further impact students we ask that to the maximum extent possible, the DOE refrain from imposing punitive disciplinary measures in virtual learning and in any school removal. Time expired. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, appreciate your testimony. And next we will hear from Robin Menikoff. Starting time. There was a guy who goes, uh, your starting time starts now. Time's up. <laughs> the timekeeper, he's a sergeant at arms. He screams, just time's up. He, all oh he does is, is scream. <laughs> if we can unmute Robin. Okay, we can come back to Robin. Let's unmute Ted Leather. Starting time. And I represent Manhattan on the citywide council on high schools. The CCHS believes the most prudent course of action is to start the school year 100% remote. We understand what is compromised with online education, but the danger of going back to buildings cannot be dismissed for students, teachers, administrators, and families who may be exposed to COVID-19. Even if all schools are properly ventilated, COVID may be transmitted during the commute to and from school. It'll take a lifetime to ensure that all schools are ventilated and cost well north of a billion dollars. Absent a vaccine, the risks are overwhelming. So we advocate instead effective online teaching be developed as opposed to this fragmented piecemeal effort to please every constituency. Yes, the DOE does many things, and for the most part, they do them perfunctorily. Public health has to take priority over everything. There is no education if lives are at risk, and we have three steps or solutions. One, parents and students want to know now what they can do to, quote, have school. They want people to help them understand the iPad, how to log in, who their teachers are, Will they need to be on the computer every hour of the school day? And so on. Two, spend the next two weeks contacting students and families. Get them info on technology. Make sure they know how to use the iPad. Every teacher should contact their students. To let them know what will be happening at the beginning of the year. And finally, FACE is an organization within the DOE. Use them to begin this imperative reach out to the 115,000 students. Thank you for your testimony. Um, can we, is Robin still on the line? Can we unmute Robin Menikoff? Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Hi, Starting my name time. is I'm with the COVID-19 Accountability Working Group. Some of you know Joel Kupferman, the director of our group, which is comprised of teachers, teaching assistants, parents, community leaders, scientists, public health physicians and experts, several of whom are 9-11 veterans. Have we learned nothing from 9-11? Students, teachers, and staff were ordered to return to schools contaminated with World Trade Center smoke and dust, ignoring all warnings, including independent sampling data and expert advice. The city denied the dangers instead of addressing the environmental health risks. 
Is the city going to follow the 9-11 playbook with schools now? It looks like it. The rushed assessments and stopgap measures recommended by the city are flawed and inadequate and will put students, teachers, staff, and those they come into contact with at risk for infection. Well-respected industrial hygienist and ventilation expert Monona Rossell notes, the issues are that there are many schools that do not have recirculating ventilation systems and rely on air conditioners and unit ventilators, AKA univents. Air conditioners usually provide no fresh air and their filters are not capable of capturing the COVID droplets or aerosols when they operate. If an infectious individual is in such a room, the aerosol they leave behind will remain for many hours and have the potential to infect others. The same issues are seen with the UN events. While they can bring in fresh air if they are installed where there are outside wall or window penetrations, many only recirculate room air. Even if the unit ventilator is properly connected to the outside and provides a mixture of fresh and room air, the filters cannot capture the COVID droplets or aerosol. This means that only the actual amount of fresh air is useful in replacing air that potentially carries the COVID aerosol. This low replacement leaves the contaminated air in the room for hours after an infectious person has been in the space. The rooms served by air conditioners and or unit ventilators cannot be made safe without major changes and additional equipment such as HEPA filters or, or designing and installing dilution exhaust systems. The recirculating systems also may be problematic. Even if they are upgraded and repaired to meet the standards of ASHRAE 62.1 2019, this standard doesn't address the COVID needs. Um, I'm going to skip ahead since I'm running out of time. We propose that a task force of independent experts and stakeholders be convened to set standards for school inspections and to create a process for independent review of inspection findings. We will be submitting more documents that provide- Time expired. Please, if you want to wrap up your thought. Thanks. I, all I was saying is that we'll be submitting further documents that will clarify some of this and provide more information. Thank you, and that concludes the testimony for this panel. The next panel will be Ilona Naye, Naomi Pena, Faraji Hannah-Jones, and Aisha Irvin. We'll start with Ilona. Starting time. Uh uh, hold on one moment. You you were remuted. Give us one moment. There we go. Go Can ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Alona Nene. Uh, I'm a teacher and a chapter leader at Mott Hall 5, a 6th through 12th school in District 12 in the Bronx. I'm also a member of More UFT, um, who's been elevating a health justice agenda since schools closed in March. While I support the resolution to delay the start of in-person schooling, I believe the resolution does not go far enough to address the many health, safety, and equity concerns that so many have voiced here today. On August 27th, more than 200 community members showed up for a Bronx Town Hall hosted by more UFT. Parents shared their concerns. One topic of conversation was the chemicals used in cleaning products, specifically the chemicals that would be sprayed to disinfect classrooms. Would their children with asthma be breathing in toxic chemicals? Other parents wondered how the DOE could be prepared to educate their children safely this year when the plans are coming out so late. Others voiced concerns about how one to three days of in-person instruction does not solve their childcare problems. As of today, there's still no viable childcare plan offered by the city for parents and teachers who need coverage for the gap between when teachers return to the school on the 8th and students on the 21st. In addition, teachers outright question the DOE's ability to provide PPE in adequate quantities given the many resources we lack on a consistent basis due to inadequate funding of our public schools. My school, for example, is still owed close to 1 million in foundation aid and lost close to 1 million in the first wave of budget cuts. Similarly, teachers wondered how ventilation systems of the turn of the century buildings could suddenly be deemed safe over the course of a few summer months. We are, when we're used to not having enough budget, space, ventilation, supplies, it's really difficult to trust that now suddenly we'll have all of these things in abundance. District 12 is often called the heart of the Bronx, but we do not have confidence in this plan because the people who make up that heart were not consulted in creating it. At this time, time expired. I 
can I finish my statement? Just one point. Go ahead, please wrap Thank yep. you. I have yet to see the building reports that confirm the safety of the buildings, even though we're, ask, uh, we're asking teachers to report on September 8th. I also wanna point out that the COVID-19 positive infection rates in zip codes that encompass District 12 are above the 3% rate that the mayor and UFT president Mulgrew have used to bolster this plan. Look, this agreement and honestly, this resolution does not address the chronic underfunding of our school system, a problem that is only gonna be magnified with impending austerity measures, measures that could be offset by taxing our state's millionaires, many of whom live here in NYC. We request answers and solutions, and we demand a return to the drawing board that includes the voices of students, communities, and teachers, because only then can we confidently say that this is the quote unquote, most robust safety plan in place for students, families, and educators. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Naomi Pena. Starting time. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Naomi Pena and I'm a proud District 1 parent to four children and a parent leader in our public school system. I want to thank City Council Member Traeger and the Education Committee for hosting this public hearing about our reopening of our schools. I want to first acknowledge how incredibly sad it is that this hearing even has to take place. Over the course of the last two months, the parents and guardians to 1.1 million children have been living in constant despair and agony over what to do with their children. Should they send them to home? Should they keep them home or send them in? It's been a constant point of discussion amongst every parent in stores, private settings, amongst our communities like small business owners, to the playgrounds, to large group texts amongst our parents in socially distant days. Now, what I'm finding is that overwhelmingly the, um, the communities of color are not sending their children back to school. Why? Because we have lived experience with this virus. We know someone that has died or fallen incredibly sick to this virus. We know that our children can be asymptomatic carriers, carriers, thus spreading it amongst their communities like schools and homes. I myself have opted my kids to keep them home, not because I wanted to, but because they refused to go back. When this demand is coming from, our, from a middle schooler and an elementary school age children, parents and administrators need to step back and ask why. My children do not feel comfortable going back because they flat out said, how would they be able to stay safe if they barely had soap and paper towels in pre-COVID pre times? They also told me they didn't want to get myself or a teacher sick. Our children are living with lived experience and trauma and this will have ripple effects for this generation for years to come. I want to make something incredibly clear here today. The DOE has been gaslighting parents about the reopening. The mayor has been banking this reopening based on federal funding that has never arrived or state borrowing power that is highly unlikely. The chancellor admitted that at the financial fact that if they are required to make additional cuts, our schools cannot physically open. So why have we been wasting two months of to, to reopen? Why have I'm not- I'm expired. Can I finish my one line? Um, why have we been focusing on not making remote experience more robust and engaging? Lastly, for the elected officials on this call, I hope you are starting to realize how incredibly problematic it is to have one person in charge of our school system. Having one person dedicating, dictating the process that refuses to listen to anyone is exactly why mayoral control doesn't work. I refuse to put my children and my family in a death trap because the mayor refuses to allow his absolute power to has allowed his power, his absolute power to corrupt him absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Aisha Irvin. Starting time. Hello, my name is Aisha Irvin, mother of three children, two in high school, one in elementary and district five. My son is so eager to go back to school. Unfortunately, with this situation, I cannot allow it. My daughters, both in high school, one just started in high school. Um, there's no way that I can do that. When yesterday we just found out with our parent coordinator and sta those, that staff going back on Monday, already the school had to be shut down because two people tested positive for COVID. Um, and that's without the students coming in. So how can I, in good faith, send my two daughters, one who has acute seizures into a building that holds 1,100 people um, there, hoping that everything will be okay? My son, who is asthmatic, severely asthmatic, how can I send him into his building 
hoping everything will be okay. District five, we are black and majority black and brown students, and we are expected to be um, sure that everything will be fine, that we already have a shortage of PPEs and they're saying you can re-up every 30 days. I don't have faith in that when I know that the, the supply that they have is low to begin with. I can't, I can't trust that for my children. Any, if even one child getting sick is not okay. So them to say that kids are lower to get sick or to spread it, what if one of my children caught it and gave it to my 78 year old mother? Like there's no amount of I'm sorry if something happened to one of my children or my mom. Like I've been in this system for 25 years. I started as a teacher and now I'm a parent leader, been on C for 10 years. And to have to explain to any parent that, I, that I'm a PTA president of, CEC member, to have to explain to them, I'm sorry, but, like, but- I'm expired. Everything you said in front of it. So there's no way we can, we can allow this. Someone has to hold the mayor, the chancellor, the, even the governor accountable for this. I'm hoping that city council will be the ones to do it. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Faraji Hannah-Jones. Starting time. Hi, everyone. Uh, Faraji Hannah-Jones, uh, proud public school uh, parent uh and proud uh african american uh descent uh citizen but ultimately i am a proud national my nationality being an american i'm a proud american and i'm proud to be here in new york with you um i would like to share a quick history lesson for those about our public school education um it was something that was written um, in the 1619 project that my wife have done recently. So hope we all uh, read it. Um, it says it didn't, that the public, uh, so I want everyone to know that our public education system is very sacred. Uh, it didn't exist in the South before reconstruction. The white elite sent their children to private schools children education through slavery were uh, desperation. So black legislators successfully pushed for a universal state funded system of schools, not just for their own children, but for white children too. I want you to keep that in mind. So we're not in normal times, nor we are in uh, will ever be, as long as decisions that are being made within our city is with under the foundation of the mo being the most segregated city school district in of the city school district in the country. COVID has exposed what we already know within the city and has predicted its impact on our black and brown communities and its children. Racism and oppression is alive within our institution of law enforcement, housing, education, and employment. It has since been, it, it has since been since the pan pandemic. Advocates have sounded the alarm to remove these oppressive obstacles for years and decades, and the city has not used it, has not used their moral capacity to destroy it only to be only to begin time expired to the right way see the call as parade crisis to who needs it the most i also like to share with everyone that defunding the police should not lead to the lead to criticism and dismissal it should spark moral instinct that leads to the ambition of law enforcement's commitment commitment to their long-term investment in liberating the institution of education that renounces the racist legacy that built it. So that should be the root of their reform. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, the 1619 Project is powerful. I wanna thank you for your family for sharing that. And uh, quite frankly, I think every single school should be incorporating that immediately uh, into their into their curriculum Absolutely. because quite, quite frankly there were things in in that important reading that are no textbook uh, mm -hmm. and we that is history um, and I truly appreciate uh, amplifying that and I appreciate your service and your, your testimony here today. Thank you. One one more point. Uh, just want sure. everyone to know. I, I want the council member that we do have technology in our grasp. I will urge everyone to go to nycmesh.net 
because that technology can be installed, it's easily can be installed and provided for everyone to have internet access for all, throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you. And that concludes the testimony for this panel. The next panel will be Haley Yi, Siobhan Milliner, Rashida Harris, and Jessamine Lee. We will first hear from Haley Yi. Starting time. <clears throat> Great, thank you. My name is Holly Yi, and I'm a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger and members of the Committee on Education for giving us the opportunity to testify. Um, CACF is the nation's only Pan-Asian Children and Families Advocacy Organization. The APA community uh, comprises 15% of New York City, and our communities face high levels of poverty, overcrowding, uninsurance, and linguistic isolation that the needs of our communities are consistently overlooked, misunderstood, and uncounted. For our schools to be safe and prepared to reopen to students, teachers, administrators, and support staff, we must think about more than just the 3% citywide average transmission rate threshold that the city is focused on. On behalf of our 70 plus organizational members and partners serving the diverse APA communities across the city, we ask council today to hold our public education system accountable to our community's needs. First, we demand that the city provide accurate data collection and disaggregation of data on infection rates, hospitalizations, and deaths in the community. In order to best respond to this pandemic and reopen safely, we have to at least be able to track um, race, ethnicity, and languages spoken for those who are tested so we can appropriately trace and take care of our families. We are not doing this now, and our communities are, and our struggles are being erased. Second, we demand that schools in partnership with the city's health system can ensure that critical information gets to students and families in the language they need. It is only recently that Health and Hospitals was able to translate health outreach documents into the city's top 11 languages required by local law. Yet this was too late and still not enough. Schools must be prepared to reach and support students and families who are limited English proficient. And third, we demand that schools address the mental health needs of students and families, especially those who are East Asian presenting who have been targeted during this pandemic. The school system must be prepared to help our students who have faced loss, isolation, discrimination, xenophobia, and more as they return to school, and it's simply not prepared. Our community members are understandably frightened of sending their children back to school, and a deep mistrust of the city's government is spreading throughout communities of Time color expired. and immigrant communities. Ensuring best practices around COVID-19 testing is key to the city's recovery, and it's critical in making it safe for our children to learn in person and our community's revitalization efforts. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Siobhan Milliner. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I've been a high school English teacher for the DOE for 15 years, and I've never thought of my medical issues as a privilege. However, now it has become one. This is a sad this is sad and disheartening. My colleagues should not have to wish that they have an illness so that they can teach remote as well. Our major concerns are as follows. Why does the agreement that was reached to stop stop a strike only in address testing a small section of our population? And why aren't teachers being tested prior to, to being asked to return to their buildings on the 8th? We are expected to monitor the students as they are having lunch in the classroom. How is this lunch policy safe for students or for teachers? The children will not have their masks on, and the only guidance that teachers have received thus far is to stay in the back of the classroom. This is unacceptable when indoor dining is still not allowed citywide. Some of us will not be in a position to see our at-risk family members until summer due to the senseless exposure that we are about to face. We won't have 14 days to quarantine before we visit. Those of us with the unfortunate privilege of having illnesses that remove us from our schools, which are our second homes, will be expected to reapply for the accommodation in December, a month with only 17 DOE working days. How are we to be ensured that our accommodation will be reinstated for the new year? These concerns have not been answered or even truly addressed by our city government or our union. We do not believe that schools should be open in person or that our lives and the lives of our families should be put at risk. Will you, the City Council of New York, advocate for us? Will you stand up and fight the mayor and be our voice as taxpaying citizens of this city? Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now hear from Rashida Harris. Starting time. Starting time. 
Thank you. Can y'all hear me? Um, thank you, Chair Treger and the rest of the committee for holding this hearing. My name is Rashida Harris. Pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a parent leader. I live in the Bronx, City Council District 13. Monjone is my councilman. I, um, I have a rising fifth grade, uh, a rising fifth grade daughter who attends school in East Harlem, school district four. I am in support of Traeger's resolution to delay the reopening of schools until it is truly safe. Um, I'm here as a parent in solidarity with the Moore Caucus, Teachers Unite, and New York City School Workers Solidarity Campaign. These groups are the voices of teachers and school staff who are begging to be heard, who want to return to school, but want to return when it's truly safe. Um, and I just need to mention organizations on the ground that have tirely, tirelessly been doing this work with parent volunteers with no break, no vacation, no sleep. These orgs are um, Press NYC, AQE, CEJ, New Settlement Parent Action Committee, the Bronx Healing Center Schools for Working um, Working Group, Masa Dignity and Schools, just to name a few. I mentioned these orgs because they are working with the families, the black and brown, indigenous people, immigrant families, and families in poorer communities. And these are the families and the communities that will suffer the most from this horrible reopening plan. I'm asking that we please fully fund New York public schools. 31 city council members voted yes to cutting almost 1 billion from our schools. I know Traeger, you saved single shepherd, you saved the um, FSF cuts. Thank you, we can't afford a cut and we need to expand single shepherd. We have a $34 billion education budget in New York City and we approved to spend 3 million on the electrostatic cleaning method, the, the Ghostbusters backpack. Um, I recently heard that there was a recall on a solution that we were to use for these elect electrostatic cleaning cleaners, um, that they were toxic chemicals found in this solution. And so now back to the drawing board. We should all be fighting our super awesome governor Cuomo not to take an additional 20% from our education budget. And we should all be fighting Cuomo to fully fund our schools. New York State is suffering. I'm expired. But we all have the money. New York State has the money. We have over 120 billionaires in New York State. Please fully fund our school. And thank you, city council members, for this opportunity. Fully fund our schools. Black Lives Matter. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Jessamine Lee. Starting time. Oh, thank you. Um, Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I am here as a parent and PTA president at PS84 and District 14 in Brooklyn. I'm also here as a former DOE educator. I am here as a member of Press NYC. I am here to uh, support the Moore Caucus of the UFT and to amplify the call to delay the reopening of schools until schools are, full, are safe. The other thing I'm here to do is to acknowledge Sandra Santos Vizcaino, my daughter's teacher. She is the first DOE educator to have died of COVID last spring. And the DOE has failed to sufficiently honor its employees who died because of this tragedy. And I want that into record. Additionally, I am here to advocate for not only my special education student who's an autistic student in the ASD Nest program, but all special education students. I've written to every member of city council's education committee on this issue. Both the DOE's guidance and NYSED's guidance on special education have loopholes in them for, that allow for the denial of services, that allow for the limitations of services, and it's a clear violation of federal law. It's a violation of the IDEA Act. It's a violation of the ADA. I am here because I am concerned for my child's related service providers and related service providers throughout the city. I don't know how they're going to do this work. All special education students, 80% of whom are black and brown, deserve a free and appropriate public education. And this plan in its blended iteration and its remote iteration fail to uphold our kids' civil right to a free and appropriate public education. And I have written, like I said, to every city council member on this education committee and have gotten silence. I want action. Our kids deserve better. Our kids deserve access to their education, and this is unconscionable. And one last note, the DOE is staffed overwhelmingly by women. Over 80% of the employees of the DOE are women. They have knowledge, they have expertise, they have experience, they have wisdom, and they are being ignored by our male mayor and our male chancellor. And what we are seeing here is structural misogyny. 
and it needs to stop. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much as well. And if you could actually uh, uh, resend my apologies to an email to me, because I, I, I've been a lot of emails uh, these days, but I, I'd like to see uh, the email that you sent over. And I Absolutely. appreciate it. The guidance from NYSET is very clear to allow yeah. flexibility and duration. And the DOE, frankly, acted in bad faith last spring when it came to the remote learning plans they offered to special education families, they truncated services, they shortened related service sessions, and the DOE has made absolutely no effort to issue RSAs or issue any accommodation to adjust for those missed hours of instruction and service support. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes testimony for this panel. We will now go to the next. The next panel is Anna Meyer, Janine Sopp, B. Kaiser, and Sharmali Ramudit. We will start with Anna Meyer. Starting time. Hi, my name is Anna Meyer. I teach ninth grade social studies in the South Bronx. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I also want to mention I'm a more member. I believe that school buildings um, opening now is unsafe, underfunded, and rushed, and we must plan for a remote start. Uh, teachers and students and families lost trust in the DOE when schools remained open in March, uh, even after there are COVID cases in our schools and neighborhoods. The New York Times estimates that if the U.S. had begun imposing social distancing measures one week earlier or schools had closed a week earlier, 15,000 lives would have been saved in New York City alone. The plans for hybrid learning don't add up. To give just one example, um, students will have limited time to enter the buildings in the morning. I'm teaching remotely and I'll have 30 minutes in the morning to meet with the dean who will be supervising my in-person classes. Students will then have five minutes to enter the building before their next classes. They need to be socially distant and have their temperature checked during that time. I believe that these uh, procedures will consume precious in-person instructional time. The chancellor has told us that staff will receive training in trauma-informed practices. No one I know in the DOE has gotten that as a staff, um, but I've invested significant time and money on my own to learn more about it. And I know that creating consistency in school is essential. Dr. Redliner told us earlier today that schools will eventually close and probably sooner rather than later. We need to prepare a learning plan that will be consistent for a semester, not opening schools and then quickly closing them. My administration has spent the summer programming hybrid schedules, scrambling to put together outdoor learning spaces and waiting for evaluations uh, of our building spaces. Every day, more students choose to go remote and more admin uh, staff uh, seek medical accommodations. And then my admin has to adjust their plans. We need a plan now for remote learning. I urge the council to invest heavily in high-speed internet devices that work and training for teachers to prepare for high quality and consistent remote learning. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Janine Sopp. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Janine Sopp. I have a rising senior who is facing a year full of unknowns like everyone else. Thank you for showing the kind of leadership that is missing from the mayor and the DOE. COVID-19 has revealed the stark inequities for those who have been denied for decades. We cannot treat all schools the same when they have never been the same. This crisis is an opportunity to realign our priorities that better reflect the needs of all communities and particularly those who have systemically been disregarded as if they don't matter. We as a city have the responsibility to take actions that behave like their lives matter. The mayor has had incredible guidance from the city leaders on this call there are several models from other large school systems the mayor could have easily adopted. It is so hard to understand why he did not. Instead, the mayor and chancellor have spent endless resources and time running out the clock with a false sales campaign to reopen schools on a timeline that is reckless and having two additional weeks will not solve this. Community leaders, principals, teachers, parents, and students have been screaming on mountaintops as he's been moving in the wrong direction. Our DOE has failed at their job and they need to be replaced. They have refused to heed the voices of their constituents and have lacked transparency to all of us. We demand a safe phased in opening of our schools. Take a look at Boston's plan. It's a very responsible plan 
as is yours, Council Member Traeger, and that the mayor needs to stop playing with our lives. We demand that remote lean learning is a real plan that all students can easily access. They have wasted the summer selling us the Brooklyn Bridge and not create a functional remote plan. This is unacceptable. We demand that the mayor and governor tax the millionaires and billionaires of our state to support our schools. We demand that funds from Time police, expired. I, I have just a second. We demand that funds from police in our schools be spent on supporting school communities. We demand that the MAP tests, the state tests, and the regents exams be canceled. And I would like to see those leaders on this call, these many important leaders, start organizing to end mayoral control and demand community leadership and ownership of our schools once again. Thank you for this hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we will hear from B. Kaiser. Time starts now. Hi, I'm a teacher in District 14 in Brooklyn. I'm here with Moore and with Black Lives Matter at New York City Schools. We've already heard students, parents, teachers, doctors who all agree the city does not have a plan that will keep us safe. The city barely has a plan at all. And it can feel like we're shouting into the void. So thank you for having this hearing and please continue to abdicate for us. Michael Mulgrew is here. Teachers feel really frustrated that he's agreed to a deal on our behalf that did not meet even our measly three demands and did not address equity at all. But at least he was here, unlike the mayor and the chancellor. So that's something. According to the new plan, each student will be tested an average of once a year. This does not keep us safe. School safety officers will be policing students who break rules about social distancing and face masks. This is not safe. The DOE lied to us in March and people, thousands of people in our communities died and the DOE continues to lie to us now. They say that buildings have proper ventilation, but the people performing tests on the buildings were not trained to do so. And they have said that they were told not to report buildings that failed the safety check. This is not safe. The mayor has said that teachers are receiving training for trauma and for pedagogy. We are not. This does not keep our students safe. And equity has not been addressed at all. Mr. Mulgrew said this plan is equitable because it's the same for every school. That's not equity. Schools with PTAs that raise a billion dollars a year are buying extra loads of PPE, extra thermometers to check everyone's temperature instead of just a few random students, tents and cleaning supplies so they can have lunch outside instead of in poorly ventilated classrooms. Meanwhile, in schools like mine with many new immigrants, families aren't even getting the basic information they need. We asked if the DOE was doing anything to ensure that families traveling internationally knew they needed to quarantine before coming back to school. And like council member Traeger said already, the answer is you're on your own. When there are again, COVID spikes in our poor black and Latinx communities, we will all know exactly how our racist school Time system expired. happen. We need to tax billionaires, fund our schools according to the campaign for fiscal equity, focus on access and equity for remote learning and go full remote until it's safe. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Sharmali Ramudit. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairman Traeger, for convening this emergency hearing today. My name is Sharmali Ramudit, and I'm a member of CEC3 and the co-chair of their special education committee. As you've already heard, the DOE has not released any comprehensive guidance on special education. I am particularly concerned about children who have sensory issues. These are the children who will struggle to comply with health measures, such as wearing a mask all day long and should not under any circumstances be subject to additional emotional distress or exclusionary punitive discipline when they inevitably will not be able to comply with an all day mask mandate. Chancellor Carranza has highlighted children with autism as an example where they are well aware that sensory issues will affect these children's ability to comply with wearing a mask. For children whose sensory issues are exacerbated to the level where they need a one-to-one -one behavior support paraprofessional, for children that have a behavior implementation plan in place, these are children where sensory overload can, in extreme cases, send them into crisis level behaviors that require close contact, closer than six feet social distancing contact in order to de-escalate. Pre-COVID-19, protocol included summoning the school safety agent if school staff were unable to de-escalate a crisis situation. Children with a disability struggling to comply with pandemic-related health measures should not be punished, excluded from in-person learning, or face law enforcement. 
And finally, at yesterday's DOE health update meeting, Chancellor Carranza cited social contract theory as the reasoning behind some of the safety policy included in the, in the reopening plan and explains this explains the justification of the DOE and Mayor de Blasio in pushing forward a policy that they claim is in the best interest of students, parents, and I'm educators. expired. One more point. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. So I just wanted to point out that social contract theory was also used to justify the continued enslavement of black citizens during the antebellum period prior to the Civil War. If we are really thinking about a community of care, then the DOE and Mayor de Blasio um, has to recenter with the guiding question, what do we owe each other? And um, Chairman Traeger, I really am grateful to you for embarking on that um, particular inquiry. And so for Martin Luther King building, it's across the street from LaGuardia. With, if you're thinking of moving that building to the Jacob Javits Center, please leave the leave those um, those machines behind. They don't need machines. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal has a question. Starting time. Thank you, Charlie. I just wanted to say hi. Um, so glad you're here to testify and reminding everyone about the needs of uh, kids with special needs. You have been a champion on CEC3 um, for these kids, for all the students on, uh, in our district. And I'm, I'm just so happy that you uh, have been a leader in this space and um, wanted to encourage you to do more. Um, you know, and it's great that you're here today bringing up an issue that hardly anyone has talked about. Um, it's always the case that the kids uh, who need more, we talk about them less. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And that concludes this panel. We will now move to the next one. On the next panel, we have Caleris Salas, Yuli Su, Rachel Posner, and Tamara Geyer. We'll start with Caleris Salas. Time starts now. Okay, we can come back. Uh, let's unmute Yuli Sue, please. Hello, can you hear me? Time okay. starts now. Let's talk a little louder. Sure. My there name is go. Yuli, and I'm the CEC 14 first vice president and member of Press NYC, parent supporter of Moore Caucus, and New York City School Workers Solidarity Campaign. I'm also the Taiwanese American public school parent of two in Brooklyn. First, I want to say as a parent, I stand in solidarity with school staff because our school staff working environments are our children's learning environments. Remote learning was not easy for me and my two boys, but we must go to 100% remote because there are too many deal breakers in the school reopening plans and they must be addressed before we return to schools. And there are many other issues that need to have been addressed long before this pandemic. New York City schools have been segregated, racist, unsafe, and underfunded for decades. The erasure, diminishing, and silencing of black and brown, Asian, POC, and female voices is institutionally supported and has brought us to this broken edu education system and these nonsensical and impossible to e execute reopening plans. And this is not just about reopening schools, but about building a new education system with true equity, which is centering and engaging and prioritizing the most impacted black, brown, special education, multilingual communities in funding and planning because no amount of resolutions or safety checklists will make up for the fact that schools cannot comply with any safety checklist, testing plan, or reopening plan without money. Council Member Traeger, you talked about trust, but the City Council, you have broken that trust with your city budget. The resolution does not once mention the lack of funding for our schools. City Council has had six months to prioritize funding for our schools. That was your job, to secure funding. Start rebuilding trust by bringing us a budget that prioritizes students and school staff over opening the economy. 
I thank you for explaining in more detail about the reasoning behind the June 30th budget vote. I also do not support Guomo being in control of the, city of the city school budget, but it will not stop me from pushing you and other city council members here from, conti from continuing to advocate for Time expired. funding because that is the bare minimum, especially during a pandemic. We must all stand up and fight for our public school education funds and call on the mayor and the governor to make billionaires pay, fund New York schools, and Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Rachel Posner. Time starts now. I'm a parent of a seven-year-old, a teacher of ninth graders, a member of Press NYC and the Moore Caucus. I've spent 17 years working with New York City's vibrant teenagers and now three months teaching online while parenting a strong-willed, highly social young child for whom the isolation of remote instruction was excruciating. Bottom line, hey. Until it's truly safe, schools must be remote with prioritized exceptions because excruciating beats dead. I've spent the most stressful summer of my life hearing DOE folks lying to parents in dystopian perky tones about how they will magically keep everybody safe. Their denial and attempts to sound certain couldn't hide that nothing they said was financially possible or made any sense to anyone who's ever been in a school or read an article about COVID transmission. The mayor ignored over 50 groups connected to schools who bravely spoke out to say it's not safe to open. He ignored the 10 hour PEP where hundreds described losing coworkers, non-existent ventilation, stark racial inequities, unavailable broadband, lack of training. The next day, nada. Just more gaslighting and distrust and half-baked checklists from the mayor. Ignoring people and what they know is gravely dehumanizing. And I am tired of education, which is a profoundly human process, being treated like a spreadsheet. Every parent and teacher knows that just because adults need kids to act a certain way doesn't mean they will, deadly virus or not. We can create a perfect plan on paper, but kids are not robots that cater to adult convenience. They have complex emotions, anxieties. They can act out. They may struggle with impulse control or empathy or weighing choices. Like parents, teachers feel responsible for our kids' actions, although even the most skillful educator can't control those other young humans. We cannot respond to kids' existing trauma nor create a space for the joyful risk-taking of learning while having to obsessively police their every movement when the result of an Time expired. I'm almost finished, could be life and death. And we cannot put our kids in a position where they could feel they played any part in someone's death. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like we have Kalira Salas back on the line. So Kalira, please go ahead. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Kalira Salas and I'm a parent of a rising fourth grader at Central Park East One Elementary School, which is in District 4 in Harlem. My beautiful black son has motivated me to become a parent leader in my community. So I have the privilege to also chair the SLT at his school and be the president of CEC4. Because of my complete disagreement with the negligent plans presented by the Department of Education and Mayor de Blasio, I am also a proud member of Press NYC, Parents for Responsible, Responsive, Equitable, Safe Schools. I wanna share a little bit about our story. My son has an IEP since he's been in kindergarten and has a one-on-one -on -one para because of behavioral dis dysregulation. And a sense of loss and abandonment with, when schools closed in March really affected his engagement in remote learning in the spring. The fear of people he, lo he loves contracting the virus really became his focus for months. I chose a progressive school for him because of the support the school provides for children with learning differences, the experiential learning and the collaborative teaching practices. I've been fortunate that he has not had any significant regression since school ended because of the support of his educators, but I'm certainly concerned about what school will be for him moving forward. Independent of that, I was in full remote learning for my son. You see, for my day job, I'm a neuroscientist who trains physicians. I have had to send my students to the front lines and I've supported them as they have had sleepless nights in the clinic because of this pandemic. Some of my 20 something year old former students have had contracted COVIDs in their hospitals and have been on ventilators. Fortunately, most of them have survived. They have openly told me to not send my child to school. As a parent in East Harlem, my neighborhood has been the most affected by COVID in all of Manhattan. 
We have had such loss in our community and the level of trauma has been experienced with our, within our community is indescribable. Time expired. Thank you. Uh, it, would, you like, would you like to wrap up? Yeah, I just wanted to say that in addition to that, um, as a neuroscientist, I have to say that these protocols that have been implemented are developmentally inappropriate. And so in turn, I have a significant concern on how we're gonna support our most vulnerable communities with this plan moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we'll hear from Tamara Geyer, please. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Hello, my name is Tamara. And I'm the mother of a rising fifth grader in District 14. I am also our parent association president, a member of our SLT and our safety committee and president's council and press NYC. And I live in the Latino neighborhood of South Williamsburg. My neighborhood was devastated by COVID. There was a day in April when I was really distraught mm -hmm. because I had just learned that a friend had died. And I happened to go downstairs and I ran into a neighbor who asked me what I was up to. And he told me, and I told him that I just, the fourth person I knew just died. And he calmly replied that he knew 11 dead. So that gave me a really sobering perspective on the inequity of how this disease has moved through our city. Um, fast forward to yesterday on our safety committee at school. Sorry. Um, I learned that even at this late date, five months later, the DOE's track and trace protocol that will shut down classrooms is riddled with contradictions. For example, if two kids are asked to get tested on the same day, but their tests come back more than seven days apart, that will not qualify as two cases necessary to shut down a school. Or if a child is in a class that is asked to quarantine their sibling in another school, that school will not be automatically test notified. Doesn't the DOE know what contact means? And that's just two examples. All this policy serves to do is to obscure the fact that there's no way to minimize COVID spreading through a school in the current blended model. What we need is compulsory and regular testing for everyone going into a school building. There's no other way to pretend that we can even approach safety. And if we don't do this, the most marginalized among us will be ravaged. And you know the list, Black, Latinx, special ed students, Ls, and students in temporary housing. And due to the decades of underfunding, coupled with recent budget cuts from the state, on top of which city Time expired. One more sentence. Couldn't bring itself to reallocate funds from the NYPD to education in June. The only way to achieve this comprehensive testing is to tax New York's richest citizens, who are also citizens of this fair city. They've gotten richer during this pandemic. So I call for a true delay that will allow us to fix these protocols, secure funding, and create a path to long overdue equity in New York City public school system. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And I just wanna say, I appreciate uh, the, the very important advocacy speaking up, not just for your individual school community, but for all kids and all staff. Um, and again, I'm speaking now as a teacher as well that schools do mean everything to me. And I, I just want to just for one point of a clarification, I heard some other speaker mentioned that there was a $1 billion cut to schools. The, the, there was no $1 billion cut to school budgets. That would have meant thousands of teachers not having a position in the school. Uh, there were cuts that were made to DOE Central to consultants. They uh, reduced their travel expense budget but there are certain initiatives that we have to restore like community schools, which I greatly support. And, and, and the mayor cut teacher's choice at the last moment, which we fought so hard to increase. But I still absolutely would never hand the city finances over to the governor who has no. underfunded. And, and, and so, and we have work to do and, and we accept, um, we, we absolutely accept this responsibility to keep th this fight for, to have fully funded schools, but we're gonna need city and state and federal support uh, to, to make this happen. And I just, I truly appreciate your critical advocacy on behalf of all of our kids and all of our school staff. I, I, do, I do appreciate that. 
And we appreciate your advocacy as well, but you have to let us know how we can help you push your fellow council members, because unfortunately it is a collective vote at the end of the day. And we understand the difficult choices, but not everyone was making difficult choices. We all have to acknowledge them. Yeah, I do. I, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. Okay, that is all the testimony for this panel. We will now move on to the next. Joel Kapupperman, Olivia Swisher, and Matthew Sarker. We will first start with Joel. Time starts now. Greetings. Do you hear me now? Go ahead, Joel. Good afternoon. I represent the COVID-19 Accountability Working Group, composed of community leaders, scientists, public health, physicians, and more, and the National Lawyers Guild Environmental Justice Committee. Thank you for today. Residents of communities of color and lower income and disability suffer the brunt of the toxic exposure to a greater degree than any other New Yorkers as described today. Rushed assessments and stopgap solutions provided by the city are clearly inadequate with no time for critique allowed, even for the short-term open time for the, for the city. Um, the city is open to legal liability for putting students and staff into the zone of danger, a violation of a myriad of laws and regulations. Current preparation for in-person education is based on current conditions such as warm weather and low COVID numbers. The committee report on ventilation system in the schools really tells it as Monona Russell stated before as related by Robin Moffitt and continues, the room served by air conditioning and or unit ventilators cannot be made safe without major changes in additional equipment such as HEPA filters or designing and installing dilution exhaust systems. Two windows open six inches is not a way to bring in clean air. Instead, each system should be evaluated and the engineers should provide the MERV rating of the filter, the number of the air exchanges per hour and the percentage of fresh air provided. These three variables must be used together to provide for rapid clearing of the aerosol particles from the air. A recent study shows that over half the schools don't even have exhaust fans and the majority of those that do are not are deficient. We also have a history of problems in the schools. We The school is just discounting. There was no talk about PCBs in the schools. Those windows are co 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 covered with caulking with PCBs. I think we have time to expired. I just want to also say is to just finish up. Have we learned nothing from 9-11? Students, teachers, and staff were ordered to return to schools contaminated with World Trade Center dust, smoke, and ignoring all warnings, including data and expert advice. The city denied the dangers instead of addressing the environmental health risks. Is the city going to follow the 9-11 playbook with schools now? Apparently, yes. The rush assessments and the stopgap measures recommended by the city are flawed and inadequate and will put students, teachers, staff, and those they come into contact with at risk for infection. ASHRAE standards have been cited, but are not sufficient. Stricter standards are required, and those published by ACIGH and AIHA are much better, and we offer those reports to the city council. And also, Mark, we'd like to do is offer you, the city council members and the staff, a two-hour training course in terms of all of industrial hygiene standards. And we also believe that City councils should be hiring their own staff with such a large budget, they should not rely on the city in terms of mayor's office. It even pointed out that the mayor's office doesn't show. We go back a long ways and to say that such a major change in the school system could be based on rapid assessments flies in the face of all environmental review that I'm sure you know that you're well aware of, of, of Chairman Traeger, have you fought for for many years. To reduce it to a a, a assessment that's not even allowed peer review flies in the face of, of, of the reason and flies in the face of the law um, and the like. And I'm very concerned that 
the 9-11 story is being repeated now where you're going to hear stories of students at Stuyvesant and other schools were forced to go back into those schools. They're getting sick. Many have died. And the city was open to much liability. I really urge that city council be concerned about all the lawyers that are lining up, figuring out how to sue the city for putting their, their kids, their staff, and, and, um, and even the council members in the zone of danger. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Olivia Swisher. Olivia? Ta time starts now. Hey, can you hear me? Was that good? Yes, go ahead. Okay. My name is Olivia Swisher. I am a middle school art teacher in Sunset Park. Councilmember Menchaca, thank you for standing in solidarity with us on Tuesday. Thank you for standing up for our community today. I come from multiple generations of teachers. Two weeks ago, my mother welcomed students to her extremely well-funded classroom at an American school in Germany. And they have already had COVID symptoms in students in a community with a lower transmission rate than Sunset Park. She has every single resource that we New York City teachers are demanding and yet they are still facing issues with reopening their school buildings. She told me just last night that I need to keep organizing, rallying, calling, tweeting, emailing, and speaking publicly because as teachers, it is our duty to protect students and their families from returning to unsafe school buildings. So I am here today. As a teacher in Sunset Park, I know firsthand the trauma my middle school students and my colleagues faced during coronavirus and still ongoing. I had 11 and 12 year old students who would come to Google Meets but not show their face or turn their audio on. When I would call them after class to check in on them, they shared that everyone in their family had the corona and that they were scared. I wonder how many people in power that are making decisions have had this type of experience. Their plans indicate that they have not had this type of experience. Otherwise they would have made different choices. This current plan does not help the working class families of Sunset Park. This current plan means my school is going to be likely in school for three days, remote for two weeks, in school for two days, remote for two weeks. Every educator and parent in this space knows that disruption is the last thing our children need. They need consistency. On a personal note, my husband is in the high risk category, but I am personally not a high, at high risk. So I'm unable to apply for medical accommodation. Time expired. Can I just finish really quickly? Thank you. I do not want to put him at risk. I cannot support the current plans because unfortunately it is not. And if there is an outbreak at my school, it is a when there is an outbreak at my school. So I ask of the council, fully fund our schools, delay the, re the reopening of buildings until it is safe and center and engage our most impacted students and families. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we will hear from Matthew Sarker. Matthew. Time, time starts now. I had 3,000 kids in the building. Oh. No, I have to do that. Um, there are a couple of Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was on a teacher meeting. Um, I didn't really prepare my statement, so I just had to do some other stuff, but. I'm a physics and engineering teacher in the Bronx. My name is Matthew Sarker. I, I live in the district and I just have felt gaslit for a long time. I don't want, I, I, so much of what I feel has been echoed. So I wanna just say one thing, when you are solving a problem, you, you start with people's needs. And that's what we've heard this entire time on this call. And the mayor's plan basically started with the solution. It started all wrong and he's kind of pushed forward without hearing people's needs. So that's been the most frustrating part right now is that my school cannot solve its own problems because we're trying to figure out how to make the mayor's plans that are unclear work. And that is my biggest, like I don't expect the mayor to solve our problems almost by design, he cannot. But this failed attempt at a solution is preventing us from solving our own problems. 90% uh, of the students in my school have opted for remote and even if it was 100%, we would still be forced to go into the building. And all of this has prevented us from making the remote experience work better. Um, I just want to thank everyone who's been on this call and uh, kind of Chair Traeger for, for giving us this platform. I want to say, people, this fight is not over. Please do not give up. I'm inspired by everyone on this call. And I thank, I thank everyone for just for the efforts that, it, that we've had to put into this. 
um, please, please don't. The one good thing that has come out of this is that we've built our own capacity. And I think we need to continue to build that capacity to solve problems. Uh, the DOE, when they've had a three month head start, have failed at producing a coherent plan. And when things go wrong, potentially in September or October, like we need to rely on each other and ourselves. Uh, please help us get those resources so that we can solve our own problems. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That concludes the testimony from this panel. We will now move to the next one. Amy Breedlove, Deirdre Levy, Carolyn Tyner, Travis Mapplepore. We will start with Amy Breedlove. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Amy Breedlove, and today I testify as a parent of a rising third grader at PS261 Philip Livingston School in Burham Hill, Brooklyn. Our principal lost her life partner, who was a DOE worker, to COVID-19 in March. That affects my son. That affects our school community. We are scared. I personally have completely written this year off as an opportunity for my son to advance academically. That's hard to admit. I value education very, very highly. This hurts. I don't feel comfortable sending my son to school. Here's reason number one. I am no way confident that an aerosol spread virus can be contained in a closed interior space serviced by old and malfunctioning heating and ventilation systems. The chancellor's defense of the toilet paper airflow test is an outrage. Showing that air flows out of a vent is not a safety check and provides no proof of anything. I support my council member Brad Lander's appeal for a plan for outdoor learning. The chancellor has finally acknowledged this idea and has advanced it to individual schools to adopt on their own, applying to DOT and other agencies to administer. He suggests that the PTAs pay for this accommodation and to make it equitable, he suggests that more privileged communities pay for other schools. We all need to do our part, but this is an outrageous suggestion. Where is the DOE's contribution to keeping our children safe and educating them? This sounds dangerously close to suggesting that we privatize our public system. I have to say it, really? The DOE couldn't get a plan together. Outdoor learning was implemented during the tuberculosis outbreak, also an aerosol spread virus. We are not asking the DOT, DOE sorry, to be extremely creative it's not like putting mimes in control of traffic issues like the mayor of Bogota, Colombia did. We cannot open our schools or do outdoor learning. Time expired. Gets a plan together that makes it safe for students, families, administrators, and teachers. Let's get a plan that, and a protocol when a school community member is sick. Can we get rapid testing on site? Can we make smart decisions of how to close should an infection break out? And what are you doing to ensure that the children's mental state of health is considered? My kid doesn't wanna to go to school. He's afraid. He's afraid of the government not protecting him. His classmates talk about children in cages and that the president is going to destroy their lives. And this is what we deal with as parents. And it is too much stress for all of us to take on ourselves. And we look to the government to help us out. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Deirdre Levy. Time starts now. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank the Education Committee Chair, Council Member Traeger, for holding this hearing and to the council members here to listen to our testimony today. My name is Deirdre Levy, and I am a special education teacher at PS9 in Brooklyn. This September will mark my eighth year of teaching. In the beginning of April, my friend and colleague, Sandra Vizcaino, was the first teacher in the Department of Education to pass away due to complications from COVID-19. We were all together in her room on March 19th, the last day that we were mandated to be in school. She passed away that first week of April. Sandra would not be the only colleague I worked with to fall victim to this virus. A few days later, I learned that my former paraprofessional, Mr. D, passed away from COVID-19 as well. This was a heartbreaking time for me, given that we were all socially isolated from each other, all while being expected to plan and carry on with school activities amidst losing colleagues. 
March 13th was the last day that I was in school with my students and colleagues, but teachers were still required to be in the school to plan for remote learning after that. We received no guidance from the DOE on how to proceed. Our guidance came from our administrators. It was a lot to manage virtual learning this past year, especially since I wasn't adequately prepared to adapt to this learning style. However, I stepped up and I did it. I visited a student in a shelter and delivered him food. I met up with other students in the neighborhood to give them coloring books. Recently, I've been hosting writing notebook workshops. I taught summer school virtually this past summer and felt very connected to my students. Most of our planning was done with our colleagues and grade teams back in March. Miss V had a big role in our grade team. She always sent us emails. When I didn't hear from her in a few days, I was very um, concerned. It broke my heart to lose two colleagues within the same week. Every day when I read about safety plans in place and real time expired. So thank you for listening and have a great day. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Carolyn Tyner. Time starts now. Thank you city council members for letting us speak today. I am an educator in district 15 in Brooklyn and I support a fully remote start to the school year until all safety demands are met. So the mayor says that school reopening is a matter of parent choice, but many of us know that not all parents have equal choices. How can working class parents be expected to choose between their jobs which provide money for food and shelter and sending their child to potentially unsafe schools? Either way, they have to make substantial sacrifices for their family's survival. Parents, teachers, and educators have been demanding more funding for schools which would provide adequate PPE, ventilation, and mandatory testing for all people who enter school buildings, not random testing once a month. The agreement the mayor came to with UFT leadership does not address issues with school funding, particularly the 20% budget cut coming from the state education department that would result in thousands of teacher layoffs and undoubtedly make it more difficult to afford the safety measures our school buildings need. The mayor says we can make up for gaps in funding through PTA fundraising, but this is unrealistic and inequitable. It is not the responsibility of individual parents and educators to make up for where the DOE has failed us. Furthermore, we know for a fact that some schools have wealthier PTAs that will be able to meet safety demands, while other schools simply do not have this extra wealth. This means that the health of our low income, predominantly black and brown students and their families will be put in jeopardy. Another issue with the mayor's plan is a complete lack of discussion of public transit. No matter how prepared the school buildings are, reopening buildings will require hundreds of thousands of staff and students to take public transit every day. Um, it has been said that schools in neighborhoods with higher infection rates will stay closed, but as we know, many students and staff commute from outside their own neighborhoods to get to school buildings. Flooding, flooding public transit with more commuters this fall poses a substantial risk of outbreak, not just for schools, but for the entire city. We saw in Time expired. We, may I finish? Yeah, if you want to wrap up, go ahead. We saw in March and April how devastating this virus was for our Black and Latinx communities who were disproportionately affected. The mayor and chancellor with this plan are clearly saying that Black and brown lives do not matter to them, that the health of the economy is more important than the health of our communities. My students, coworkers, and their families are not capitalist pawns to be sacrificed, and their health and safety must come first. Thank you again, and I urge you to delay the reopening of school buildings until schools are fully funded. Thank you. And next we will hear from Travis. Time starts now. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Travis Shaheen Malakpour. I'm a special education teacher at Benjamin N. Cardozo High School in Bayside and a member of Moore UFT. I want to strongly state that the current proposals for opening schools do not inspire confidence or safety in our teachers, staff, parents, or students. And we do not trust the mayor DOE to do the right thing. We should be 100% remote. We have so many questions that continue to go unanswered. We still have no answers on childcare for DOE employees for, uh, with children or waivers for staff that live with people who have medical conditions. Our buildings did not magically become safe this summer. Our, our schools have not had major capital projects. At best, this is a duct tape solution for a situation that requires a skilled trades response. These are things that have been said since we closed in March. Hell, they should have been things we always had to address. We do not have the staff um, needed to serve our children or the space to do it in. Before COVID-19, my school was at 167% capacity. To be clear, we are lucky that a new wing is being built. That will probably take a long time. The building that we are in was built three years after the Civil Rights Act was passed. 
We don't have an HVAC system. Our building was ext has extremely poor ventilation. We leave the windows open to our classes year round because of the air constantly choking our students. One of my colleagues wears shorts to work year round because the building is so hot. One year a student passed out from the heat in our building while taking the physics readings. The problems we hear about at the MLK campus is going across way more of our school citywide, okay? I wanna remind you that the mayor promised ACs in every high school by uh, 2022. How will this be fixed by then? We should be having conversations about how we are going to improve our school buildings permanently. We should be putting in the work to make sure that we have schools with lead-free water and clean air. To be clear, there should not be a global pandemic going on to address basic human rights. Watching water bottles get passed around in 2018-19 school year while lead still ran through the pipes was cruel at best. This slapstick approach will have disastrous results. Um, so I'm lucky that I'll be teaching remotely. Um, what I Time have, expired. I just want to wrap something up real quick. Is Go What ahead. about those who have their health? We have teachers in our school who are younger and healthier than me that may get sick, but don't have that option afforded to them. The prior speaker's concerns about public transit are alarming, and we have to remember that staff travel from upstate New York, Long Island, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And that's something we don't even think about. This can be a national issue as well. I also want to just emphasize real quick that... Um, for remote learning, I spoke to Arthur Goldstein of Francis Lewis High School this morning, who told me that they will have to bring over 100 teachers into school buildings to teach remotely. Yes, people will be teaching in buildings to teach remotely, okay? The schools do not have enough bandwidth to sustain the data that'll be required to do this and host over 100 remote classes. Those teachers will have to wear masks while teaching remotely. Imagine trying to hear your teacher through the DOE issued computer without an external microphone. If we wanted to buy equipment, our meager $250 and teacher's choice was cut anyway. So this is a cruel and counter uh, productive position to put teachers in. Since 2017, I've been emphasizing that technology has been something that has been discounted by the DOE. We can make remote teaching much better than we have, but we need systems of accountability and equity for our students, especially for our English language learners and our students with disabilities that I serve every single day. They need laptops and Chromebooks with keyboards that can use the split screen setting, not an iPad. Um, and quite frankly, the situation going on at SUNY Onada should be setting off alarm bells, but it seems that nothing will get the governor, mayor, or chancellor to budge. Tax rich, funder schools, Black Lives Matter. I want to thank you for, for your powerful words. And when you mentioned that uh, the building was built right after, I think, the Civil Rights Act, uh, New York High School, where I used to teach, was built right after World War I, and we haven't seen a lot of the wiring fixed since World War One, and I I absolutely hear you. You are absolutely correct. Um, and I want folks to know that I I mentioned school infrastructure issues uh, at, at the beginning of my tenure as chair of this committee, and it wasn't always the most covered topic for a lot of folks. Now it's now it's being magnified. But many uh, many of us knew about these issues years before, we did get them to put money into accessibility because my building was not very accessible. I'm sure yours has issues for kids and staff as well. But I, I, on the suggestions for remote learning, spot on. Those are excellent suggestions. Um, and we have a lot more work to do. And I just I just want to thank you for your service. And I, I, I'm in full solidarity. Judge Rager, can I just mention one last thing too? Yes, please. One other thing that we haven't really emphasized much is the issue of bathrooms. Um, it's a point of intense concern. The Journal of Physics Fluids showed that um, both urine and fecal matter spread COVID when flushing mechanisms and toilets are in use. And in most schools, there's no lids on the toilet, there's no cleaning supplies ready uh, for the toilet, no dispenser for the toilet paper. So people unravel it like this by hand, um, which is disgusting, just in, on your average day. Uh, there's no windows in the bathroom and no toilets are more than two feet apart for the most part. So um, I, I know that, and soaps are maybe, of course, there's been a whole so I think um, we don't really talk about bathrooms because they're gross, but when it comes down to it, they are major. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you being here today. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Okay, uh, that concludes that panel. And we have two panels left. First, we will call Achillea Lawrence Maitland, Elisa Crespo, Molly Brunn, and Jane Mizell. And then the panel after that will be Lisa Bosted, Sharesh Wald, Marilyn Moore, and Nelson Marr. We will start with Achillea Lawrence Maitland. Time starts now. 
Hi, good afternoon, uh, Councilman Traeger. I thank you for having parent voice on this. It's really encouraging. Um, I'm a member of PS20 and a Silver School school leadership team and a co-chair of that school leadership team. And I won't be redundant because a lot of the points that we have um, have been raised, we were able to advocate for most of our parents to opt into remote learning, leveraging our privilege to say, hey, we might be inconvenient, but we're going to leave space for those that need to, um, to, to come on site for school. But really we endorse that as many families that need to be in, per, in remote should go remote and really calling for DOE to do the same thing as well because there's just no good protocol that you can put in place. I'm a frontline administrator. I've been in the front putting in place safety protocols for small, um, much smaller settings. And now I'm still going through the up, to, up and down and the disruption um, of having to deal with cases and people having to quarantine and short staffing. And so it's a very, very disruptive plan because testing, we know a lot about false positive, false negatives. We know about testing delays and, and our schools have just not experienced what I've experienced over the past couple of months, trying to figure out how do we staff? How do we go through these disruptions? And so really want to call for the same thing that families have been calling for on this call, 100% remote learning, provide resources to families, whether it's respite or localized pods to support families as best as we can. But one point, and I know I'm coming up on 28 seconds, Councilman Traeger, is that you're in a unique position in this time. Uh, most of the calls today is around justice and equity. We have been calling for the redesign of our police system, but that's a redesign of every single system. How do we use this COVID pause to develop a proposal around a just and equitable school system? Instead of trying to put band-aids on it, let's pause in I this expired. year and come up with a proposal. Lead your committee, leverage your status, leverage your privilege to come up with a proposal around something that is just and equitable. Thank you so much for having me on this. Appreciate it. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Elisa Crespo. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Elisa Crespo. I'm a resident of the Bronx, um, and I work very closely with education stakeholders here in the borough. I also have family members who are attending New York City public schools, so I'm quite concerned about the reopening of schools. Uh, frankly, I do not believe that the DOE has the capacity and the wherewithal to ensure the safety of our schools to ensure the safety of hundreds of thousands of students who are going to be in blended learning. The Bronx has particularly been hit hard by this coronavirus pandemic, and any decision that's made with respect to reopening schools will most definitely have an impact on low-income families of color and on the immigrant populations that live in the Bronx. The consequences of decisions, of our decision, will fall hardest on our most vulnerable residents. And in the Bronx, we have had enough. We have suffered enough. This is a decision that is not only going to impact our students, but our educators, our administrative staff, kitchen staff, paras, custodians, social workers, and nurses. How dare we say that we cannot have indoor dining and then turn around and say that kids can eat lunch in classrooms. It makes no sense. We're also hearing from the Bronx District Planning Office that TCUs are going to stay in order for our students to abide by social distance guidelines, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Rec centers, parents have no information about those. That is unacceptable. We should not open schools until there are zero new cases of COVID-19 within a two week period, until our schools are fully funded and if we have to tax the rich to do that, then so be it. Until our families receive adequate financial support for childcare, and if we have to tax the rich to do that, then so be it. Until teachers and staff are truly involved in the reopening process, and we must have rapid testing in schools, not tests that take days or weeks to return results. I am particularly concerned about students with IEPs and English language learners. We need Time to expired. 
we need to make sure that there is a concrete plan in place for this population of students. Moreover, a plan must be in place that ensures the students who are part of the digital divide, many of whom are here in the Bronx, are equipped with the necessary tools they need to receive what is their right to a sound and basic education, including free Wi-Fi and access to electronic devices. We cannot rush this decision. This decision. We must take our time. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of students are relying on us to get this right. I wanna thank Chair Traeger. I wanna thank Council Member Carlos Menchaca for his work. I wanna thank Council Member Helen Rosenthal for your work. I wanna thank the uh, Moore Caucus of the US UFT and I wanna thank Teens Take Charge for all of their uh, great work as young leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your powerful testimony and uh, truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we just also want to, for the record, recognize that Councilmember Cornegy has also been with us. Um, next, we have Molly Brunn. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. I am a child public school teacher in the city of Bronx. Currently, I'm also a child student at the Rising Second Grader, and deeply troubled by the plan to reopen. Okay, it looks like she may have dropped off, so we will turn to Jane Mizell. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. I'm honored to work with the Moore Health Justice Caucus and I teach at the School of Education at City College. First, I wanna speak out for my graduated student teachers whose families sacrificed to help them get New York State teaching licenses and they are now barred from working in the DOE schools, getting jobs there because of the hiring freeze. And they are left working in charter schools which have no freeze. Maybe you can do something about that, that would be helpful. We have spent the summer listening to the mayor and the UFT's continuous boosterism as they claim that measures will be put into place to fix problems in the school buildings. Who are they kidding? They have not done this work for years on end. They lack the funding to do it now and lack the honesty to acknowledge this. I want to give you an example of why we doubt the mayor's claims that the schools are safe. The other day, a custodian explained that he's being told to fill out paperwork to hide problems. A teacher he spoke with works in a classroom where the windows do not open and the custodian does not have the capacity to or equipment to fix the windows. He's been told to record on paperwork that the window is sticky, not broken, and that it is unable to be opened. Someone from above is telling custodians to fudge the data and make all look good. This breach of trust is the result of pressure from above and needs to be looked into. As people have pointed out, without required rapid testing and tracing, COVID will be prolonged by the reopening at this time. And the longer the pandemic lasts, the harder it will be on all of us and by far will be hardest on black and brown families. Black lives matter in the schools. The mayor and the UFT's plan makes no sense to teachers. Schools are not hospitals. Teachers are not doctors. Our work is different. Learning in school requires students to move, to interact, and to collaborate I'm with each expired. other. Otherwise, why do they need to be there? In person, learning during COVID will not allow the teachers to do their job and not allow children to learn. As a parent, listening to Sharmali uh, Rumadit, excuse me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, her testimony about children with sensory issues was particularly poignant for me as our son shares these issues. As a teacher, I would add that all children need to experience their physical environment. They need to move to touch and be comforted at times. Holding school with the COVID restrictions in place is developmentally inappropriate and unhealthy in every sense. And I thank you for this hearing. Thank you. And Chair, we actually have uh, Molly back on the line. Um, Molly, if you could just speak a little louder, we weren't. Hi, can to... you hear me? Okay, there we go. Great. Time Sorry. starts Thank now. I am a proud public uh, school teacher going into my 13th year teaching. I'm also the parent of a rising second grader, and I'm deeply troubled by the plans to open our schools, even with the delay that's been announced. 
There is a reason that school districts around this country have chosen to go all remote. There is incredible risk with sending our students and teachers and other school workers back into the building. And I have found that this risk is not being discussed enough. Instead, we're met with lists of plans and protocols, lists of cleaning supplies, but it all boils down to risk and it will not be eliminated with the DOE's plans. I know that you as a council are supporting the UFT's 50 point plan, but I wanna know what's on this plan. Members were not consulted in its creation and I fear it still leaves room to reopen unsafely. Cuomo says he expects outbreaks and school closures. So do I, and so do the medical experts who spoke on this call. Why can't we push for full remote now? Quick shutdowns and quarantines will cause even more trauma for our students while the DOE is pushing for trauma-informed instruction. Health exemptions to work um, from home are only being provided for teachers' individual health issues and family risk is not being considered. My husband has a serious heart condition and luckily, very luckily, I had some medical history that allowed me to stay home as well. However, if I had been denied, we were exploring one of us taking a leave of absence and not everyone actually has this option. We could actually keep everyone safe and provide childcare for essential workers or those with no ability to be remote. Let's get everyone into remote learning. This will also help streamline things for schools. Currently they're sorting teachers into different tracks and we're finding that blended remote teachers are gonna have double the class size. I got my teaching assignment today and was told it can change at any moment as families switch from blended to remote or remote to blended. Children need consistency, not changing teachers, and none of this makes any sense for what kids need. Children also need access to real learning materials, and there's no clarity around how teachers or schools may distribute these things. I, I think that we should stick with all I'm the expired. with recs for childcare until there are 14 days of no new cases. Health, public health must take priority like Ted Leather said earlier. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenthal has a question. Starting time. You're unmuted now. Great, thank you very much. Is, uh, I actually was hoping to uh, give a shout out to Alyssa Crespo, if she's still on. Hey, Alyssa, I just wanted to let you know, uh, that was a great, uh, great set of comments that you gave. Um, and I really wanna thank you. I know you're doing work in education now. Um, and I wanna thank you for your leadership on this. You clearly know what's going on uh, in your area in the Bronx. And I think that um, your work uh, has been exemplary. Um, we work, uh, Liz and I have worked together on a couple of things and just think she's amazing. She's an amazing leader um, and wanted to make sure that, that I put that in the record for you. Um, thank you for all your hard work. I appreciate that. Um, and as I stated in my testimony, I don't wanna take more time, but I'm particularly concerned about students with IEPs and English language learners and what the parents uh, or immigrant parents are going through, they must be completely confused and not know, have any idea of, of what's going on in our education system. And frankly, it's unacceptable. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Good. Thank you very much, Chair. Council Member Barron has a question. Starting time. Thank you. I don't really have a question. I just wanted to offer my congratulations to the chair. Uh, I think this was a very, very important hearing. And we heard from those who are intimately involved and many of them raised intricacies and questions that I had not thought about, but they generated a lot of uh, concern. And I know that I have a real basis of uh, questions to make sure that we get to answers from. I just want to thank all of the participants for taking the time to share with us. Thank you so much. And our final panel is going to be Lisa Bosted, Shuresh Wald, 
Marilyn Moore, Nelson Marr, and Carolyn Eanes. We'll start with Lisa. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Bowstead. I'm a graduate of the New York City Public Schools, as is my son. I'm also a former DOE teacher. I love New York City Public Schools, and that's why I'm here. I'm concerned about safe ventilations in our schools. When it gets cold outside, which will be soon, I keep hearing about inspections of HVAC systems and making sure windows open. Most of our school buildings are very old. The vast majority are over 40 years old. A significant number are over 100 years old. I've worked in several school buildings. I have never worked in a room with an HVAC system. To explain my concern, I want to tell you about three classrooms in which I've worked. In one school building in the winter, I would arrive in the morning to find the room at 95 degrees or warmer. I had to open the windows and wait before I could spend any time in the room. But I had to be careful not to leave the windows open for too long. The room would get very cold and then the heat wouldn't kick in again until after 11 o'clock. In these big old buildings, the heat is either on for the whole building or off for the whole building. In another school, my classroom never had enough heat. We wore coats all winter. The windows could be opened, but it was too cold to ever do so. In yet a third building that I've worked in, the north side of the building was always too cold in the winter, the heat was always on because the north side of the building was too cold. The south side of the building where my classroom was, was always too hot. Warm rooms were told to open windows, but the streets were too noisy. So we ran air conditioners and fans all winter. With COVID-19, blowing air around is not an option. Time expired. One sentence. I keep hearing about how important it is that windows be open for proper ventilation. Is the plan to keep windows open all winter? How much is this going to go to, how much is this going to cost and how many of our old boilers in the school buildings are going to fail under these conditions? Keeping windows open cannot be the answer to keeping students safe. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we will hear from Sharesh Wald. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Sharesh left, but my name is Anne. Um, and my son is a rising second grader at East Village Community School in District 1. I wanted to thank the council for actually hearing the voices of teachers, parents, and students. I want to acknowledge the fact that both the chancellor and the mayor are stunningly missing from this conversation in general and clearly from this council. I believe their plans are ill-advised and I know this and they know this, which is why they cannot participate in an open dialogue. I also think it's quite telling that UFT President Mulgrew, who brokered this deal for the delay, is no longer on the call, but I digress. These are extraordinary times and we are all faced with extraordinary decisions. It's reckless and shameful to cut and threaten further cuts to public school funding during a pandemic. We've lost over 23,000 New Yorkers to COVID already and the city's poorly planned and under-resourced reopening plan opens us up to more loss, especially in the communities already most impacted by COVID-19 where infection rates are still higher and schools have less resources to implement safety measures. I believe one of the most honest statements made on this call is that this is an effort in futility. We clearly do not have the funds to bolster safety or equalize inequities, solve frustration issues, make a solid and safe plan for kids with IEPs and special education, an expanded rec center program and outdoor learning for families and parents who need full-time support and a building of a robust remote plan. Because inevitably, if this is where we will land, whether it's on September 22nd or September 30th, and the need for expanded rec centers and 100% remote learning. So this is where we should start. Money, to execute this with some level of precision, because this is a scenario we can all agree with the experts will happen. We demand that the council members who voted yes for the city budget cuts in June to reverse course today and stand up and call on the mayor and the governor to tax the rich and fund New York City schools. 
I don't, if you don't address the too many deal breakers in the school reopening plans, then we won't send our children to school because it's just not safe. I think the word of the day is cluster fun. Time expired. Thank you. And next we will Thank hear you. from Marilyn Moore. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Marilyn Moore. I'm a mother of three daughters, school age, and I live in District 17 and I'm on the City Council um, 41st District. And I'm also a small business owner, a DOE city vendor who is impacted severely by COVID-19, but my focus is safety, health first, profit second, um, as a mother and a human being, you know. And my heart is focused on mental health of our marginalized students because it's so quiet, but it is extremely loud in our communities. I speak with social workers, with people who are like basic needs like food and scarcity. That's why I love Councilwoman Rosenthal for always bringing up food policy and making that impactful amongst our schools. And right now I'm really nervous about the 114 thousand homeless students who don't have access to a bus, um, um, the over 200,000 kids with special needs who need busing also, and they don't even have a contract in place. And it is so nerve wracking to figure out how does that impact how these children feel when they don't have access to basic needs basic needs. And I really want us to just say there's too many deal breakers. There's so many things that are going wrong. And we really need to think about why this needs to be delayed about human life first, because that is what the, the key point of educating our children is to impact their human life and their developmental um, and their growth. So if that's not being impacted, then what are we doing? And today as a mother, I just want to send out love and peace to all the teachers who also are mothers and parents and fathers, because we are humans who are not getting the support that they need just because you have a, a degree or have a good career doesn't mean you, can, you have all the resources you need either. We are a team, we are a city that is too bountiful for us to be suffering the way we are right now. So that's what I wanna say, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Nelson Marr. Time starts now. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Chairman Traeger, members of the Education Committee. Thank you for affording my office the opportunity to provide comments about the proposed resolution regarding the reopening of New York City public schools. Uh, my name is Nelson Marr, and I'm an education attorney at Bronx Legal Services, which is part of Legal Services NYC, the largest provider of free civil legal services in the United States. I want to first state that Legal Services NYC believe that schools should not reopen until the health and safety of all members of the school community are properly insured. And we, we certainly echo a lot that has been said in today's hearing. But in addition to that, um, Legal Services NYC is here today to remind everyone that it's important to remember that schools also need to address the emotional and mental health needs of students and staff for reopening. And this was mentioned multiple times during today's hearing, including comments by Council Member Rosenthal. Um, this issue cannot be overlooked, especially in light of two very recently published studies this week that confirmed the pandemic has worsened the mental health and emotional health of adults and children with a disproportionate impact on those with lower incomes and limited access to social resources. The studies found that over one quarter of adults are experiencing symptoms of depression due to the impact of the pandemic. That's more than three times higher than before the pandemic. And these rates far exceed those found during previous large scale traumas like Hurricane Katrina and the attacks on September 11th. Another study found that within a few months, the pandemic swiftly and substantially worsened mental health for both parents and children, and not surprisingly, disproportionately impacted children whose families are more economically and socially I'm expired. vulnerable. If I could just finish the thought. Yep, go ahead. Um, for any work, anyone working to improve the behavioral health supports for students in New York City schools, the results of these studies are no surprise. And they further confirm the need for greater investment in practices and services that work to provide an environment of healing for both students and staff in New York City public schools. 
Towards that end, Legal Services NYC, along with community partners in the Bronx Healing Center Schools Working Group, recently published the Community Roadmap to Bring Healing Centered Schools to the Bronx. This framework can provide the Department of Education um, essentially that roadmap to help every school engage in the whole school transformation and implement the healing center practices that are so necessary right now. Um, we encourage the members of the Education Committee and the City Council to learn more about the roadmap and to support the efforts which we, we are trying to uh, support ourselves that community members likely will be pushing for for these practices to be implemented in their local schools in the months to come. Because healing is now needed more than ever, given that most families are dealing with the dual collective trauma of COVID-19 and the history of anti-Black racism in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Carolyn. Time starts now. My name is Carolyn Eanes. I'm an English teacher at a high school in Coney Island. I'm also a member of Moore UFT. Um, thank you, Chair Traeger, for hosting this meeting and for your outspokenness on the issues around safe reopening. Thank you also, Council Member Menchaca, for your on-the-ground support for educators, school staff, and public school families here in Brooklyn. And thank you, Senator Jackson, for your amazing advocacy for funding our public schools. I know he had to leave, but he was here earlier. I'm here to speak in support of the resolution to delay in-person learning, but also to ask that this council will push for even more. School buildings should not open at all until we have fully funded trustworthy plans for health, justice, and safety. I would like to echo the demands for transparency around school building inspections. Many of us are being asked to report to schools on Tuesday, but my school's inspection report has not yet been released and we're hearing we might get it over the weekend. This is unacceptable and profoundly unprofessional. Quite frankly, I have no trust in DOE safety assessments or that the DOE will be able to improve our school conditions in the next two weeks after decades of neglect. With that being said, I'm also here to echo the demands for, to fully fund our schools. We keep hearing about how the federal government has failed us, and they have, but when will our city leaders demand full funding from the state? When will our city leaders really hold Cuomo accountable for eviscerating our education budget? Senator Jackson's bill 7378 to tax the rich would actually provide sustainable funding streams to our schools. The first day of school is just around the corner. The slight delay that the mayor announced earlier this week does nothing to address the gaping inequities between schools in terms of facilities and resources. It does nothing to address the catastrophic defunding of our schools that we have endured for years, even before COVID and the most recent city budget cuts. It does nothing to address the fact that COVID positivity rates vary vastly between neighborhoods. When we look at all of this data, not just the convenient citywide COVID positivity averages, it seems inevitable that the virus will time expire. Another public health emergency citywide once school buildings reopen and so many of us are traveling between neighborhoods. Thank you for your time. Tax the rich, fund our schools, Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Um, there are multiple people that had come in and out of the Zoom chat um, today. So if there is anyone that we had inadvertently missed and would like to testify, if you could please use the Zoom raise hand function now and we will call you in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing no hands raised, Chair Traeger, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I want to thank you, Malcolm. I want to thank the entire council staff. I think it's important to acknowledge both the committee staff, uh, the central staff who was, who was helpful, and my extraordinary staff that have been working around the clock um, always, but during this pandemic and during this time, uh, members are nothing without staff. And I am very grateful to the extraordinary and, and intern that we had, Danielle, who helped us as well. So I want to just publicly acknowledge their incredible work and their sacrifice, even during trying times themselves. Um, this hearing and also to my colleagues who, who uh, joined us today, uh, all those that came to, that came to, to speak, um, I felt it was important uh, to still have this hearing today because we scheduled this before uh, the recent announcement, because uh, I still believe it's important to provide a platform uh, for educators, parents, students, and all stakeholders uh, to give them voice 
uh, because there, there's so much happening each day and so much more information that's needed and clarity. And I, I've said that the cost of, of safely, you know, oper uh, operationalizing plans is very costly, but the cost of being honest, it doesn't cost a dime. And that's what folks are asking for, honesty, transparency, basic accountability. And that's what we're gonna to continue to do. And as mentioned before, we are under a mayoral control system, but I'm gonna to continue to use this platform uh, to be a voice for those who have to be heard, who must be heard, and to speak for all of our ed education families, to speak for those lives that we've lost, those lives who have been impacted to our kids who are you know, being re-traumatized all over again. Um, they, they, they mean a lot to me and we're gonna to continue to fight like hell for them and to do whatever we can to hold ourselves accountable, to hold the DOE accountable, the mayor, the governor, uh, everyone, everyone has to be working uh, with a sense of urgency uh, to give our schools everything they need to succeed, particularly during this trying time. So I just want to uh, thank uh, everyone who came, who, who spoke today. Uh, please send your, continue sending your emails. And if I miss something, I, I'll, I'll check it over again. And again, thank you all for, for, for being with us here today. Thanks.